Good morning to all of you. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to Charleston, South Carolina. Actually, I wish I was welcoming you to Charleston, South Carolina, where it's a beautiful day outside. But instead, I do welcome you and thank you for spending your time today to work with us today and explore the very exciting world of youth apprenticeships. And ladies and gentlemen, this world is exciting. It is exciting because apprenticeships have power. They have the power to change lives in remarkable ways, the power to accelerate our economies and the power to change our communities. This world is also exciting because it's such a superb example of the kind of change that can occur when multiple organizations work together in a united effort to achieve a common solution to a common problem. And you know you have a problem when there are good paying jobs that are going unfilled, while all of us know young people who are unemployed or underemployed. Back in 2014, we formalized our region's first youth apprenticeship program. I had the privilege of announcing to our community this win, 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 win. Yep, that's five wins. It's five wins because it's a win for our youth, our employers, our economy, our communities, and our schools. And locally, since inception, 445 youth apprentices from a wide variety of backgrounds have been hired as apprentices. And we have firsthand seen the impact that youth apprenticeships can have on a student's lives by opening doors to opportunities that heretofore were not open to them from students being hired into skilled career fields right out of high school and purchasing a home at the age of 19. Would you think about that? How many people do you know that can purchase a home before they're even old enough to buy their first beer? And the students progressing on to further their education and earn bachelor's and even master's degrees in fields from engineering to neuroscience. Ladies and gentlemen, youth apprenticeships level the playing field. Let me repeat that. Effective youth apprenticeships level the playing field. This morning, we ought to offer our thanks to New America for engaging us in the partnership to advance youth apprenticeship, PIA initiatives, for their ongoing support of our regional program, and for their willingness to assist us in this virtual conference today. With their encouragement and support, we've been able to expand our program and assist other communities around the country in developing their programs. To continue this really important work, we've now received a grant from New America as one of the two PIA National Learning Hubs. As a part of that effort, we are here with regional partners today to share with you, and, and I mean this, we're gonna share with you the most significant initiative during my 31 years as president. Nothing has been as transformative as this. This game-changing initiative was created not by any one entity alone, that's not possible, but by a truly collaborative effort. Effort that took place as a regional partnership, we came together to address the critical workforce needs and to mentor the next generation to produce skilled workers. For a program like this to be truly effective, it requires the collective energies of multiple entities. No one entity can accomplish an effective program alone. Today, I'd like to identify to you the six partners who have made our program possible. Throughout the day, you're going to hear from most of them as they share their perspective, their insights, and their experience. First, first, and they are first, area employers. We call them industry champions. They're willing to hire and mentor 16 to 18 year olds. Without them, ladies and gentlemen, you just have another classroom training program and not a true apprenticeship, area employers. Second, we're blessed to have an arm of the tech system called Apprenticeship Carolina. They serve as the intermediary with USDOL 
But I like to simplify that, simply say they hold the hands, they hold the hands of industry partners, the local employers, making it easy for them to handle the paperwork. They also tirelessly recruit and secure federal funding to support apprenticeships throughout South Carolina. Third, our local school districts. Without them, it wouldn't work. They recruit, support, and encourage not only the students, but their parents throughout the apprenticeships. And fourth, the Charleston Metro Chamber of Commerce. We have been very fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, to have a Chamber of Commerce that's taken an active leadership role in the support of educational initiatives. From the very beginning, the Chamber has played a critical role in launching and supporting youth apprenticeships, a critical role. Initially, initially they assumed the role of raising the funds to cover what I referred to previously as the ability to level the playing field so that every student, regardless of whether they had any money in their pocket, would be able to take advantage of this opportunity. Today, the Chamber continues to serve as a champion, encouraging employers to participate by hiring and mentoring and also getting local policymakers supportive of this program. And fifth, the funders. Level playing fields require money. As the program has grown, numerous other community partners have stepped up and recognized the impact of an effective youth apprenticeship program and they have stepped up and helped fund the educational expenses of our students. And finally, Triton Technical College. We have the privilege of serving as I call the convener of the other five groups that I mentioned. And we also enroll the students in college certificate programs in their career specific fields. Hats off to three of my colleagues, Melissa Stowasser, Tanisha Serafin and Mitch Harp, you're gonna hear from them shortly. I hope you can see that what we have in Charleston is truly a collaborative effort. Again, I said this before, not one entity, I don't care how much they cared, could pull this off by themselves. We've developed this program that we've shared with you today with partnerships. As you develop partnerships and programs in your own area, they may look like ours, they may not, but it is our hope that you will form strong partnerships within your communities and work to ensure that youth apprenticeships work to ensure that they become the national norm. To share with us today the national vision for this really important work, we're delighted to have with us today, Angela Hanks. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Employment and Training Administration at the USDOL. Yep, I know that's a long title. She's an impressive lady. And prior to coming to the Department of Labor in 2021, she was a Deputy Executive Director of the Crown Work Collaborative. Please welcome Angela Hanks, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Angela Hanks, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thornley. Um, before I begin, I want to thank Dr. Thornley and all of our hosts here um, at Trident Technical College's uh, Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program, a uh, New America's Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, uh, for inviting me to speak today about the crucial role that well-designed youth apprenticeship programs can play in helping our country build back better and in providing expanded opportunities for youth. The innovative youth apprenticeship programs developed here and in Charleston embody remarkable local partnerships, uh, which Dr. Thornley underscored are so important, uh, partnerships that are needed to increase the adoption of apprenticeship programs across the United States. As you all know, the last year and a half has brought many challenges uh, for you all and for the young people you serve. The pandemic has brought historic disruptions to both school and work. In the recovery, we need focused strategies to support our young people to reconnect and find more pathways to good jobs and good careers. So I'd like to talk to you today about why we believe youth apprenticeship programs and the investments the federal government has made in them are a key part of how we break down barriers to good jobs for more young Americans. Youth apprenticeships, like the ones we are hearing about today, make a difference in the lives of young people. They offer an incredible opportunity to gain critical skills and real paid work experience in their early working years. 
And there's a lot of research on this that shows that young people, when young people are connected to the workforce, it increases the likelihood that they will be employed later in life and earn family sustaining wages. Youth apprenticeships have not only demonstrated debt-free pathways for youth and paid work experience, they've also shown promise in confronting structural equity barriers in our labor market. Breaking down barriers to good jobs for underrepresented communities, confronting occupational segregation, there's great promise here to be built on. This is why the Biden administration, Secretary Walsh, and the entire Department of Labor are committed to building and expanding on youth apprenticeship programs as a core component of our workforce strategy that's centered on equity and job quality. President Biden's economic plan prioritizes empowering workers, expanding the middle class, strengthening communities while providing a path to a good family sustaining job. It's important to acknowledge that the United States has historically underinvested in the workforce development system for many decades. In 2018, for example, we spent less than one quarter of the average of other advanced economies, uh, the share they spend on workforce uh, as a share of their GDP. This lack of investment impacts all of us. Better educated workers create spillover effects for other workers and lack of unemployment or lack of employment has negative impacts on communities across the country. This is why President Biden is calling on Congress to significantly increase investments in American workforce development infrastructure and workforce protection. Uh, this includes a major, major focus on registered apprenticeships, youth and pre-apprenticeships, creating millions of new registered apprenticeship slots and strengthening the pipeline for more women and people of color to access these opportunities through successful youth and pre-apprenticeship programs. This historic investment in apprenticeship will be matched by our efforts to expand, diversify, and modernize our registered apprenticeship system. Uh, among the, one of the president's first actions was an executive order on apprenticeships, which included support for the National Apprenticeship Act, which is pending before Congress right now, and reconstituting the Advisory Committee on Apprenticeship, or the ACA. Just last month, we convened the first meeting of the Secretary's ACA. Uh, you will note that we, will, we are convening an entire subcommittee that is dedicated to expanding youth apprenticeships, including to clarifying our definition and examining key policy opportunities. And we aren't doing this alone, just to go back to uh, President Thornley's uh, point about partnership. We are working closely with our partners at the Departments of Education and Commerce and more. Programs like youth apprenticeship cut, down, cut across these silos so to grow and strengthen it, so must we. Even as we have big plans on the horizon, we are committed to continuing to seed and support progress on the ground. Programs like this one here in Charleston. For example, to date, DOL has made nearly 50 million in dedicated investments through the Youth Apprenticeship Readiness Grants and Youth Intermediary Contracts. These investments mark the first federal initiative targeted specifically at youth apprenticeship since the School to Work Opportunities Act nearly 25 years ago, and will provide resources to expand apprenticeship opportunities at a critical time for young adults. In recognition of this pioneering work, South Carolina State Board of Technical Education received the Youth Apprenticeship Readiness Grant and was awarded $5 million to develop and establish new or existing apprenticeship models and programs for youth in industries such as manufacturing, information technology, cybersecurity, and healthcare. Building on the examples here, here in Charleston uh, at Trident Technical College, uh, we appreciate the growing, that growing these programs requires deep partnerships across community colleges, uh, K-12 districts, industry, and more. Investing in those community partnerships, the intermediary, intermediaries that support them, and providing technical assistance and support to design quality, equitable programs alongside employers is how we get this hard work done. And I believe there are more partnerships we can be building. And I'd like to highlight a couple in particular. Uh, so the first is Job Corps. In addition to apprenticeship, the Department of Labor also administers Job Corps, the largest residential career training program in the country with 125 Job Corps centers uh, locations across the country. The program helps eligible young people ages 16 to 24 complete their high school education, trains them for meaningful careers, and assists them with obtaining employment. Job Corps has trained over 2 million young people since it began in 1964. Job Corps centers already host many different pre-apprenticeship programs which provide hands-on training to prepare students for registered apprenticeships. And in addition to helping students complete their education, obtain career and technical uh, skills, and gain employment, Job Corps also provides transitional support services, such as help finding a job, housing, healthcare, and transportation. I think we can work closely with partners like the ones gathered here today to connect Job Corps students and employers to high quality youth apprenticeship programs. It's an underutilized strategy that we need more of. 
Uh, the second I'll highlight is Youth Build. Youth Build is a recognized pre apprenticeship model under WIOA focused on strengthening connections to career pathways through apprenticeship. Youth Build has a focus on increasing the supply of affordable housing in communities youth participants reside in. Uh, all housing built or renovated must be for low income or homeless individuals and families. Additionally, Youth Build has a strong focus on serving diverse populations of out of school youth ages 16 to 24, with the greatest challenges finding good jobs in in demand industries such as healthcare, information technology, manufacturing, logistics, and culinary arts and hospitality. I see real opportunities for the Youth Build model to adapt youth apprenticeship strategies and partnerships as well. Uh, so in closing, I want to say that we at the Department of Labor are ready to support and do that hard work alongside you. We've made progress, but we have more work to do. In fact, the number of youth apprentices ages 16 to 24 registered as apprentices has grown steadily over time, nearly doubling from 2011 to 2020. Currently, apprentices ages 16 to 24 uh, represent nearly a quarter of all federal program registered apprentices. That's over 68,000 youth enrolled in registered apprenticeship programs, but we need more. To get started, it's so important like, that communities like Char Charleston tell their story and others can learn from their experience. I hope the learning uh, will well continue across communities gathered here today to make a difference in the lives of young people and, and their communities. The Biden administration is committed to supporting and expanding these programs so that young people can get the skills and work experience they need to reach their full potential. And that's why we as a department are committed to doing our part. That's why I wanted to join you today and why my colleague, John Ladd, who is the administrator of the Office of Apprenticeship will be joining you later. Thank you again to our hosts for inviting me to speak. We look forward to working with you and to continue to support these critical efforts and hopefully see you all in person one day soon. Thank you to everyone attending today uh, for all of the important work you're doing and will do in the future. Um, and we'll see each other soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Hanks for joining us today and for your efforts to modernize the national apprenticeship system and to ensure that that system supports the expansion of high quality youth apprenticeship in the future. We're grateful for the leadership of the US Department of Labor and look forward to the work that lies ahead. I also wanna quickly thank Dr. Thornley for kicking us off at the top of the hour. Uh, we wish we were in Charleston too, but as always your vision for the opportunities that apprenticeship can create in a community is inspiring. And we're proud to partner with you and Trident Tech to, as you said, level the playing field and expand options for youth through youth apprenticeship. Uh, my name is Taylor White. I am the director of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship at New America, which is a DC-based research and policy organization where I'm part of the Center for Education and Labor. Uh, I have a slide deck that I'm going to walk you through today as part of my introduction. Um, but before that comes up, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I just want to give a, a warm and hearty welcome to everyone on the line, uh, and thank you for joining today's virtual site visit. New America is very happy to be hosting this in cooperation with our PIA national partner, Trident Technical College. Next slide, please. All right. So PIA, um, many of you may have heard of that if you're here on the line. PIA stands for the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. Uh, PIA is a multi-year, multi-stakeholder initiative that we launched in 2018 with the goal of connecting, expanding, and strengthening the field of youth apprenticeship. From its inception, long before COVID disrupted our, our learning and working lives, PIA has been rooted in a belief that youth apprenticeship can transform how the nation's education system prepares young people for careers and launches them into successful futures. Across the U.S. today, as Dr. Thornley um, and uh, Assistant Secretary Hanks mentioned, too many students lack affordable post-secondary options, and many young graduates find a degree comes with debt, but does not guarantee a well-paying job that provides opportunities for career advancement. And many students who do begin college leave without having completed their degrees or gaining the experiences and networks they need to get a foothold in the labor market to jumpstart their careers. At the same time, as our economy has started to reopen, employers have again begun to show interest in building more nimble, more sustainable talent pipelines into fields like IT, healthcare, business services, advanced manufacturing, and the trades. Youth apprenticeship offers an opportunity to play a role, for employers, excuse me, to play a role in developing a rising generation of talent, much of which exists eager and untapped in their own communities. Today, as we look to re-engage young people in our education systems and as businesses across the economy seek to address the talent shortages of today and tomorrow, youth apprenticeship is a unique solution to both of those challenges. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, PIA works 
uh, to, to promote three main objectives. We work to seed and study innovation in the field of youth apprenticeship. We provide direct support to local, regional, and state actors looking to grow, improve, and expand youth apprenticeship programs through the PIA grant initiative, which provides a combination of funding and technical assistance to 15 grantees around the country and two PIA national learning hubs, one of which you'll hear from today. Our work with these grantees helps us strengthen the case and evidence base for youth apprenticeship. Through our work with these sites, we are learning a great deal about what makes youth apprenticeship partnerships and programs successful and the policies and conditions necessary to help them grow and become sustainable. We do this and share this learning through our multi-year research and communication strategy that seeks to improve public understanding and about the potential and impact of youth apprenticeship, and also to understand and disseminate some of the conditions that make it successful. And finally, because we know that stronger networks and communities of practice can help break down barriers, establish group norms, accelerate learning, and generate fresh questions and ideas to drive continued innovation, PIA proudly operates the PIA Network, a virtual learning community of sites across the United States through which we share our learnings and seek to build bigger, stronger, self-sustaining field of youth apprenticeship. Next slide, please. Well, New America leads PIA. Uh, we do not do any of this work alone. There's much too much to do for us to fly solo. Uh, so first, our work is supported by a broad mix of generous philanthropic partners, including the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Bluebird Philanthropies, the Bomber Group, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, J.P. Morgan Chase & Co., the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, the Siemens Foundation, the Smith Foundation, and the Walton Family Foundation. Next slide, please. And to conduct the research, uh, share the communications materials, and provide technical assistance to both our grantees and our network members, we rely on the expertise, experience, and collective networks of the PIA National Partners. Their logos are here on the screen for you, and I just want to thank them by name real quick. Uh, we call as our partners Advanced CTE, uh, the CareerWise Colorado, the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program, Education Strategy Group, JFF, the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and the National Governors Association. Some of our partners will be joining us today to moderate and participate in panels, uh, and we thank them, as always, for their partnership and leadership in this space. Next slide, please. Perhaps the most critical resource that uh, the national partners have developed over the last several years are the PIA definition and principles for high quality youth apprenticeship. As uh, was mentioned in prior remarks, currently there is no federally accepted definition of youth apprenticeship. And so to provide consistency and clarity to the field, uh, the PIA partners felt in 2018 when we launched that a priority was for us to develop a clear and common definition of youth apprenticeship to provide direction and consensus. Together, based on practices from across the field and input from leading practitioners at the local and state level, the partners agreed to create and adopt the shared definition of youth apprenticeship. And for many of you, this will be familiar. But um, as we define it, youth apprenticeship provides paid on-the-job learning under the supervision of skilled employee mentors. That learning is assessed on an ongoing basis against established skills and competency standards that are co-developed uh, with, with ed employers and educators working together uh, to figure out what's learned on the job and also what how that learning is reinforced and complemented by classroom-based instruction. Youth apprenticeship programs also, at the conclusion of students' experiences, uh, uh, culminate in a portable, industry-recognized credential and post-secondary credit that can be transferred and stacked upon as students continue their educational uh, and employment uh, careers. We know that these elements are core to what makes apprenticeship an effective earn and learn model that can expand education and economic opportunity for young adults while delivering results for employers too. At the same time though, we know that just having these four elements in place can't always guarantee a quality experience, especially for youth whose learning needs are unique and differ in some ways from those of adults. We know too that if youth apprenticeship is going to really transform education and employment outcomes for young people, if it's truly to become the vehicle for economic mobility we know it can be, some key quality principles must shape the design of those programs too. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> excuse me, along with the definition, the national definition of youth apprenticeship we've just shared with you, the PIA partners also developed the following principles for high quality. We believe that to be high quality and to deliver results for youth, employers, and communities, youth apprenticeship programs must be career-oriented, equitable, portable, adaptable, and accountable. But what does each of those mean? 
So career oriented describes the purposeful blending of what's learned in the classroom and what's learned on the job. To be career oriented, youth apprenticeships must be structured around knowledge and skills that lead to careers that pay family supporting wages. To be equitable, youth apprenticeship programs, uh, which are rigorous and competitive, must be deliberately designed with equity in mind. Learning must be made available through youth apprenticeship programs and be accessible to every student. Supports must exist to ensure the success of those students who are most adversely affected by the inequities in our education systems and our labor market. Youth apprenticeship prepares young people for jobs that can jumpstart a long career. For that reason, high quality youth apprenticeship programs must provide learning that is portable. That means youth apprenticeships lead to valuable credentials, credentials and transferable credits on which young people can continue building over a lifetime of growth into their careers and through their educational trajectories. Next, we have adaptable. When, when employers participate in youth apprenticeship, they make a real investment of resources and time. To realize that investment, especially in a labor market where people no longer stay at the same employer for decades and the pace of technology means new jobs are created nearly every day, it's important that employers work together to ensure that the learning and skills apprentices acquire through their apprenticeship programs are not tied to a single employer, but are broadly valuable across an industry or sector. This broadens options for apprentices and expands talent pools for employers over time. And finally, Paya believes that high quality youth apprenticeship must value accountability. Successful youth apprenticeship programs rely on the careful and constant cooperation of high schools, colleges, employers, community organizations, and other stakeholders from across education, workforce, and business. Dr. Thornley referenced this earlier. It is a core part of what makes these programs successful and allows them to deliver uh, positive outcomes for youth and for employers. But doing so requires very clear roles, responsibilities, and communication across the members of a partnership, and also a shared strategy for collecting, monitoring, and analyzing data to provide ongoing support to apprentices and partners, to ensure apprentices are being equitably served, and to monitor overall performance, program performance over time. These principles are intended to set a high and aspirational bar for the field of youth apprenticeship. Across the US, oh, next slide, please. Sorry, got ahead of myself. Across the US, PIA network members have adopted these principles as they've built and expanded youth apprenticeship programs and built and aligned systems to support their sustainability. Today, you can find these principles uh, across, at use across the US. You can see several of our PIA network members, all of our PIA network members and grantees really, and dots on that screen. Um, and you can find the principles in their program mission statements in state-issued work-based learning manuals and state and board policies that have been adopted across the United States. But reading the principles is certainly different from seeing them in action. And today you have a unique opportunity to do exactly that through this virtual site visit to the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program led by Trident Technical College. And you can see on this map, there is a purple dot to represent Trident, one of our PIA national learning hubs. Uh, and we are excited to welcome you to the site visit to get up close and personal with this program today. Next slide, please. Pia selected Trident as a founding national partner in 2018. And in 2021, we named TTC one of Pia's two inaugural learn national learning hubs, a designation that's meant to recognize its success in developing a best in the field youth apprenticeship model and its readiness to serve as a site of learning and innovation for the field. Throughout the day today, you'll have an opportunity to see and hear how Trident Tech and its partners in the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships have built a model that demonstrates the PIA principles of equity, portability, and adaptability. And you'll hear how, as a regional partnership, they hold one another accountable for the program's success and career orientation. And while today, the team from Trident Tech and their partners will make all of this look easy, I can assure you it's taken a lot of sweat and tears I don't think any blood, but definitely sweat and tears to grow into the exemplar program it has become and is today. But you don't have to take it from me. Next slide, please. In just a second, I'm going to pass things over uh, to Melissa, Mitch, and Tanisha from Trident Technical College, who will share with you the origins and impact of their program and tell you really their story. You'll have an opportunity to hear how, it, how the program began, uh, how it's grown, and what lies ahead for its work. Next, you will have an opportunity to hear from the apprentices themselves. Joining them will be family members who have been along for the apprenticeship ride 
uh, and you'll have an opportunity to hear what it's been like to be a young person in one of these programs, to be a parent uh, or family member supporting them in their journey, and really understand what the difference that these programs can make in young people's lives. Following that panel, we will hear from some of uh, the employer partners that are involved in the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program. That will be moderated by Eric Selznow from JFF, one of our PIA national partners. Following that session, we'll turn it over to the educators. And uh, under the leadership of moderator Mimi Lofkin from the National Alliance Partnerships and Equity, we'll have an opportunity to hear how educators from the K-12 and post-secondary systems in the Charleston region create seamless pathways through youth apprenticeship to credentials and careers. At the end of the day, I will be back here on screen. Uh, I have the honor of moderating our final panel of the day, the future of youth apprenticeship policy systems and sustainability, where you'll have a chance to hear voices from Apprenticeship Carolina and the US Department of Labor, who will help us think about the path to replicating outstanding programs like the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships and what the path to scale might look like. And then, Finally, at the very end of the day, we hope some of you will join us for an informal virtual networking session uh, that we will run for about five minutes, or sorry, for about uh, 30 minutes at the end of the day, starting at 4.45. Uh, a link to that event was provided in your reminder email today uh, that came in just about an hour before the session starts. So we encourage you to use that link to join us later on. And we will put the link up at the end of our final session for those of you who may not be able to make a decision until the very end of the day. Please know that we've set this um, agenda up so that you can drop in and out throughout the day today as your schedule allows. While well, we hope you will stay with us for the full day, we recognize you're busy people with places to be and things to do. We also recognize it can be hard to stare at a screen for hours on end, though most of us have been doing that for going on two years at this point, which is remarkable. Um, but now, uh, before we dive into our next session, please take a short break to stretch your legs, fill your water bottles, get another cup of coffee, and join us back here at 1145 for the Origins and Impact session that will be starting in just a few minutes. Um, and until then, uh, I just want to give another thanks to our opening speakers, Dr. Thornley and uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Hanks. And a, again, a warm uh, welcome to everyone who's participating on the line today. And last, but by no means least, a thank you um, to uh, Melissa Stowasser, Mitchell Harp, and the team from Trident Technical College and all of their partners who will be sharing their knowledge, expertise, perspectives, and wisdom with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Uh, and we will see you in just a few minutes. Thanks very much. Good morning. And this morning, we would like to welcome you once again to the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Stories. Um, we are here to share with you the origins and the impact of the program that we were so fortunate to begin. And if we can start the slide presentation, um, that would be great. First of all, I'd like to talk about the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program as a whole. Um, but I'd like to take a moment first to thank Deputy Secretary Hanks, Dr. Thornley, and Taylor White for their inspiring words and their leadership. Without Individuals like these women, we would not be able to move this type of initiative across the country, let alone um, develop them with the um, fortitude that we've been able to do within our region. And so thank you to all three of you for your inspiring words today. Like Dr. Thornley said, I can too say that this is the most exciting initiative in my 39 years in education. I started out in the K-12 system and in, in post-secondary and to all the things I've been involved with, youth apprenticeship has had the most power and impact from what I've seen. But also as she indicated, this is a regional partnership that enables this to happen. And so today, my colleagues and I would like to give you sort of an overview of what this regional initiative looks like and talk a little bit about our role in moving this forward within the region itself. But first, I'd like for you to take a look at the logo that you see on the screen. This logo is the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship logo. Whenever we talk about this program, we never talk about it as Trident Technical Program, and that's by design, because this program does not belong to us as a college. Although we are fortunate to serve as the local intermediary in this work, it is truly a collaborative partnership that enables this 
So it is a jointly owned program and all of us together support this work. Next slide, please. In the introduction, Dr. Thornley talked about the partners in the partnership, so, so I'm not going to belabor those again. Although I am going to say that the role of those partners in making this work happen is absolutely critical in this space. I can't say enough about the role of partnership in engaging youth apprenticeship as a strategy for changing the trajectory of our life, our students, and our economy. But there are a couple of things I would like to point out. And first, I would like to say that this program was created out of pain points. And I think that's really important to understand. Our local industries had a pain point. They had a critical workforce shortage that they really needed to fill. But we also have a critical pain point within our region, as I'm sure that you do in many of your regions as well. And that's that we're sitting on a gold mine of talent within the community that we serve. And yet that talent has not been harvested in a way to enable them to have the really high skills that they need in order to take the incredible jobs that are opportunities within the region. So the partnership had a strategy of changing that within the region that we serve. And there are a couple of things I wanna point out about that. First of all, in terms of the Trident region employers, whenever we were invited to create this program, we wanted to make sure that this program was sustainable over time. And so my colleague, Mitch Harp, you're gonna hear from him in a little bit, looked at the employer who was interested in doing this and asked them if they would work with their competitors. And out of that conversation, the sector partnership strategy was born. And that sector partnership strategy is really critical because one employer does not have to hold all of the keys to keeping this running over time. If an employer decides not to hire within a particular year, that's okay. The apprenticeship itself doesn't fall apart because their sector partnership with multiple employers working in this space to make that work happen. The other thing I wanna point out is that we are not engaged with just one local school district. Our local school districts within our region truly work together in partnership. They work across uh, district lines to ensure that all students within our region have equitable opportunities. They share ideas. And so those K-12 leaders working together in that space is really critical to our growth as well. Next slide, please. So when you put this together, what does this look like? Well, one of the things I wanna point out is that our program is truly a registered apprenticeship program. This is not a pre-apprenticeship program. All of the programs that we are offering here are youth apprenticeships that are registered with the U.S. Department of Labor. They share all of the components of a registered youth apprenticeship program. The students are enrolled in job-related education or what many of you may refer to as the RTI. They are going to work while they are in that classroom experience, receiving on-the-job training from really skilled mentors so that the work that they're doing in that classroom is immediately relevant on the job. And that's really critical to ensuring that they're really learning these skills at the level they need in order to fill those jobs of the future. And they're earning a scalable wage. So the students are really engaged in work within a career field to which they aspire, rather than pushing carts out of the parking lot of your local grocery store or selling fast food in your local restaurant, which so many of our young people end up doing in order to bring money into their pockets. So it's designed strategically that way. It's also designed as a two-year program, but it is adaptable because all of these youth apprenticeship programs are competency-based. And we can talk about that more as the day goes on, but they're competency-based. So the student has a series of competencies that they must master on the job, and the employer keeps track of those competencies and ensures that the student is meeting all of those before they're awarded their national credential. Next slide, please. So what do the students get out of this becomes the question. Well, this is designed so that students can start at 16 years old as juniors in high school and duly enroll in college classes. They can start as rising seniors or immediately graduating seniors. But regardless of where they begin, they're going to earn four things. They're going to receive their high school diploma, which we know is critical to them being successful. But along the way, they're also 
receiving a certificate from Trident Technical College in a career specific field. So they're enrolled in the exact same classes that the adults are enrolled in, earning the same certificates. These certificates are about 30 hours in length and they are all part of an associate degree program. So some of these students actually double up and take additional classes and earn their associate degrees while they're in that two year experience if they have the opportunity to do so. Others continue to get their associate degree afterwards or move on to four year institutions. They also earn their national credential from the US Department of Labor. And we tell them all the time, you know, in our area, everybody knows who Trident Technical College is and what that credential means. But if you move across country somewhere, there's no guarantee that they're going to understand the value of the certificate they're awarded from the college, but they are going to understand the value of that national credential that they've earned from the US Department of Labor. And finally, they get two years of paid work experience. Now, usually when I'm doing this presentation, I tell you lots of student stories, but you're gonna hear a panel of students and their parents who are gonna tell you the stories themselves. So I'm not gonna belabor all of them, but I am gonna point out a couple. And the first one is the young man on this page. This is Byron Porche. Byron Porche started as a senior in high school. He was, um, he was a football player who got injured and was kind of struggling with where he wanted to be in life and landed in culinary arts. So he joined the youth apprenticeship program and I will not lie and he won't lie either. We struggled wondering if we were gonna get him through this program or not. not. I am happy to say the Byron made it through this program successfully and that here you see him earning his national credential from the US Department of Labor. But what you don't see is that he is now still employed with this employer. He is a manager in one of the restaurants in their resort. And he contacted us this year to find out how he can hire a new youth apprentice. Coming full circle. Next slide, please. So when we started this out, we started in 2014 with um, one pathway. We had, had been approached by a manufacturing company that was really terrified about losing skilled labor. And so they wanted to develop a program in industrial mechanics. And as we said, Mitch asked them to work with competitors and they surprised us by saying yes. So we started with six companies and 13 youth in 2014. We now have over 18 occupational pathways. It ranges from 18 to 20 so far, depending upon who's hiring each year. And they run across nine different industry sectors. So it's not just specific to manufacturing. Apprenticeships can happen in any career field. Um, I have 2019, 2020 up here on the screen because I want you to see what our numbers looked at, pre, look like pre-COVID. So pre-COVID numbers, we had 18 pathways and nine industry sectors. We had over 180 companies who had registered youth apprenticeships with the US Department of Labor. They don't all hire every year and that's okay because we created this as a sector partnership. We had 118 apprentices, 77 new hires that year. In the midst of COVID, we lost a little ground, but we still were pleased that in the worst of COVID in 2020, we had 50 students hired into youth apprenticeship programs. Now, post COVID, well, we're not post COVID, but coming out of the worst of COVID, we are back to pre-COVID numbers. So we had approximately 80 apprentices hired this year and we expect that to grow over time. The beautiful young lady you hear is, see right here is Madison. Madison started at 16 years old in our CNA to pre-nursing program. She did CNA and patient care technician training and was employed by Roper St. Francis Hospital at the age of 16, she was doing direct patient care as a patient care technician in the hospital. And the very first week on the job, she helped deliver a baby, Madison Crawford. Next slide, please. So with this slide, you see the multiple industry sectors in which these youth apprenticeships are created for our region. Um, and you see beautiful students all the way around the screen. These are all some of our previous youth apprentices. As Dr. Thornley indicated in her earlier remarks, we have had 445 youth hired to date. These youth span a wide variety of walks of life and backgrounds. They are from under-resourced backgrounds to youth from more affluent households. 
They come from one of the highest performing high schools in the nation to some of the most struggling inner city and rural schools within our region. 40% of them have been students of color in a region that is 36% persons of color. So the demographics of this population outpaces the um, students of color within the region that we serve, which we find to be just an incredible asset. 34% of them have been female, which surpasses the national average for women in apprenticeship, and many of them in non-traditional fields. They have gone straight to work as a result of their programs. The, lady, the young woman in the upper right-hand corner was the first to buy her house at the age of 19. We've had five students home, purchase homes under the age of 21, as Dr. Thornley indicated before they can even buy a vehicle. They're buying homes. We also have students on this screen and amongst the other 445 who've gone on to four-year institutions to earn bachelor's and master's degrees. We've had them go to Princeton, to Duke, to study neuroscience and engineering and a wide variety of skills. So when you build youth apprenticeships, if you build it with a ladder of progression to enable students to achieve whatever their career aspirations might be, you open doors to multiple opportunities. And we found that the employers are very excited about being engaged in this work. Some of the students on this screen are students with disabilities. We've had students with physical, cognitive, and emotional disabilities, and we've provided all sorts of accommodations to assist them along the way. So apprenticeships are for all students, not just some. Next screen, please. With the next slide, you can see the variety of occupations we currently have available. And as I indicated, this fluctuates. Um, we've had as many as 20 different occupations at any given time, but at the moment we've have individuals who are hiring in these career fields or have hired. And so you can see again that students have multiple opportunities. The list changes each year depending upon who's hiring, but is also expandable so that when companies have an interest in filling a critical workforce need, and we know that it's going to lead students to a viable career path, we are more than happy to sit down with them and work with our partners to create apprenticeships that make sense for you. Next slide. I wanna to return to this slide for a second because I wanna really emphasize the value of the partnership. As Dr. Thornley indicated, as um, Deputy Hanks, uh, Deputy Secretary Hanks indicated, none of us can do this. This requires partnership, strategic work, and all of our partners have a critical place in this work. We also know from our experience that it is really critical to have a local intermediary to hold this partnership together and to ensure that the day-to-day -day operations take place. So it is our role as a college to serve as that local intermediary. So for the rest of our session this morning, we really want to take a deeper dive into what it takes to be a local intermediary and the types of things you have to consider engaging in as you begin to develop these partnerships and youth apprenticeship programs that are successful for your area. Next slide, please. One of the things that we do is we serve as the liaison and support for all of our local stakeholders. We pull everyone together and we support them in this work. We engage in lots of communication between the partners uh, or amongst the partners as we move through this. We also ensure funding and financial management. Dr. Thornley talked about leveling that playing field by ensuring that we have the educational expenses covered for all of our students. And so it is our role as the intermediary to really make sure that we are able to leverage those funds that are available within our region. They may be um, state dollars. They also may be philanthropic dollars to enable this work. And we collect and share the relevant data so that we can really begin to um, show program improvement and to also look at where we're having issues that we need to resolve as a community in order to ensure that all of our programs are equitable, equitable and that all of our programs are designed to meet the needs of our local industry needs and also our local student needs. So 
We have two divisions in our college who are really critical to making that work happen. We have the Division of Apprenticeship and Employer Partnerships that's led by our Dean Mitchell Harp, and we have the Division of School and Community Partnerships that is led by Tanisha Serafin. Both of those deans are going to share with you a little bit about how their groups engage in this effort to ensure that this moves smoothly and that all of our partners are sustained within this work. And so with that, I will turn this over to Mitchell Harp. Thank you, Melissa. Um, if you could go ahead and turn to the next slide, please. Um, as Melissa said, my, my name is Mitchell Harp. I'm the Dean of Apprenticeships and Employer Partnerships. Uh, we are the employer facing part of the, the program. Uh, we work with the employers on almost anything and everything you can think of, but our, our two primary goals with the employers, first of all, is to recruit employers, um, to convince them to partner with the college and join us in this effort to start youth apprenticeships all over Charleston. And second of all, is to retain those employers. I often tell my team um, that we need to be their best friends. Uh, and yes, we do jump when they, when they call us. Um, some of the things you're gonna, I'm gonna go over here, you see on the screen, um, but those are really the two primary goals of this. I mean, we are the sales team for the program. You, you can't do an apprenticeship without an employer. And as Melissa said, we, we, did, we learned very early on that even though we were very thankful for the employer who reached out to us in 2014 and asked us to, to help get this started for them, but we were more thankful for them when we actually asked them if they would work with their competitors. Because um, if you're going to sustain a program, and we're going into our eighth year of programs, um, you've got to have employer engagement. You've got to have employers who are committed. Um, and yes, that takes individuals like uh, my team who actually we call on the employers constantly um, for various different things. But I'm going to briefly go over the slide right here to sort of give you some insight in terms of what my sales team does um, to keep our programs going. First of all, we recruit and educate employers. Um, as I said, um, I, I really do mean educate because um, many employers have no clue what an apprenticeship is. Um, a lot of them think it's internships and we have to educate them. That's a whole lot more than that. Um, but we actually sit down with them. Um, I often tell people it's a boots on the ground approach. It's door to door sales. Um, if you're gonna do this correctly, um, if it's gonna be done with quality, um, you've got to sit down with those HR managers, those operation managers, uh, the CEOs, whoever. I'm um, gonna explain to him about the partnership and explain what the expectations are. Um, when I say we wanna be their best friend again and we, we're, we're jumping when they, when they actually call us, uh, we do everything for them you know, as an intermediary. Um, the first thing we do is we actually assist in developing uh, their training plans and also developing their programs and standards for the apprenticeships. As Melissa said, all of our programs here in Charleston are USDO um, certified or credentialed. So basically we have to help the employer identify the RTI. Um, we're a technical college, so obviously we have a lot of wonderful programs here. We have advisory boards that employers sit on. So most of our, our suggestions for these employers, um, they go with, um, but ultimately it's their program. So we, we honor what they want um, and we help them develop in that manner. We also actually help them identify competencies um, based on their job descriptions or valuations that they provide us. Um, we provide that for them. Um, we put it all together for them. And we work with Apprenticeship Carolina, who our state entity is, um, to get actually registered with the United States Department of Labor. Um, we don't leave our employers though. Once they, they decide to join us and once they decide to, um, to partner with us to offer these young people the opportunity, um, we definitely make it an easy button for them. If they have a question, they call us um, and we, we help them and guide them through that um, area. Um, but we also work with um, being a community college. We have the advantage of um, working with the internal people here at the college, uh, meaning the faculty and the leadership to actually help the program keep, keep flowing smoothly, you're saying. Um, you know, every year we start the Youth Apprenticeship Program once a year. Um, it is a full calendar year, believe it or not, though. Um, it's October and we're already reaching out to our employers uh, to find out if they're going to participate next August. Um, we have a huge recruitment event that Tanisha will talk a little about in a minute, um, which is really our kickoff season where we actually get young people to actually apply for the apprenticeship programs. And my team actually connect them, those applications with the employers who are participating. It usually takes us four or five months to actually place, you know, 80 to 90 kids, um, which is our average um, of placements every year. And then we, you know, once the apprenticeship starts again, we actually continue providing that assistance throughout the duration of it. And finally, as you can see, we do collect um, data um, with our employers to actually help them manage their apprenticeships. If you could go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, one of the things that we developed a couple of years ago um, to actually help um, track the data that I talked about um, was two years ago, uh, I kept on getting asked, how do we know what's going on on the job? And I'd always tell the people who asked me that, that we have wonderful partners and I trust them exactly with what they're doing. But then I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually figure out what the young people are doing on the job? Um, so we developed an app called My Apprentice. It's, it's an app that we put together that basically helps apprentices understand the per apprenticeship program requirements. It documents their achievements and it provides accessible information to the employers and also us as an intermediary um, to actually help manage and most importantly mentor you know, that apprentice so they can be successful in the apprenticeship. Um, the three thing that the apprentice, uh, the My Apprentice app tracks actually is uh, the completion of the JRE or the RTI, um, the hours completed on the job they've worked and also the tasks required to be completed. In other words, those work processes that you want them to learn or that the employer wants them to learn. And the beauty or the difference between this app and some of the other apps on the market is this, this app is apprentice driven. Um, the apprentice enters 95% of the information, um, which is important because first of all, we want them to show ownership in their apprenticeship. We want them to understand what they have to achieve and strive to go after it. So it's, it's a great tool that allows us to do everything from mentor the apprentices to monitor the apprentices to collect data on hours worked, competencies completed. Um, it even has wage information in it so we can eventually calculate how much um, work they're providing for the Charleston economy. So with that said, I'm gonna pass it over to um, my counterpart in crime, Tanisha Serapin. It used to be Hook. I I'm trying to get used to saying that, um, but she's gonna talk to you a little bit about what she does for the, the program. Tanisha. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Um, just to give a little tidbit, I got married in the spring, so we're all getting used to this new name of mine. <laughs> um, but as he said, my name is Tanisha Serafin. I am the Dean of the Division of School and Community Initiatives here at the college. Um, we are the student facing side of, of this partnership. Um, my division serves as the liaison um, for our educational stakeholders. And can you Go to the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself, so sorry about that. Um, we serve as the liaison for our educational stakeholders, and we collaborate with these stakeholders to provide seamless educational opportunities for youth in our region. Um, our division is made up of five individuals uh, who are dedicated to this work, and we provide direct support to our K-12 partners, uh, youth apprentices and their families, as well as uh, community leaders. Uh, who are also engaged in this work. Um, I'm going to go over a few things uh, that you see on this slide, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about the uh, job-related education component and uh, our role in, in making that happen for the apprentices. So we are fortunate enough uh, to have a long-standing and strong working relationship with our educational partners as we have been engaged in providing dual enrollment programs for youth since the 1990s. So our collaborative efforts with regard to the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program has been pretty seamless since its inception in 2014. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we do uh, to educate our K-12 partners is um, we host two uh, workshop luncheons annually for school counselors and administrators and we use that opportunity to update them on all new things happening with the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program. Um, we've learned that um, with our division, school counselors and administrators are our biggest cheerleaders. They're the boots on the ground. They're the ones meeting with the students and families and talking to them about all kinds of opportunities. Um, and so we wanna make sure that they are equipped with the information uh, to share with those students and families as they're looking uh, ahead to, to their futures. Um, we started those uh, luncheons with um, high school counselors, but then we quickly learned that um, we need to be tapping into the younger populations. And so we have also uh, started to include our middle school counselors and we may even um, expand even further and start uh, partnering with our elementary school counselors and administrators so that we can ensure that we are a part of um, moving that pipeline forward and, and starting younger 
as students are, are making their plans. Um, another piece of that, uh, we're engaged, our division is engaged with lots of different recruiting events. Um, we're participating in parent nights and information sessions at the high schools and even uh, during IGP meetings for, for middle schools. We are participating in college and career fairs. Um, and we're even doing virtual presentations right now. Um, we've been invited by a few of our high schools to um, do virtual presentations for students in their career and technical education classes to kind of help promote the program. But one big event that we are extremely proud of um, is our annual youth apprenticeship information session that we host. Um, it's usually going to be um, the first Saturday in February every year, and that's typically when the program officially kicks off for its hiring season. Um, we've, we typically do it on campus uh, this past year, of course, with COVID, we were um, restricted to doing it virtually, but um, we typically have an amazing turnout. Um, students, families, school counselors, administrators, community leaders, community organizations, all are invited to uh, come and learn all about the youth apprenticeship program. Um, we also uh, work with Mitch's team to uh, invite employers to that event so that they have the opportunity to speak with students and answer any questions that they may have as they're learning more about the program. Um, the other piece of, of what we do um, in terms of, of engagement and support, we, we provide, um, we serve as kind of the intermediary on the student side in the sense that if the students are experiencing any hardships or, or they're going through some sort of uh, difficulty, we step in and we connect those students to support services offered here at the college. Um, we also monitor uh, student progress and final grades in those uh, youth apprenticeship classes. And I'll talk a little bit in a second about that job related education, but we, we also monitor that progress for the students and, and what their grades look like so that we can um, ensure student success and identify student support needs and wraparound supports that we identify are needed for, for helping that student along and, and making sure that they're successful. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mitch mentioned a little while ago that um, we, we review those applications when students apply for a position um, in one of our apprenticeship pathways. Um, those applications come to my team, we review those. We also participate in interview um, processes as needed. Um, and we hand those applications off to Mitch's team who then collaborates with the employers to determine which students are going to be hired um, for that upcoming academic year. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, so with the job related education, um, Mitch mentioned this, and I don't think we can stress this enough. I know you've heard it a lot this morning, but uh, this program relies heavily on its collaborative model with all involved partners. And so with the job related education, employers are usually the first um, to give that critical input on the education and training that is delivered to the youth apprentices. And um, they help to ensure that that curriculum is tailored and designed with the specific industry needs in mind. Um, once they have made those determinations, then my team steps in to collaborate with our academic leaders at the college and uh, as well as our K-12 partners to finalize the curriculum and course sequence that the youth apprentices will follow. Um, and there are three ways that we develop and deliver that JRE or RTI, as some of you may um, be familiar. The first is that the college is, is the primary educational provider. We provide all of the related courses for that respective pathway. Um, for example, all of the courses required in our industrial mechanics youth apprenticeship pathway are credit courses that are traditionally offered at the college. Um, this particular way of delivering the JRE is incredibly helpful for those high schools or school districts that have high schools who are not um, able to offer a particular career and technical education program in that subject area. And that opens the door to give students more options in CTE. 
The second is that some high school courses could be counted for college credit. For example, youth apprentices in our culinary arts pathway who complete the um, high school culinary one and culinary two classes uh, could also receive college credit for those classes and those two classes would count as our um, the first two culinary courses in the pathways uh, JRE. And then the third is that some high school courses are required as a part of the youth apprenticeship curriculum. Our project lead the way engineering assistant pathways, for example, require students to, to complete several high school PLTW engineering courses as a part of their um, progress in the youth apprenticeship program. And um, that is, is it for me. Um, I think I am going to kick it back over to Melissa to, to finish out the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Last slide, please. And I will just wrap this up quickly and say to all of you that we are, again, delighted to have you here. I know that we probably just panicked you telling you that five people in Mitch's team and five people in Tanisha's team worked to make this happen. But let me assure you that we started out with Mitch and Melissa and driving the show. It grew over time. Um, and let me also assure you that both of those teams have multiple other responsibilities for the college. So it's not just running the apprenticeship piece. The other thing I'd like to say is we gave you a quick overview and we're already running over time on this, but um, we do want to let you know that we are having workshops in the spring, April 4th and 5th at our site in Charleston, we hope we pray. And we would love to have you come and do a much deeper dive on subjects that are really critical to you in your communities. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much to the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Team at Trident Technical College. My name is Kelly Betty, and I'm a Senior Policy Analyst with the PIA team at the Center on Education and Labor at New America. And I'd like to invite you to join us at 1225 Eastern Time to hear directly from youth apprentices and their parents at our next panel, Expanding Options and Opportunity, the Youth Apprentice Experience, which will be moderated by Elena Silva, Director of Pre-K through 12 Education at New America. And I'm Elena Silva. I'm the director of Pre-K-12 Education at New America. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've watched the evolution of PIA, the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship at New America and across the country and particularly in Charleston. So I'm so happy to be here with this great lineup we have today, an esteemed lineup of, of guests. Uh, we have uh, former youth apprentices, we have youth apprentices, we have parents um, and parents who also serve as um, administrators and faculty themselves. So a lot of perspectives to draw from today. Um, we are going to just jump in because we have so much to cover and we've got a great lineup, as I said, and we want to make sure that we leave time for questions and answers from the audience. Um, to begin, I'm going to let folks introduce themselves. Um, we have um, Amber, Drake, Evan, Jordan, Carrie, Sonia, Pam, and Zach all on our panel today. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves um, starting with, with Amber. Amber, tell us a little bit about um, who you are, what work you're doing right now, where are you in school, and where are you working, and, and what is your job title? Tell us a little bit about yourself. So my name's Amber Gilliard, and I just graduated from Wando High School this year, and I, um, I'm working at Roper Hospital in Mount Pleasant. I'm a pharmacy technician apprentice. I started the beginning of my senior year, I believe. Yeah, it was like the end of my junior year, beginning of my senior year, I started my apprenticeship. Um, right now, I'm about a year and a half in, almost two years. And Drake, how about you? Where are you working right now? What is, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and um, where you are at this point. Sure. Um, I graduated Ashley Ridge High School in 2019. Uh, one of my engineering teachers told me about the youth apprenticeship. Uh, I was able to join up with Keon North America, and I've been well, ever since I've been a, a industrial engineering apprentice, um, I was able to get, once I graduated from the, or I guess I was done with the apprenticeship, um, I was able to become a technician at Keon. I'm still at the, the same company and uh, I'm still with going to Trident and I'm trying to get my uh, transfer credits for the Citadel to get my bachelor's. So pretty cool. 
Very cool. <laughs> it's very cool. Evan, how about you? Can you tell us where, where, where you are, who you are? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm the parent of a 17-year-old senior at Wando High School. Uh, he is pursuing the industrial maintenance certification while also working at Boeing, South Carolina. I'm also the registrar at Trident Technical College, so I am at this from a little bit different perspective as well. So I play a little bit of two roles in this, but uh, happy to answer any questions, uh, provide any insight from both those perspectives. Glad you're here. Um, Jordan, tell us about yourself. Where are you and where are you working? Uh, my name is Jordan Stewart. Um, I graduated from Timberland High School and I work at Berkeley County Government as an HVAC apprentice, and I go to try to take me my associate's degree. Thank you, that's great to hear. Carrie, um, how about you? Can you tell us, tell everyone who, who you are and where you're working and where you are at this point? So my name is Carrie. I, um, I graduated from Hanahan High School and I graduated, um, I actually got my certificate before I graduated. So right now I'm pursuing my associate's degree and um, I'm an automotive technician. So right now I'm working at an automotive shop on Ashley Phosphate and um, yeah, so it's all good. Thank you so much. Uh, Sonia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Good afternoon, I'm Sonia Addison Stewart. Um, I think I serve in three different roles. I am the parent of Jordan Stewart um, I am also an educator for Berkeley County School District. I serve as the Career and Technical Education Director um, for Berkeley County, and I'm also an educator as well. So um, I have several different perspectives that I can offer today. Thank you so much. And another parent, Pam. Hi, my name's uh, Pam Zanowski. I'm the mom of Zachary Zanowski, who um, just finished up the program in the spring of uh, 2021 um, and was fortunate enough to get a full-time position with the company that he did his apprenticeship with. Um, and I'm also the executive director of um, the YMCA here in um, Somerville. Um, and I can't say enough great things about the program. So looking forward to this. Thank you, Pam. Um, and your son, Zach, um, why don't you jump in? Uh, hi, I'm Zach Zanowski. I uh, graduated from Sunville High School in 2019. Um, I currently work at Lincoln Electric as a manufacturing engineering technician. Um, I am still pursuing my associate's degree. I should finish it up this semester. Thank you so much to, to you all um, for those great introductions. It's great to have you all here. Um, I know there's uh, in this conference, there's a lineup of other panels, but I will say that I'm, I'm very happy to be with this panel. It's, it's the best one because you really hear from the apprentices um, and you get to hear about the perspectives of folks who've been through the program, hear the perspectives of parents and educators. And so it's just so wonderful to have you here. Um, I'm gonna dig in a little bit by having us flashback. Um, so those for those of you who are apprentices now or who are were former apprentices, um, flashback to, to, the, to the beginning. So how did you first hear about the apprenticeship program um, and, and what or who influenced your choice to pursue the program. So if, if, if there was someone in particular that helped you or there's a way you heard about the program, um, let us know. Um, anyone wanna jump in some, perhaps one of the apprentices or, or yes, Amber, go ahead. So first, okay, so I heard about the pro, well, no one actually told me about it. I was in health science one at Wando, my, junior year and there was this poster on the wall that my teacher had she had it highlighted and marked up but like no one would ever really look at it and then I noticed it said free so I was like something is free let me go look at what it, what this is so then I read it and it was about the program so then I asked her about it she told me about it and the one she had on the wall was specifically about the CNA and I was going to originally do that um but then um I looked more into it she told me about it and she told me there was a youth, try to take youth apprentice meeting coming up. So I went to that and they were first, that was, this year was the first year they were interested, introducing the pharmacy tech program. So that's when I was like, okay, I'd probably rather do that instead. So then she helped me out or worked with my guidance counselor and we got all the applications and stuff put in for me to apply for the pharmacy tech apprentice program. So we did that and um, I got in and yeah, it went from there. But um. I heard about it basically through the poster through my teacher. I didn't know about it before and 
when I asked other like you know my peers about it, friends if they knew about it because I was like this is like it was kind of too good to be true like even the guidance counselor didn't know about it and they're like no we didn't know like nobody knew so I was like oh okay it was something new so how about other folks? Did you hear? Did you see a poster? And this is a physical poster, right, Amber? Not not like a digital or something yeah, like you saw. A physical, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other, is it posters or is it the teachers that are um, maybe counselors or are you hearing it from your friends or folks just hearing it around? From me? Anyone really? I, I think we got um, Amber. That yours yours is probably from a poster. I'm trying to get a sense. Like Carrie, Jordan, Drake, or Zach. Um, how I did you hear I'll, about the program? I'll go ahead. Um, I didn't hear about it from any actually my mom came to me and uh suggested i look take a look at it because i wasn't really sure what i wanted to uh do after high school um it, you know, uh it was a good way to kind of get my foot in the door and a something i might be interested in without you know having to go for a four-year degree um you know getting a lot of money in debt and not still not maybe not knowing what i want to do Um, I didn't know anything about the apprenticeship program until my mom told me back in maybe March or April. And she was like, you should try it. And I was just like, no, mom, because I'm not really used to doing anything new. So she was like, no, you should try it. So we signed up for it. And yeah, it went on from there. I actually had um two companies call me. One was in Charleston, and then I had another one right there at Berkeley County Government. So I went to the one in Berkeley County Government and had an interview there. Terry or Drake, you want to share how you first heard about it? Sure. How you decided? Um, so yeah, so when I was in uh, my last engineering class in high school, uh, my teacher, Dr. Reeder, she, she, we didn't have any posters or anything, but she kind of just word of mouth mentioned it to the entire class. And uh, I actually went home, talked to my dad about it. And um, two of my buddies that I know, uh, they were actually being mentored by my father at VTL. So I talked to them and they were like, hey, this is a super awesome program. And then I was able to... I talked to my guidance counselor and then I was able to talk to Ellen and um, she signed me up for that initial meeting day. And it was, it was pretty, it worked out pretty well. I didn't even know that they had a, a PLTW kind of uh, way you could go as well if you already took engineering courses. So, I mean, they had everything there. So yeah, word of mouth pretty much. And Carrie, how about you? Yeah. So basically like Amber I like walked into class one day and there was this beat up poster and I was like dang like <laughs> I had nothing like I knew nothing about it so I was like let me look it up because I know good and well I'm not paying for college and it ended up working out really great and I don't know even like the guidance counselors my teachers they were like no honestly I don't think you should do it like because you're going to be so backed up with work and stuff like that and I was like I'm going to do it anyway and I'm really glad I did. Yeah, that's great. So we have a we have a parent effect and a poster effect, and it sounds like some teachers were were in it as well. Um, it's uh, it's great to hear that the the stories of how you first hear about it, because I as you all know, youth apprenticeship is is not as widespread as it could be across the country, and there it's not something that a lot of people necessarily know about. Um, and while while Charleston leads the way, I'd say um, it still is so interesting to see how the recruitment happens. Like, how are you finding out about these programs that aren't necessarily the first thing you think about or something that you you'd know about? Um, before I want to get pull the parents in and ask their perspectives on um, the beginning and when they first decided to get involved. Uh, I guess some of you played a role, but um, how you felt about it. But before I do that, I want to go ask the apprentices themselves. If you're, um, and I think Drake, you you mentioned this, but were your peers and your friends doing this as well, or did you have to step out like on your own and be like, I'm going to do this, you know, even though it doesn't seem like I don't know anyone else doing it, I'm going to do this. Um, or did you already know people that were doing it? Yeah, I kind of, I already knew um, two other people that were doing it, and I I actually convinced my buddy to do it with me, um, but eventually he just, I guess the work in school got to him. So he kind of just went away from it. Um, but yeah, I, I did know two kids that did it as well. And how about you, Jordan? You said you'd never heard of it. Um, I think it was also Zachary and Jordan. You both said your mom told you. So um, you, did you know anybody else that joined or were, were was it just, just you? And what was uh, that like? I know somebody that graduated about a two, a year or two ago before me. 
I heard they are graduate from Timberland and they was doing it. And they actually were, matter of fact, they work at the same place I work at now in the automotive section. And they told me a little bit about it too. Great, that, yeah, it's helpful to hear. Anyone else feel free to jump in. It's, um, there's so much that we know about the peer effect. Like at this stage, you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do when you're in high school and you look around you. And that's, I mean, that's just a really big um, uh, effect of looking around and sort of seeing what others are doing. So while we take the guidance from our teachers and you take the guidance from your parents, there's also like what everyone else is doing. That's part of the reason uh, I asked that question. Um, other folks want to want to weigh in on that um, before otherwise i'm going to open up to the parents i'd love to hear from your perspective um, either i guess your your child comes home and and has this idea um, maybe they saw it on a poster um, or maybe you hear about it and if so you know where where did you hear about it and what did you think about it when you first heard about the apprenticeship program and and how did you uh, feel about it just jump on in well i heard about the program <laughs> several years ago when it started. So I was really familiar with it. So Jordan said that he first heard about it in March, but I don't think he remembers, but I, you know, I started taking him to the apprenticeship events and I was pushing him up and having him to talk to people to explore and see what the options were at that time. So it was probably a little traumatic for him. So he's probably blocked that out of his memory. Um, so when I first heard of the apprenticeship program, I I was just amazed by it. And just to see the growth of it over the years has just been simply amazing. So I've just been sitting on the sidelines, you know, waiting for my children to possibly explore this, this area. And so Jordan was the child that took advantage of this. And I'm, I tell him all the time how fortunate he is to have this opportunity. But even though you know he's fortunate to have this opportunity, it is still very challenging, as he will probably talk about in a little bit. It's, it's a challenging opportunity, but there's so much growth in it as well. Um, so again, I've known about it for a long time. I was excited and, and grateful that Jordan took advantage of the opportunity. Yeah, Jordan, it probably helps to have your mom be the CTE director, right? So um, you would know about it. Evan or Pam? I guess I can jump right in. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I was involved in the Youth Apprentice Program from the get-go. Our, our dual enrollment office at Trident Tech, obviously, were the heavy hitters. But at the time, I was uh, an assistant registrar. And me or my office now, uh, we were responsible for sending grades to the companies, to the high schools. And, and other enrollment information. And, you know, at the time, years and years ago, <laughs> not that long ago, my, my child was in elementary school, so I didn't think much of it. But, it, it, you know, going back two years in February of 2020, I, I don't know, something just hit me and, and I mentioned it to him. Uh, my son really likes to work with things with his hands. Um, yeah, at the time, and, and even still to this day, worked a lot with welding things and just messing with things, making things. and. Um, I threw it out there at him as a suggestion, and, and he went with it. He really, really liked the idea. Um, I tried not to help him all that much um, from a sense of doing it, obviously doing it for him, but I empowered him to take, take ownership of the process, um, the admission application process, the resume writing part of this, the application, and, and he did that. He, you know, I helped him, we helped him prepare for his interview with Boeing, South Carolina, and uh, rehearsed it really with him during the initial part of the pandemic for for weeks we really practiced and rehearsed and he, he obviously did well enough to get the job and he's been doing great ever since um, so that was my role in, in it um, obviously from as a parent i also like sonia i often remind my son how fortunate he is to be a part of this and you know it's a great opportunity you know, not many uh, kids their age get this opportunity. Um, often have to rem remember that, you know, my son's a teenager. Um, they're going through other teenage stuff at the same time. So they're balancing a lot, whether it's finishing their high school, finishing or working with the company, taking the college classes, but also being a teenager 
and having that teenage life. So I think that it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, sometimes they have to give up some opportunities that other teenagers get to do or choose to do. So it's, it's obviously it's, it's a challenging time for the teenage student, but also for the parents as well. Sam, how about you? Why don't you weigh in here? And then we're gonna to turn to the apprentices. I wanna ask you all about exactly what Evan was just touching on. How do, you, how do you manage it all? How do you balance it all? But Pam, what was your experience as a parent? Um, I think for us, it was a little scary when you know your junior um, comes to you and says you know that they don't wanna to go to college. Um, um, but for Zach, I think it was a mature decision because he didn't wanna to go to college to figure out what he wanted to do. Um, so we just started kind of exploring some different different avenues. Um, there was, you know, we have a, a great career and technology school up here in Dorchester County. Um, so we looked at that. And honestly, the book that they give you for all the high school students, we just happened to come across the youth apprenticeship program. Um, so I have a good friend in the school district and I asked her about it. Um, and she said it was a great program. She put us in touch with Alan Kaufman. Uh, we attended the, you know, kind of the, um, the meeting that they have to tell all the, the introduct the informational period that they they provided. Um, we attended that and Zach kind of explored some different avenues and kind of like Evan and Sonia said, it was a it was definitely a learning experience. They had to sit down and write cover letters and resumes and go through the interview process. And I think for us too, it was it was just as um, you know, waiting for him to get those interview results back was um, you know, it was kind of scary, you know, and, and you're going through that with them. But like both of them said, uh, we we constantly tell Zach how fortunate he is to be able to, you know, have been a bit able to be a part of this program. Um, and at the same time, it is a learning experience because they are finishing high school, they're going and taking college classes, and in addition to that, working full time. So it's a lot, um, but we're we're proud of him, and, and we are, you know, he's very fortunate to be able to have gone we to have found this program. So. Yeah, so to, to second to all of you or third or fourth or whatever it is that the is, is certainly a privileged place if, if you're fortunate to be part of this program. However, it's a lot, right? I think uh, maybe as Sonia said it was a challenging opportunity. It's both. It's an amazing opportunity. It's also a really big challenge. So we want to name that. Um, so those of you who have, have been through this or are in it right now, um, you're navigating the high school, the college, the employer all at once. You're going back and forth to all these places and managing those transitions and even the different cultures of school and work and uh, college classes. So what's that like? Or what was that like? What's your typical week like? Um, what were the, how do you balance it all? What were the big challenges that you faced? And, and I think Evan mentioned giving up things. Was, was there anything you had to give up? Um, just jump on in, any of the uh, apprentices, please. Um, I had to give up some sleep time, you know. Um, it, it's a lot. It's a lot of pressure on your back, even though it's a job and school at the same time. And you have to maintain it, even though it's a lot, because you have to go work the next day. And then when you get home from work, you can't like can't rest or nothing a little bit. You have to just go straight to your work because you want to get everything done. You know? For me, it was like learning time management because my time management skills before was already kind of in. But like now when there was a whole lot more on my plate, it was like, okay, now, now I have to get right. So I think learning to manage my time like properly, like that, it was hard for me to do, but it was like a big plus from this apprenticeship because now I can manage my time properly. And also I learned like how important it is to communicate. Like communication is a big thing. Like letting my employers know like, hey, I have a school assignment or letting you know, my teachers know, you know, like what let, let people know what's going on. Like, don't just leave people empty minded because it, I could like when I told my teachers, when I told, you know, my employer, like let people know what I had going on or that I needed extra time to do something, like everything, you know, worked out fine. But yeah, I think my biggest thing was um, just talking to people, letting everyone knew like what I had going on and actually managing the time, like, you know, high school, college, and work. For me, what I did was, so I was still in high school, but I had took, taken majority of my classes. So I was just, I had like an early release. So I would do my high school classes in the morning. And then once I finished, I would do my, um, like the through credit trident courses. Then after that, I'd go to work at night. Um, I'd only be at work for like two hours though, because, you know, working, you're 
going to learn and for experience it wasn't really you know for the it wasn't for the money so I go every day for two hours and yeah so it was a cycle for me high school college work every day just like that and then weekends I'd usually um I'd have my weekends for free honestly yeah my weekends were free I didn't do any work on the weekend so It's a lifelong uh, challenge to figure out how to balance the time and the work and all the things you have to do in your life. Um, and to mention again, the points that the parents were bringing up just about being teenagers. So um, Carrie or Zach or Drake, um, you wanna jump in? What was your experience like? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, just like Evan was saying, yeah, right after high school, a lot of my friends, they kind of did the teenage thing, but then I had I went straight from that to waking up at 4.30 uh, Monday through Friday. And then I would what I would normally do is I'd work, um, about 5.30 to 2.30, and then I'd go to college, I'd take night classes, I'd come home, and uh, I'd do homework the rest of the night, so yeah, it, it does get a little tricky, uh, working an eight-hour day, and then taking a calculus class, for example, and then coming home and doing homework, it's it's tough, but it was well worth it, um, so. Yeah, um, like, like he said, it's it's mainly like a juggling act, to be honest. Like I was working at the time, I was working two jobs. I was going to high school. I was a junior at the time. And um, I was also going to the college classes at night. And then, um, yeah, so I was working seven days for like two years. And at, at the beginning, I was still playing sports. So I was still playing powder puff too. But um, yeah, like he said, it's, it's a juggling act, but honestly, it was worth the sacrifice. Like I like if I had to go back, like I really I wouldn't go out partying with them, to be honest, you know, like it is what it is. But I'm really glad I did it, though. That was like another big thing as well, like my friends, like or like friends on school, like she said, going out to parties and stuff, not being able to go party because they're doing work. But um. Like a lot of my friends are like, why are you pushing yourself so hard? Like, why are you doing all this? But my thing personally was, I was trying to think long-term because I did not want to go to school for four years. So I was like, I'd rather do this now and get it knocked out the way than graduate. And now I'm done, you know, making money working. And then, you know, I don't have any debt. So I think a big thing was like thinking long-term and being motivated, thinking about the future and the end, like what's going to result, what's going to come from all of this, so. Thinking long term is an incredible skill to have at any age, but particularly um, when you're in high school. So uh, it, kudos to all of you for having that foresight. Um, Zach, did you want to jump in on this? Um, and then I then want to want to remind just before you do, I want to remind the, the audience, please feel free to drop questions. Um, we're going to move to questions in uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, so drop questions in if you have them and we'll try to get to them. Um, Zach, how about you? Yeah, I'll jump in here a little bit. Um... You know, a typical day looked like for me, I would go to high school in the morning, um, go to Trident to, uh, from about noon till four um, and get off and go straight to work and work till 11. Um, so, yeah, it, it definitely takes a toll on you. But it like everybody else has said, it's worth it. I now um, obviously I liked it here. So I, I work full time for them. Um, and uh it's it's a great experience. Um, the stuff that I've learned has been amazing. That stuff I never thought I could do before, um, and it's great. So uh, the challenges, I, I think that there's a lot of growth and development that the parents have mentioned. Um, it'd be great if you could try to qualify that. You know, give it give us a sense of how did you see your these young people that you were raising what kind of growth and development did you see how did you see them change um obviously it was difficult but also an opportunity so uh maybe evan and pam and and sonia if you have um thoughts on that we'd love to hear them sure i you know like i said teenagers so obviously saw maturity um change <laughs> for the better um you know the, like i said teenagers but one thing that i saw that really impressed by that I certainly didn't have when I was a teenager um, or until recently, to be honest with you, is financial management. And, you know, I see my son um, working uh, at Boeing and pretty much putting all of his money away. Um, I couldn't imagine what I would have done with the money that he has saved up. And then on the weekends, he's working another job, bagging groceries at a grocery store 
just for gas money and things like that. So maybe not the way I would have done it, definitely not the way I did it. And I, I'm impressed to see that, but at the same time, it's that time management because I'm, as a parent, I keep telling him and reminding him, school first, you're a student first, no matter what, you're a student first. But at the same time, I know that he's got these other responsibilities and it's hard to, to get him to understand that. But he, he knows that. I mean, he, he, at this point, um, it's a little bit more difficult telling a, you know, a middle school kid that that's um, wanting to you know, play basketball, football, all those things. But at this point, you know, they're understanding that. And, you know, I think some of the, the student speakers today have, have even mentioned you know, the, the value in this program as opposed to jumping right into that four-year university setting and the, the amount of money that it, it saves, because it, it's incredible, the, the savings and the graduating without debt. I mean, that's just an, an amazing um, opportunity. I'll go ahead and um, jump in. For Jordan, um, the growth and development that I am seeing with him um, are those skills that we are hearing from the employers, um, the skills that they say that they desperately need in our, our future workforce. And so I'm so very proud of him um, for his work ethic that he has um, and ha what he's learned throughout this process. He has to be to work at 7 a.m. in the mornings and we live about 20 minutes away from the work site and 610, he's out of the house every morning. I'm never up to wake him up. He comes to the bedroom to, you know, to tell me bye during the day. So I'm so very proud of that. He shows up and he shows up on time. He stays, he doesn't call out. And so I've been trying to express to him that, my gosh, that's a huge part of it right there that you have. You, you continue to develop these skills and some additional skills, um, workplace skills. You get the education component and you will be so marketable. And I'm telling him this constantly. So I'm, I'm trying to work with him because I know those skills are, are very important, even communication. You know, I remember when he first started, uh, working, he was like, oh, I'm working with a lot of older men and I don't have anything in common with them. And, and they're talking about hunting and I've never gone hunting before. And I said, find a common ground because this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to communicate with your, with your coworkers. And now he's coming home and he's talking about his coworkers um, and giving me different stories. So these types of skills, I've seen a lot of development with him in that area, a lot of growth and development. And um, you know, I plan to continue to encourage him in that area. Um, and also in just all of the skill areas that he needs and he, and he gets the support all around, you know, through um, his mentors and also um, through the apprenticeship program and how, you know, they assist him as well. I'll jump in, um, you know, just what Evan and Sonia had said, um, you know, obviously the time management, um, something that we were really proud of with Zach was, you know, a lot of times when they start these apprenticeship programs, they start out at the bottom, you know, they start out doing the, um, you know, he was on the floor for a long time working on the machines and he knew that, you know, as, as great experience as that was, that isn't ultimately what he wanted to continue to do. Um, so he kind of found his niche. And when he found out that hey, I'd like to be the one behind the computer actually programming the machines. He went to his supervisor and they had that conversation. And so then he transitioned into a whole whole other level at the, you know, the company that he's at. Um, and we were really proud of him for, for doing that. Um, and, you know, like Sonia said, it's, it's nice to hear from his supervisors what a great job and what an asset he is to the company at, you know, as a 19-year-old when he started working full-time for them. And it's neat when he comes home with certain projects and things that he's done and, and things that he's brought to the company. Um, so, you know, as a mom, you're, you're proud of the fact that he's actually contributing and he, he does show up and he is, um, he is reliable and he does what, what is asked of him. And a lot of times, um, you know, you can't put a price on that, um, being a reliable um, 
dependable employee. And we're proud of the fact that he he has done that and he has kind of juggled all the things that he needs to, needs to have done. Yeah, thank you all for that. The I mean, we're hearing all of you young young women and men and the parents um, who are you all are very impressive. You're all here, and you you are um, your communication skills are excellent, and you're uh, willing to be here, and all of all the skills are coming across just in this. Um, plus, all the things that you're reflecting on, and, and the parents that are on this panel are mentioning about responsibility and motivation and all of that. For, for those of, for those of you who are apprentices or were, um, do you think? Are you highly motivated, like as an individual? Have you always been that way, or did you? What I'm trying to get at is, what did you gain from the apprenticeship versus, um, you know, maybe you already were like that before? And I ask that in part because when we think about recruitment for youth apprenticeship and who's engaged in this in, in these programs, and we want to expand it, we want more people to be able to be engaged. You start thinking about like, what would it take? Because obviously, it takes a lot. Um, so, what would you say? You what did youth apprenticeship teach you? What did you get out of it? Um, so for me, it taught me that, okay, I'm not going to say I was immature, but I'm not like, I wasn't as mature as I thought I was. Like, I thought I had all my stuff together. I'm like, oh, like now, okay, so before I started, my guidance counselor and teachers told me, it's not going to, like, it's not going to be easy. You know, it's a lot of work. You're going to have, you're going to have a lot of, of what is it, a bigger workload. I went in there, I was like, you know what, I make, you know, I make good grades in school. You know, I never really struggled in school. Everything was good for me. I'm like, I'm about to go and this is going to be a breeze. But no, I started it and, you know, I was struggling because it was a lot of work. And plus, you know, I was in high school. So I wasn't, I wasn't used to doing college work or, you know, how the classes would be, it would be more, uh, more work. So when I started it, um, I'm not going to lie, I was struggling. But, you know, I talked to my teachers, talked to my guidance counselor, and, you know, they got me in track. And. I can definitely say I have gotten a lot more organized with this program. I've like learned that organization is very important, keeping up, you know, with your tasks, you know. Um, I never used to keep sticky notes or set reminders in my phone or set alarms, but you know, I'm doing all that stuff now, keep myself organized. So I think a big thing on this program is um organization or maturity, whichever, whichever word it is, but I feel like I grew up, I learned a lot, like I took I took a big step before that I probably don't know if I ever would have taken if I didn't join this program because I was still undecided before I joined this program of what I wanted to do after high school I just knew I didn't want to do the four years so I didn't know if I would you know go to Trident or you know what I would do so yeah how about the rest of you what what did it teach you what did you gain um, for me, it was just basic soft skills, you know, um, getting involved with people at work, um, getting to work on time, because when I first started, I was just like, Man, there's no way someone can just come here every day, seven o'clock in the morning. And then I had to just learn from that because I, I started to get the feeling of it. Um, and I started to enjoy it because the place I work at now, it's a lot. The person I was working with, it's a, it's a lot. And it's amazing how you can learn so much from one person about uh about ac units um maintenance because i wasn't even i wasn't even when i first started i wasn't working with air conditioning i was working with the electricity side and i didn't even know how to change a change a ballast in a light bulb you know what i'm saying so they taught me that and i'm just like wow that's that's pretty easy like no one no one ever showed me that and now they got me they got me driving in the van by myself so it's just it's it's really amazing how much i learned over the past three or four months Drake or Carrie or Zach? Sure. Um, I think one of the biggest things I got from the youth apprenticeship was uh, like the work side of it. Um, working at Keon, um, I started off, like Pam was saying, I started off on the floor uh, assembling forklifts and then eventually I transitioned over into the IE department. Um, but just working, working with, um, you know, every different type of engineer and just kind of seeing how corporate life is and how everyone how all the departments mesh together and how it's, it was unbelievable. It's something I could have never learned in, in school really. So it was, uh, you know, priceless for me.
Yeah, I've always, I've always liked a busy schedule. You know, I think my whole thing was trying to like be able to stick up for myself in certain situations or, you know, even just like trying to be less shy because like the idea of like being here, you know, two years ago would have like scared me. Like I never would have done it, but now like, I don't know, it's definitely taught me to, you know, speak up and I don't know, be less shy, especially working with a ton of guys. It's like, you got to speak up sometimes, you know what I'm saying? So I definitely learned a lot and, and it was, it was great. And on that point, um, uh, my mom would tell you, I was, I'm, I'm a pretty quiet person, but I feel like through this experience, I've become a better communicator of what I need to say. Um, you know, I've learned how to work on projects with other people and, uh, you know, just be a part of a, a team that can, uh, we, we get stuff done. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a great program. Um, um, I like, I learned a, a lot about how stuff is manufactured and, um, it's, it's amazing how much stuff that you don't notice that you use every day that behind the scenes takes so much effort to make. Yeah, thank you, all of you. Um, I hope I, you must not know, you couldn't know um, how impressive you are. So you're all really quite incredible. Um, and I, uh, at some point you'll be able to re reflect back maybe and watch this and, and remind yourselves of how incredible it is at, at your age that you are able to be so um, well spoken and and so mature. Um, so kudos to you all and, and to the parents who are who are supporting you. Um, we're going to go to some questions in a moment, but from the from the audience. But before we do, uh, from the apprentices, and I think Evan, you're the parent here without the apprentice. So if you happen to know this, what are your plans for the future? Some of you are still in your apprentice apprenticeship program. Some of you are done with it. But what do, what are your plans? If you know, do you know what job you eventually want to be doing or what degree you want to be getting? Let's, Zach, I'm going to go straight back to you because you were the last person to speak. So we'll start okay. there. Um, actually, in the spring, I'll be leaving uh, Lincoln Electric and I'll be going to Middle Tennessee State University for uh, mechatronics engineering. All right, let's go, Carrie. Um, yeah, so right now I'm finishing my degree up. Although, I mean, I did graduate, but I graduated with my certificate. So right now I'm just finishing up the degree. And then after that, you know, I plan on working, maybe even starting my own business one day, you know, an automotive shop one day, but we'll see. And Jordan? Um, I plan on getting my associate's degree for the next two years. And uh, I plan on working somewhere I can be like a supervisor for um, air conditioning and then for do that for a couple of years and then I want to start my own um, air conditioning business. Amber or Drake? Um, so for me, um, but can I, can I tell you how I came to the conclusion of what I was going to do? Okay, so, you know, I work as a pharmacy tech at Roper right now at the hospital. So, I thought I was going to be strictly limited to just working in the pharmacy, but that was not the case. Like I've been all around, you know, like in surgeries, like I've done a lot of stuff in here. So, you know, being in the hospital, I met a ton of different people and there's, I realized how much health careers there are. There's a lot, like a lot more than I thought. Cause you would just, when you think hospital, you think, you know, doctor, surgeon, nurse, like, you know, stuff like that. But um, every day when I would go in the radiology room, to drop off meds in there for, for the radiologists and the radiologist techs, they'd be in there on their iPads in the dark, just, you know, watching a movie or something like that, because, you know, in the radiology room, it's quiet. They only, you know, someone only comes in there when they need a scan, you know, and it's quick. So I was like, hmm, that, that was fun. Cause you know, you don't, you know, you just in the dark, you know, doing paperwork. So started talking to them and, um, Got to, got to talking more and more about them and they let me uh, mentor them. So I um, came in, I think it was three days I watched them. Yeah, like three days. So um, I was like, wow, I really liked it. So then I came to the conclusion that I wanted to do rad tech, which is radiology tech. 
and that's a two-year program. So I'm taking the prereqs for that now. Then this August, I'll be taking um, a rad tech program in Greenville. Greg, how about you? Sure. Um, so I'm actually still working at Keon. I'm gonna. I'm doing uh, transfer credits uh, to get a. It's like a two plus two transfer program. I tried to the Citadel. Um, and once I get to the Citadel, I want to get my mechanical engineering degree. And I honestly, I still want to work for the same company. So I hope I can either be uh, an IE or a design engineer at Gion. Those are all some impressive plans. Evan, do you know the plans for your, your son, I believe? Yeah, I mean, he's hoping, uh, you know, he's still in school. He's a senior, like I said. So he's, he's hoping that he'll get an offer from uh, the company he's with. And uh, he, he's still contemplating um, continue with that career path um, but, or staying with that company and uh, potentially doing like what Drake said, um, the two plus two, uh, potentially engineering with the Citadel as well. My 17 year old son is, is contemplating, you know, what kind of pizza to get on Friday. So just to set the bar, <laughs> um, he's wonderful. I'm very proud of him by the way. Um, so I'm going to move to some uh, some questions from the from the audience, but I, I I will say personally that that's it's very impressive even that you all can articulate what you think you want to do or where the path you're headed on. Um, most folks I think at at your stage and age can't do that. So again, um, congratulations on on getting to that step. Um, the audience has all sorts of wonderful questions and wonderful things to say about you all. Um, you're also impressive. This is me reading questions. You're also impressive. Um, and let's see, Jill wants to know, how did you navigate the scheduling process for related instruction, like figuring out which classes to take and when? Obviously, that's that's going to be complicated. Um, do y'all have any advice on that or, or reflections on how that was or is? Um, so for the youth, admin, the youth apprentice administered, I think, I believe it was Ellen Coffin. I think that's her, maybe. But she set up every semester she'd set your classes up for you and then she emailed you all the classes you were taking and then she'll either call you or email you or something like that and be like um let you know your schedule she'll send you a screenshot of your schedule and let's see and she'll ask you like is this okay with you like this is the courses you'll need to be taking so she'll set every she set everything up for me and you know my classes registering all of that she handled I just had to show up and be there to take the class she but she did all like the you know other work Other folks, and I'm gonna just jump in with other questions too, so you can respond to that or a related question, which is um, another figuring out, how did y'all figure out transportation? Um, did you all drive yourselves or take buses or get rides or how did you get to all the places that you needed to be? Yeah, I just wanted to shout out um, Miss Kaufman real quick because I relied on her a lot and like she would always email about like any breaks or anything like that. So shout out to her because I, I really appreciated that. But um, as far as rides, I ended up having to buy my own car, um, which was good for me because, you know, like a lot of parents do, you know, you appreciate it more when you buy it yourself, you know, is how they say, but I really did end up you know, appreciating it more. So I really am grateful to her for making me work, you know, for that. But yeah, it it, it was good, yeah. The, when I first started the program, I had my permit, so I couldn't drive alone. So that was kind of tough because both my parents work and my dad works pretty much all day from morning to night. Um, so it was, heavily relying on my mom to take me to and from and then my older sister um she she had her license but um she had a job as well so just catching rides from my mom and my sister was how I was how I had to um was how my transportation was and whenever they weren't available it was catching a ride from either my neighbor or my friends but eventually I did end up getting my license and my dad did get me a car so So I'm gonna to continue to say, folks, just jump on in. Anyone that wants to, parents as well, um, if you have reflections on your own kids or experiences, 
was there stigma um, from friends or family members or, or anyone really about your cho chosen path of apprenticeship instead of traditional college? And maybe even Sonia, I would actually ask you from a CTE director perspective, you know, what your thoughts are on that. But Evan, I see, I see you, go ahead. Okay, I, I guess I'll go. Um, I, I was just gonna say, these opportunities weren't available to us when we were our kids' age. Um, so I think that a lot of uh, people around us, um, maybe family members, don't understand. And, and it's our, our job as parents, but it's also the, the student's job as the student, as the apprentice, to really explain and to um, showcase, show off what they're doing, because I think that they get a greater understanding, a better understanding of what it is they're actually doing. And for, for us, you know, I work at the college. It's great for us, for all of these uh, young people, the, the students, to showcase this, to talk about it back at their, their schools, in the community, churches, synagogues, whatever, so that it encourages other people as well, because there's so many opportunities that are probably going untapped. Um, I don't know the numbers. I, I know that our um, dual enrollment people, some of them are, are here, as, uh, you know, obviously on the call, but I'm sure I feel like there's probably a lot of opportunities that are still out there for many of the teenagers in our community, high school students that uh, are out there. And, and there might be that stigma from adults in the area, not really stigma, excuse me, but that lack of understanding from the parents because these opportunities weren't there when we were their age. I, I would definitely say the same thing. Um, when I explained the apprenticeship program to my mother, and just to give you a little background, my parents both went to four-year college. Um, you know, my husband and I did. And so even on my husband's side, it's the same way. So trying to explain this to my mother for her to understand, um, you know, was, it was a little challenging. And then sometimes people say, well, oh, well, he's not going to college. No, <laughs> he's in college, he's going to school but he's also getting the benefit of, you know, working in his area while he's going to, to college. And so I have even, I started talking to Jordan about different opportunities very early on and how people receive their education. And I will even tell him, my daughter went to a four year school and I, and I think he's better off than she was because she went just to school and, some of the things that he's experiencing in the workplace now and has worked through, she's just now going through that. So he's going to be so much further advanced in that, that area. So I think, like Evan said, making sure that we spread the message. I know I've been trying to do my part, talking to people, talking at you know, people at church and at different organizations about the amazing opportunity that this is and how it can propel your child to their, to their future goals. We're going to have to wrap up in just a few minutes, but um, I, I, I want to end with another uh, last, last question, um, which is really about how to expand awareness about this. Um, I, I, it's building off of what you just said, um, Sonia. Do you all have suggestions? And I would look to the apprentices. Let's hear, hear from you first um, about how to get the word out. Some of you found out about apprenticeship by chance. Um, some of you had parents that were you know, pushing you or supporting you or telling you about it. Uh, what about your peers, your friends, the people you know at high school, other teenagers in your high schools or other high schools? How would you get the word out to them? What do you think would be most of the most effective way of sharing this? Go ahead, Drake, I saw you go in. Oh well, yeah, I was just, so I guess I was kind of like a late bloomer to this because I heard about it like, the last couple months of my senior year, um, I think if it would get pushed, because like my guidance counselors, they always kind of push the four-year degree. Um, I think if it was pushed more on the front end a little bit earlier uh, in high school and like like for my high school, at least there was posters about it and then the kids understood a little better, um, especially when you have that two-year free thing, that really kind of set my mind to it. Um, yeah, I think if it was pushed a little bit harder in high school, it would have got a lot more people. How about the rest of you, Jordan, Carrie, Amber, Zach? What would you suggest? Honestly, I think it would be best coming from like 
people who are actually in the program right now or like who have been through it because you know I know teenagers and they they aren't going to listen to you know adults who are like oh yeah you know you should do this because it's good for you you know not every teenager is going to respond to that but if you know someone who's still on their level you know just like comes to them and be like this is what you should do because it's free <laughs> you know what I'm saying and like here's why because you can learn so much and you can like just really grow and you know build your future based off of that so yeah I think that'd be really important I think like what she was saying that exactly like at my school um or at my high school at my high school Wanda you know we have meetings in the PAC sometimes which is like the uh, auditorium I think maybe if you set up some like presentations like a quick presentation just get some students in there tell them about it um and I think honestly posters or flyers would help a lot like posters in the school for the actual apprenticeship would like because kids are looking at the, the walls are blank. If something's there, the kids are going to look because it's, you know, it's like, what's that? Because the walls are always blank. So I really think posters would bring a lot of awareness in the school because the poster that my teacher had up that I saw, it wasn't even like a real poster. It was like, she, it was something she printed offline about it. It was like an information sheet that she marked up and she made it like, you know, grab our attention with the highlighter and the marking and stuff. So I really think maybe like presentations, if you go to different high schools maybe talk a little bit about it. it could be quick and posters would help a lot last words Jordan or Zach do you have anything to offer on how to, how to get the word out well they basically said everything I was going to say um posters on wall and stuff make sure it goes to school because some of them is a small school you know what I'm saying nobody really goes up towards something like that or cross or something like that or small schools you know what i'm saying so it should it should really go up down walls and stuff posters and everything i would just say trying to uh get people to go to the information session that uh tried and tech holds for the program um because i know a few students speak there every year um it gives them more information about the program you know it only you know it's not it's not that long uh, even if even if schools would even if uh you know you could go to schools and do something like that that would be beneficial excellent thank you all so much um we're going to wrap up now but again my deepest appreciation that you all joined today that you were willing to share your stories um congratulations to you all on how far you've you've gotten and good luck to you and all your future endeavors parents too thank you so much for joining and sharing your perspective um it's been great thanks so much Thank you again to our moderator, Elena Silva, and thank you to all of these inspiring and impressive youth apprentices and their parents for sharing their experiences. Now I'd like to invite you to join us at 1.30 Eastern time for our next panel, where you'll get an opportunity to hear from the employers. From finding talent to developing it, the employer's case for youth apprenticeship, which will be moderated by Eric Sells now, the senior advisor and director of JFF Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending upon what part of the country you're in. Welcome. My name is Eric Sellers now, and um, I'm with Jobs for the Future and uh, a very happy partner in the uh, PIA project nationally. JFF is a large national nonprofit that uh, works at the intersection of education, training, and work. We've been doing so for almost 40 years, and I lead our Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. It's been operation in four years, and we do a ton of work with states and locals and boards and colleges and employers and a whole lot of other work in uh, for the Center of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Um, while this will never be ex as exciting as having a bunch of apprentices on, uh, like the previous section, which was outstanding, by the way, kudos to you guys for that one, really smart young people. But it's almost as cool because we have real live employers here and people who work with uh, these young people and provide them opportunities. And I'm going to guess, and you can disabuse me of this notion, I'm going to guess you've been totally impressed by many of the apprentices that you have had as youth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So I've got a series of questions, and I'm joined uh, by a range of folks in the South Carolina, Charleston region. Um, but I, I don't know uh, uh, all the names of your companies, so you're going to have to help me with that. But as I go through, I'm with Debbie McLeod, Don Drake, Donald Smith at Hendrick Auto, um, 
who else do we have here? Uh, David Brown with uh, Kion Group. Uh, Kion. Roxana uh, with HCA Healthcare and the rest of the introductions I'll let you do. But we've got a great group of folks here um, who provide uh, not only opportunities to students and are helping out young people advance or also developing a pipeline of the future, um, they're uh, spreading uh, uh, good skills throughout their community, not only with their job, but certainly in maintaining work skills and work values and really is a big issue in um, training our next generation of workers. I wish more folks around the country would do what the Charleston region has done, but um, I always tell people across the country where we go that there's a lot of programs out there that are doing youth apprenticeship. Look at Charleston first. That region, great relationships with employers, a good central intermediary with Trident Tech and a range of very good partners from K-12, to community college system, employers, uh, and business associations. So with that, I'm not going to waste any more time. Um, the monitors of this uh, session might want to give me the hook or a warning when well, we've got about five minutes left because I know me and this group will love to talk about this issue and can talk about it uh, for uh, uh, a, long, a lot more time than we have scheduled today. So give me a heads up if we're running over. But um, thank you, um, Melissa and Mitchell and all the other folks at Trident for helping organize this session. Um, so let's just jump in it, right? I mean, we talk about apprenticeship as being employer driven. Uh, whether it's youths or adults, uh, we in the apprenticeship supply side of things need to make sure we understand what employers' issues are, what their concerns are, what their skill needs are, what their future workforce challenges are. So we really need to get the employer's point of view on this. Um, and then there's the other side of what the system can do in providing appropriate students to help the employer solve that problem. So we want to sort of address the history, how your programs came together, um, tell us a little bit about your company and the program. How's your experience been to date? And we want honesty. We don't only want to hear good things. If you had a student who had challenges and you had to sit them down for a while, that's fine too. That's part of the process. Uh, but we do want to hear uh, very much how, they, how these things operate. So in other parts of the country, we can sort of replicate some of those themes that you're doing. So I'm just going to jump right in here. And I think I'm going to start with Debbie McLeod. Debbie with... Um, all right, Debbie, tell, tell us a little bit um, about your company and what you do for your firm, Deborah. Okay, so I'm Debbie McLeod from McLeod Information Systems, and I'd like to say thank you for having, us, having me on today. Um, we are a cybersecurity company. We were one of the first in the state of South Carolina to put a registered apprenticeship program in a cybersecurity business. Um, the I am the president of the company. I'm also the apprenticeship director. And the reason that we chose to do this is because of the job shortage. There's approximately 3 million short worldwide in um, cybersecurity. So we, my husband and I collaborated and we decided that it would be beneficial for us uh, in the industry that we're in to grow our own pipeline. <laughs> So I love that term, grow your own. Uh, I often use that with apprentices because you're in fact doing that. Um, and cyber is a really interesting space to get to. There's a number of cyber apprenticeship programs across the country um, at various stages because I think it's still all being worked out. Um, so you looked at the job shortages. You looked at... Um, which is very situational, right? Pandemic related, post pandemic, you don't know where you're going to get your workers from. So you decide to grow your own. So what did you do? How did you connect with this system? Um, uh, and did you know how it was going to turn out when you started? Um, so what I did, because I have my um, histories in education, I knew that schools have intern programs. I was I was in one myself, so my first approach was to contact the local school district about having interns, and I got no reply, so I decided to investigate that a little further, and in my investigations, I came across Apprenticeship Carolina, who came, sat down, they brought the local school district in, we sat down and we talked, we explained what we wanted to do, everybody agreed that it was definitely needed, and they, through doing that, um, we 
partnered with Trident Tech for the educational portion of this um, program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's an interesting uh, experience. Um, was it Trident that you, so Apprenticeship Carolina is known for having, I call them navigators, but apprenticeship consultants located throughout the state. They're usually attached to a community college, which is great. Was it a Trident consultant that reached out to you at first or just another one from apprenticeship who then ended up connecting you with Trident? I initially approached Apprenticeship Carolina, and when they came and they understood that um, the local school district hadn't replied, and we wanted to start out at the high school level, um, uh, specifically the underserved population. Um, so once we sat down and we put all the pieces together on how this was going to come together and how, what we wanted my program to look like, that's when they referred me over to Trident Technical College. That's great. Um, uh, so apprenticeships are far different than internships. I was also a high school intern and a college co-op student. Um, and apprenticeships are far different. Um, uh, and I think you've made out on the deal with that, right? Um, I mean, it really is, um, you know, a real way to integrate, integrate a possible pipeline of workers where interns are mostly just for the experience of the student. Um, did you encounter any unexpected challenges or problems, or was it like you were discovering new and interesting things every day that worked for your program design? So far, we haven't um, had many challenges. And in reference to the internship, the purpose of that is with cybersecurity, we wanted a limited amount of obligation from the student. So the internship pro program lets them know and lets us know, is this a good candidate for an apprenticeship? Mm -hmm. So that's the purpose of doing it that way. Um, but through the whole program, we really have not, everything has been pretty much what we expected, except for what we did not expect is everybody who works in the company wants to participate with the apprentices. They Everybody sees that as the most energetic and exciting part of our company. So that was a little unexpected. And then how much we love what we're doing and how much um, we have seen these apprentices grow through the program. It's been way more rewarding than what we expected. You know, I've heard that before, Debbie. That's an excellent proposal, uh, excellent uh, 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 comment to make. Uh, we were working with a healthcare, a hospital up in New Hampshire, and the staff were actually fighting over being assigned the apprentice because it, it sort of changed their organization. You know, they describe it very similar to you, and it 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 juiced up the staff, and everybody wanted to help out. And you know, I mean, as as far as recruiting future students, what a great welcome for them to have everybody interested in them. Um, so, uh, so how long have you been doing this and how many students have you uh, been able to bring on? Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about scale. Oh, did you bring on 100 students? Did you bring on 10 students? Um, uh, you know, and there's uh, a lot of policymakers and politicians like to say, we want 10,000 apprentices. But the reality of the workplace is not everybody's going to absorb a huge number, and that's fine, right? But, um, you know, as long as you're doing that sort of work with somebody. So how long have you been involved in it? How many students have you been able to serve? So we've been involved in this for um, a little over three years. And we have, we just took on our third apprentice. So it's relatively one each year. It's what mm -hmm. it's been equaling out to. Uh, we are a small business, so we have to take these uh, um, new apprentices in as the funds become available to do so. So our goal is the more we grow the business, the more apprentices that we have. Right, right. Well, look, and even if you only get one, one a year, right, uh, in five years, you're going to have five highly skilled people in your office, right? In 10 years, you're going to have 10. So, you know, they do expand over time, uh, and that's fine. Um, uh, in terms of an investment, sometimes we hear employer, employers say, oh, my goodness, there's a lot of startup costs. I don't want to be associated with that. Uh, I want to find something else. I mean, it sounds like you had a lot of energy, a lot of focus and some effort in trying to find the connection. 
Was there a lot of investment up front? Was it a onerous process up front? Or once you found Trident, things worked pretty smoothly for you? There wasn't a lot of um, investment on our part. And as I just spoke at an international conference last week, um, two cybersecurity people across the world. And that was one of the things that I mentioned to them as whenever they were looking at the ROI perspective, because that's always something that IT seems to want to throw up constantly. Um, and my response to that was a response that I had heard IBM make, which is you either invest now or you lose now or you lose later. Because right now we have a pipeline um, emergency and you're either going to spend that money training them up front or you're going to spend that money in the rear training them afterwards. So you pick which pathway you are wanting to lose, but mm -hmm. you're going to either lose now or you're going to lose later. So as far as an ROI, we personally feel like it. we're already seeing that growth and whether we see it in dollars we or, or it's more so that we see it in the lives being changed. And that to us is way more rewarding than seeing the dollar signs. So let's talk a little bit about the logistics of this and working with Trident and doing something called a registered apprenticeship, which seems to have a lot of mystery, myth, and perception surrounding that term around the country. But um, uh, I, I want to, uh, you know, how was it working with your local college's Trident? Um, and uh, was it a burden, if you will, in registering the program? I hear lots of employers say, oh my goodness, the paperwork was terrible and it's so hard. And I usually hear that from employers who never tried it. Um, but I'm wondering how that experience was for you. Was it onerous? Was it easy? I wouldn't say that it was exactly easy because there was the cybersecurity um, education outline had to have quite a bit of tweaking. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that had to come with us sitting down um, once we got that put in place. And I wouldn't say that's exactly tedious and laborsome whenever you already have in mind what your expectations are and you already know what your career field demands, that makes it a little bit eas um, easily accomplished. Trident was very helpful. They're they are still helpful as far as anytime we have questions or um, just if something needs to be done um, through the Department of Labor, they're quick to let me know, hey, we need this part, you know, and it's so no, I wouldn't say that it's been onerous. And as I would lean more towards it's been a little bit more easily done. That's great. That's great. All right. I'm going to, uh, the last question for you, I can actually continue this conversation, Debbie, all day. I do think cyber is a really interesting space. Your comment about um, having to tweak the curriculum at your local training provider <clears throat> is exactly how this system is supposed to work. If a, if a training provider educational institution cannot meet your needs, but are willing to, then you need to tell them the skills and the curriculum and the things you need the student to have. And our job as practitioners in this space is to meet that challenge and to be able to customize an apprenticeship program to your needs. So I'm sure the college made out on your contributions. Um, you did, and certainly your apprentices would. My last question to you, Debbie, is if you had to sort of had a group, a room full of employers, what sort of recommendations would you make to either employers or other community-based partners who are just starting out? So in the cyber employers or employers in general? Any employer starting an apprenticeship program, I'd love it if you lean towards IT and cyberspace, but you know, any employer who's getting ready to get involved in this because we have employers from all over the occupational and industry spectrum. So the one thing that I'm consistently, I repeat myself um, all the time is when you're looking into these programs, especially if you're going to start with the youth programs, do not overlook your Title I schools and your underserved populations because especially in IT, they, they tend to lean towards wanting the cream of the crop, thinking that they need to go into the magnet schools or the charter schools. 
but within the walls of these underserved schools are students that have a lot of potential who just need those doors of opportunity to open for them. So that is the one thing that I'm consistently repeating over and over and over. Do not overlook them. You need, a, you need students from each of those categories to balance out your program. Many times I tell employers, you know, at minimum, it should reflect the demographics of your community, your apprentices. Um, you know, and, you know, look, it's, it's um, uh, you know, there's, there is oftentimes where people say, oh, we want to go to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the magnets or the gifted and talented programs when there's talent right in front of them from a lot of other places. I will tell you, though, from an employer point of view, to have you leading with that is really important. Right, because um, many people are trying to figure that out, but you as an employer saying, look, we wanna make sure everybody in our community has access and opportunity to enter apprenticeships. And certainly IT and cyber are probably male dominated for the most part anyway, probably um, racially dominated by uh, whites versus others. And actually the data would tell us that. So, so good for you, that gets you a lot of bonuses in many different ways. So thank you, Debbie, I'm probably gonna come back to you, so don't go anywhere, thank you very much. Really interesting that we led with cybersecurity. All right, who do I have next? Uh, gonna ask similar questions to Don Drake, HMGI Charleston. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Hi, where are you? I see everybody on my screen, but. Oh, Hello. there you are. Hey, hey Don, you. how are you today? Doing fine, thank you. Good. Tell us a little bit about your company. Well, we're a, we're a 32 year old company. We're a restaurant and a real estate holding company. Mm hmm. Mostly in uh, the South Carolina area. Mm -hmm. Are you in the Charleston region or all over? We are. We're in the Charleston region. Okay, great. So tell us a little bit about, now, my last visit to Charleston, I happened to visit another a number of culinary apprentices. It's my favorite thing to do uh, when I'm on the road. Tell us a little bit about why you entered into this apprenticeship. We know the hospitality tourism industry is a big thing, particularly in the Charleston region. Um, I'm assuming that's what drove some of this, but tell us a little bit about why you got involved in, in this apprenticeship work. Well, we've been involved with apprenticeship programs now for roughly about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Having uh, you know previous experience with uh, the larger culinary schools like you know the CIA Johnson and Wales and you know et cetera those schools Cordon Bleu and, and New England so we've we've been we have good practice with the apprenticeship programs and then we have three of our former uh, employees are actually chef instructors down at Trident and then we have two chef instructors at the local high schools so we we got a really good feedback when Mitchell uh, approached me about this new program. We were really excited about it. Um, it's like everybody else, we're experiencing, you know, a labor shortage. And, you know, you, the last visit to Charleston, you're well aware of a, a, of the numerous restaurants that open consistently in, in, in the Charleston area. So labor pool is pretty tight. But um, it was pretty easy. Uh, it was pretty easy fit for us having, you know, many, many years of experience with uh, the other apprenticeship programs we're involved with. Mm -hmm. And are they, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Are your apprenticeship programs front of the house, back of the house, um, chef and cooking? Are there other occupations or or wh where have you settled in on your occupation? Mostly they're in, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, I'd say probably the more, majority of it, probably 85% of them are in the back of the house. The other 15% are in the front of the house. But in our apprenticeship programs, we rotate, um, you know, when we get, when, we, we, when we're approached by the students or we approach the students that, uh, you know, they're assigned a mentor, and then um, the mentor takes them through their particular area that, that, you know, they specialize in, and then we hand them off to another mentor, and those three communicate, see what kind of progress they are, and then we we'll always switch them on, but uh, it's, uh, it seems to work out well for us, you know, the, the apprenticeship program we are, but by the time they leave us, even though if you're the front of the house or back of the house, mm -hmm. you spend time in, in all areas. Right. So how many, um, you know, for, uh, for the Trident program, and I realize that, you know, in your business, particularly if you have many properties in many, many locations, you need to have a, a number of people coming in to, to train and you work with some of the colleges or post-secondary institutions on this. So when, when you first started talking to Mitchell about bringing high school students in, 
Um, did that make you gasp? Did it make you stop and think? Were you worried about alcohol on premise? Were you worried about kids showing up? Uh, or or what? What what was some? Oh, of I can't concerns? say that I was I was worried about all of the above, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, especially when um, you know, the, like the first ground we got, you know, they were really young. You know, some of them were uh, fifteen to uh, seventeen. Mm -hmm. And then you know, you were you know, I have children of myself, my own, and I'm like, oh, because you know, uh, a restaurant can be a, you know, it can be a. Uh, you know, it's a really fast paced moving environment. There is uh, all the stuff you mentioned, you know, involved with this atmosphere. And so I'm pretty protective of them. Um, I really, really uh, get, uh, before we start any kind of communications, I sit down with the parents and the kids. And then we talk about the job, what's expected of them, how this is gonna work, transportation, schoolwork, uh, all the above, and then, we let it we let it roll for a little while and then we sit down again with them to make sure that you know they're keeping up on their grades you know everything's going well at home along and on and on the work front wow don that is a really smart thing to do you're sort of helping <laughs> helping set the expectations and the guidance for those young people to follow because they'll they'll need that um yeah i think i'm really really with it's really really important especially with, with, the, with the younger kids that we, we get the parents involved with it and uh, you know we take this thing as a whole but uh it's uh are just seeing phenomenal results with, with the younger guys i mean they're just they want to learn they want to learn and like uh uh you know they, they're really they're like a sponge they suck up any information you send to them and then the parents relate to you know they're they're trying different stuff at home and they're cooking for their parents or cooking for you know the company when they come over so it's been really exciting for not only us, but to see the parents, as parents too, and see the the kids grow in the field already so mm -hmm. quickly too. So, so uh, your concerns that you had initially pretty much have gone away because of some of the experiences that you've had and some of the systems that you set up. So you're you're not hesitant anymore about bringing in a 16 year old, for example. Oh no, not anymore. Um, uh, it doesn't seem a problem. We do limit now. We do limit the. Uh, the time frames that they, they they can work and they do work mm -hmm. you know we uh stick to most of the time you know uh if depending upon the grades you know they usually work on the weekends uh and you know and reasonable most time they work during the, you know when they first begin they work on in the daytime hours you know under because we have more of an older crowd in the daytime you know all of us are you know mm -hmm. 30s 40s 50s so uh they, they have a lot of you know multiple parents around and so uh we keep a good eye and watch them until we feel comfortable with them. And they, you know, they, and they make some progression and then we switch them a little bit more to uh, mm -hmm. uh, more different areas. So this question may be better for Ron or David or, or some of the others or Don, but um, any concerns about liability on your end? You're taking this responsibility. I'm sure you had to sign something. Um, you know, you have meat slicers, probably you have hot stoves, any concerns about liability that you had? And if so, well, how'd you address it? Oh, you know, of course, we always, you know, stress safety in the kitchen. And then, you know, uh, when it comes to the, the, the apprentices, uh, you know, any kind of uh, workman's comp and stuff is covered by the college. And so it's under the contract, you know, they sign with those guys, mm -hmm. which, you know, takes some of, you know, some of the liability off of us. But, um, we always, you know, stress, you know, a safe environment, but I don't really have any concerns because, you know, everybody practices good, you know, work practices, you know, in, in the kitchens, mm -hmm. just because, you know, again, you know, it's, we try to keep everybody on safety level. So uh, it's been working out well. Uh, I don't really have any concerns. That's great. Um, and uh, can you estimate of, well, I had a, I had a CEO in Switzerland's apprenticeship program say to me, look, if they apprentice for me, that's great. If they move on to one of my competitors, that's fine. It's good for the industry. And if they leave me and go back to college, that's fine. Cause it's good for the country. Um, how do you feel about, uh, hiring the, uh, do these folks stay with you after they go? Do they spread their wings and go on for other jobs? Tell us a little bit about what happens at the conclusion of an apprenticeship. Well, when it comes to especially the ones that come from, uh, you know, the, the calling shows directly, I'll find out if you can get them in their last quarter of their education and then you go into your apprenticeship program, usually we have probably 100% retention rate. Mm -hmm. Easy stay with us for, you know, probably two, three years. 
a lot of a lot of them have a you know career you know stay with us you know for the for the uh, for as long as they you know until they got out of college, but um, you know I always I always stress you know being I, you know I did my apprenticeship myself you know years and years ago, uh, but you know um, I encourage everybody to you know to, to come in learn as much as you can and then uh, go on. In your, you know, in your field and, and learn from the next guy you think is, you know, who can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, you know, I try to learn on the best chef you can and go to the next chef and learn the best you can because, you know, when you get an opportunity to open your own place, you usually only get one crack at it. If you go, hey, mom, dad, can you loan me some money to open our own restaurant? You know, usually only get one and you need one to be successful. So uh, we have, a you know, an excellent track record The people who graduated from our apprenticeship program and we've left, you know, our, our restaurant group are, you know, they have their own restaurants. Some of them have, you know, corporations themselves and multiple restaurants. So uh, whatever we're doing, you know, and with the help of Mitchell and his crew, it's been really, really successful. We've helped, uh, you know, uh, I think we've contributed to the field, you know, where they, I think mm -hmm. when you leave Magnolia as our, our group, I think you can work at any restaurant in the country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's some uh, serious uh, restaurant business down your way. Um, all right. And lastly, uh, before I go to um, Ro Rowana, is what recommendations or advice do you have for anybody in hospitality or really any employers who are just starting out on this? We're working with sites all over the country, and the hardest thing for many of them is to get started. So what sort of recommendations or thoughts do you have? Well, um, like, you know, the, the, uh, speaking before myself, is, you know, you want to tweak your program to fit your needs is there's not one set program a to set parameters and then you tweak yours to, to fit whatever your needs are whatever your uh, establishment is or what type of food you're doing but um works works out well but you know what we're doing now uh, we're working on is you know like somebody mentioned before you know the underserved or the minority community uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, we have a lot of the restaurant workers who realize that you know they never really graduated from from high school you know they 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 the reason to air their way. So now they they want to they want to get a certificate. They want to get their education. So we're really working on that program now. Where uh, we're putting them through our apprenticeship program. We're getting them an the education. So at least they're getting a GED. They're coming out with a working certificate. So uh, they're feeling a lot better about themselves. And we're giving them a reason to mm -hmm. further uh, pursue their career because you know it's hard to pay the you know it's hard to pay your rent and your bills uh, you know on on minimum wage. So. Uh, we try to give them a, you know, a way out. And with that program, you know, you guys out there think about it. It's such a win-win situation for your local community, the people that you serve. You know, they can come out, you know, if, with a with a high school education, with a journeyman certificate, and with a college education paid for without owning any college debt, student debt. It's, you know, it's a win for everybody. Wow. I highly encourage you guys to get involved and, and get started, you know, soon as you can. Great. I'm going to edit this, cut that out, make a commercial out of it. That uh, You're absolutely right. No college debt. And, and to me, these programs are not secondhand. They're not alternatives to college. They're uh, everything, uh, in my view, is equal to the preparation that two or four years can give you in the, uh, in the workplace, in the marketplace. So uh, oh, very much so. Yep. So, Don, thanks so much. Um, stick around. We may come back to you. Um, I got a bunch of questions for all of you. I'm sure they're going to give me the hook too, not too soon, but Rowana, am I pronouncing that right? Rowana Payne with HCA Healthcare? Yeah, it's Rowana. Rowana, I've seen you before. We may have had this conversation before. Um, anyway, thanks for joining us, Rowana. Tell us a little bit about HCA Healthcare, if you would. Well, um, we are Trident Medical center here in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a subsidiary of HCA. We are about a 300 bed hospital. We're an acute care trauma hospital, and we have had apprentices with us now for five years. Wow. So um, we started out, Mitch and I were friends away from work, and he approached me away from work, just socially chatting and telling me about the program and asked if we might be interested in having youth apprentices in our patient care tech program. And I said, hmm, sounds good. I've got to run it by HR, I've got to talk to the CNO, you know, do the C-suite and make sure everybody is happy with what the idea. And 
Mitch and I pitched it and they said, go for it. And the rest is history. So the moral is never go out to dinner with Mitch because he's going to hit you up for apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, we, we, we talk about everything and um, it was a good segue. You know, Mitch did the right thing and laid some creativity and I'm not sure but I believe we are the first hospital in the Charleston area to use the patient care tech apprentices mm -hmm. and they've rebranded us to pre-nursing apprentices mm -hmm. now instead of patient care tech and the other hospitals have since jumped on board as well oh, wow that's yeah I've seen that happen in communities you know uh you, you can't get the upper edge on the competition because you all are are challenging you're all are struggling for the same talent right in the same labor shed. So, so it's tough. So, you know, you've been doing this for five years. You've obviously had some apprentices that have completed uh, their work with you. Um, so as you look back on the last five years, um, how has that worked out? Have they stayed to continue to work with you? Have they advanced on the college? Have they dropped out and gone to see Don and work in a restaurant? What, what sort of reflections do you have now at the last five years? We've seen the gamut. We've seen some that have started and have just flat out said, this isn't my cup of tea mm -hmm. and have left the program. We've had others from a scholastic standpoint that could not keep the grades up to make the program work. We had others where parents were pushing them through the program and they did not want it and finally spoke up. Mm -hmm. And then we've had the opposite end of the spectrum where we have had the folks go through, go through the program, complete it, go on to nursing school and come to work with us. So that creates a nice pipeline. And the advantage to us in healthcare is if we can get them as the high school kids that are truly interested in healthcare, then their enthusiasm and willingness to work hard to become a better caregiver go up. So we get a better product when they finish. Mm -hmm. So when they get through with the apprenticeship program, they go into the nursing program, they stay with us working as patient care techs in the hospital, then they come to us as graduate nurses. And so their orientation and onboarding process at that point becomes a little quicker because they already know the system and they start at a little bit of a higher salary than somebody with no experience coming in as registered nurse. Mm -hmm. So you sort of made the same point that Debbie made earlier, which is, you know, growing your own or, you know, spending time and investing in these workers, you know, you really get to customize it to your needs, right? To what the values are of HCA healthcare, right? Or if you just, you know, people talk about buying and building a workforce, right? You can go out on the market, put out an ad and buy a worker, right? Or you can build a workforce through things like apprenticeships, which it sounds like, uh, you know, both you and Debbie were sort of talking about how that works. Um, Rowena, so, <clears throat> so here we have a, a major healthcare facility and we have 16 year olds and 17 year olds working in there and around patients. Isn't that danger dangerous? Isn't that risky? Don't, you know, do people, I mean, these are not candy stripers, right? These are people who are working and getting paid but they're young. How do you trust them in a hospital environment? So the process starts when they complete their applications with Trident Tech. Trident Tech does a fantastic job screening and eliminating those that are not meeting the criteria or not completing applications. And then they send them over to us and we review them and then we interview them. We put them through a hiring interview just like I would any other employee. And we selectively pick who we're looking for. And we tend to not lean towards the 16 year olds. We're looking for somebody that's a little bit more mature and believe it or not, there's a difference between a 16 year old and a 17 year old. And we tend to pick rising seniors into the program because of that maturity level. Now, we also make sure that they understand that they're not gonna to get to work in specific areas within the hospital from a liability standpoint. Mm -hmm. We only allow our apprentices to work in the med surge adult units. So they can't work with 
women's, they can't work with children, they can't work in the ED or behavioral health, and that's a safety process for them as mm -hmm. well as for the patients. They also complete a CNA or certified nursing assistant curriculum before they even get to set foot in the hospital mm -hmm. and start orientation with us. So that sets these kids up a leg up above a lot of other people that apply for patient care tech positions because they're coming with a solid knowledge base already mm -hmm. that we're just gonna to continue to build on. Mm -hmm. So that helps cut down on our liability. The other thing that cuts down on our liability is we lay expectations before them, just as the other folks have said. They've gotta keep their grades up. You may wind up having to give up going to the prom because you're having to work on a weekend to get your hours in for us. Mm -hmm. They um, cannot work past 11 o'clock because they're not adults yet. And so we're concerned about their safety as well. And some of these kids are still on driver's permits. So we have to be very mindful about how they're getting to and from work. So we do take all of that very seriously. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is, and this, you know, this happens in manufacturing too, where there's a lot of dangerous equipment. You're managing your apprenticeship system, right? Certain things you can do, certain things you can't do, but those expectations and the way to manage that, um, you're not going to get in trouble because you have sort of a guide and an outline to what they can and can't do, right? Um, so that's fabulous. So um, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to move on, but but how would you talk to, so healthcare is a really interesting field for apprenticeships, right? Healthcare has always had practicums and clinicals and things like that, but rarely had apprenticeships. They had apprenticeship-like things for nurses or, um, you know, physical therapists or whatever. But, but what advice would you have for the healthcare industry, which is looking more and more at apprenticeship all over the country? A few are doing youth apprenticeship. Um, you're definitely a trailblazer here. But what, what advice would you have for any of those employers, employer, sorry, health care systems that are interested in apprenticeship for youth? The first thing you have to do is make sure that you've got the support of your C-suite, your upper level management. Mm -hmm. HR has to understand that these kids are going through a hiring process a little bit differently than a regular employee. And they have to understand that we have, when they're accepted into the program, all we're doing is the cursory work to make sure that the background check is okay, that there are issues with their um, drug and screen testing and, and all of that stuff is the way that it should be. Once we get them hired, We've got to make sure that there's a well-defined orientation process with one person coordinating the entire process that follows up with them to make sure that they're meeting their hours the way that they should be, that they're meeting their checkoff list for skill sets, that they're keeping up with what Trident needs to know in regards of the things that they're doing taking care of the patients they have a app that they're typing in what they're doing to care for the patients and that has got to be all kept up and we keep them on orientation a whole lot longer than we would somebody that is coming in as an adult into the mm -hmm. role so we keep them from august all the way through till december on orientation before we give them a little bit more autonomy Mm -hmm. So you've got to just keep a close watch on them and be very supportive. And communication is the key. Great. So I have one more question for you. I'm not going to let you off though quite yet. So by the way, audience, feel free to ask questions or chat them. Or actually we have a Google sheet in which you can send your questions on the Q&A tab or link. But Rana, what, um, so there's a question from uh, Jill here that says, besides the fact that she says you all are so impressive, um, how did you navigate the scheduling process uh, for the related instruction? How did you make sure that they got off to go to school, that they were finishing their high school classes, that they were going over to Triton to take classes? Um, it must be one heck of a matrix you did, but how did you figure out the timing and scheduling of students? That was easy. <laughs> and it, truly, out of, out of everything, that was the easiest part because Trident Tech tracks their grades for us. Then as they finish their coursework, I get their grades. And anybody that does not pass a course, then it becomes my decision 
through the hospital to determine whether or not we're gonna keep them on through the program. Are we going to wash them out of the program and let them stay on as a patient care tech? Mm -hmm. So that piece was fairly easy. And what I do is um, sit down with the kids when they start and they tell me what times that they can work. And then I build their schedule based on what they tell me that they can work. And some of these kids choose to work a 12 hour shift on a Saturday and maybe an eight hour shift on a Sunday, or they'll work four or five hours after school in the afternoon. And we've got the support of our managers on the med surge units that allow these guys to come in and work those type of hours while they're on orientation. Then once they come off orientation in January, then it becomes the manager's responsibility to manage their schedules with them. And they're met to meet the expectations mm -hmm. of what's required of the patient care techs on those floors. Okay, that's great, that's great. And, and Debbie and Don, do you have scheduling problems? I mean, particularly in the restaurant business, you guys probably have scheduling that changes every week or two. Um, just real quick, cause I need to get to Don first uh, and then David, but um, Don, any scheduling problems in your industry? Uh, for me, uh, no, not not really. Um, we, like, you know, uh, I, I don't really have any schedule problems with them. You know, like everybody else, uh, restaurants are busy during the holiday seasons, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, you take that into consideration a little bit because you know, uh, you know, everybody wants to have Christmas off, everybody wants to have Thanksgiving off, Easter, all the stuff like that. If anything, that's probably the only time we really have scheduling issues would be during the holiday season. And then um, we just deal with that, you know, okay. as best we can. All right. And uh, Debbie, how about you? You're, you're pretty, I assume you're mostly a nine to five operation scheduling an issue with you? Correct. We're mostly nine to five. So hours are, and scheduling is really not an issue for us. Okay, great, great. Yeah, hospitals, you know, 24 hour operations are a little bit more challenging. Um, Let's talk to Don and then I'll, we'll wrap up with David um, and uh, Don Smith with, who are you, Hendrick Auto? Is that who you're with, Don? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. I'm Don Smith with Hendrick Automotive Group. I'm Director of Community Relations and I'm the guy to go out and hire the youth apprentices. All right. So how big is your organization? Do you have multiple uh, sites and dealerships and all that, or just one central? How, how big are you and how many apprentices do you take on a year? Well, basically we have nine stores, a body shop and a, and a consolidated business office here in Charleston. And we have 105 stores nationwide. Mm. So why, uh, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but I don't know why, how, and why did you guys get into apprenticeships? It's a, I mean, this is a terrific industry because there's it's always changing. There's new things people need to learn, whether it's sales or finance or body shop or, or mechanical. So tell us a little bit about why you got involved and where do you focus your apprentices on? Okay, basically um, I was a GM of, a, of a, the Volvo store here in town for 20 years. And mm -hmm. I found out that we had to go out and recruit technicians. And basically after a couple of years, I realized we had to grow technicians. So when the youth apprentice program came about, um, we just signed up because we said we got to grow apprentices. So the best way to get them is out of high school and right into the dealerships. So um, before then, um, we was in the high schools doing a lot of volunteer work. So we started talking about the youth apprentice programs to get people interested in being technicians. Because most people thought technicians were a dirty job. They didn't, they'd never been in NASCAR and seen how clean the floors are and the settings are and everything in, in the automobile business going to computer, it's computer driven. So they didn't know that. So we sold that the whole time we was in high schools. Yeah, it is. It is so far different than it was 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, so what, uh, uh, again, it can be a dangerous location, an auto body shop, if you don't know what you're doing, how do you manage risk and liability? And uh, where do you focus your time with the students? Is it on me mechanical work or other sorts of uh, occupations? Well, basically, we make sure we, we, we've had a mistake because when we started it in four years ago, um, I was recruiting everybody I could, could recruit. Anybody wanted to be a technician, 
I said, just sign him up to be a youth apprentice <laughs> technician. So the first year I fell on my face because we're getting 10th and 11th graders that had no clue about it. And then we found out some 10th and 11th graders didn't have driver's license, so they couldn't drive a car. Right. You know, so after, the, after that, falling on my face for a while, um, we kind of focus on serious 11th graders who was serious of being a technician. And I talked to their parents. I recruited them. I recruited their parents and make sure that they wanted to be apprentices. And then I, for 12th graders, when they graduated, I looked for them because they got mm -hmm. driver's license. They don't have to worry about the proms. They didn't have to worry about football games, baseball games, basketball games. They out of school. So we would, we now we recruit mostly um, 12th graders ready to graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, I love hearing uh, uh, good things you've done, but also hear about mistakes that are made because I think that's how a lot of people can learn. And there's a lot of pressure just to throw students uh students into jobs um but my question is a little bit more specific it's not on the list that i have but but i run into this all the time so you have nine stores do you have apprentices at all stores we have just... apprentices in all stores but volvo and volvo get their apprentices from the volvo plant okay you know they, they run their apprentices through the plant so one of the really important things about apprenticeships is that the site location has a supervisor mentor, has somebody who gets it, who can not only supervise the student, make sure things are safe, um, also provide support and encouragement as needed. How do you spread that across nine shops? I mean, that's not the easiest thing to say, okay, everybody, we need to get you all on the same page with this apprenticeship work because you might have somebody who's been around for 40 years says, I don't want to be bothered with some kid or other people who don't quite understand what you're doing or are in the same position. How do you deal with with spreading that culture across all nine all nine sites? We get that a lot. Okay. One thing, every store is looking for technicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a technician shortage like everybody else has a shortage. Another thing that if you live in Somerville or North Charleston or Goose Creek, you work in the North Charleston area because you cannot get to West Ashley from Somerville in the morning to get to work. And I found that out by mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. You live in Mount Pleasant or Johns Island, James Island, West Ashley. Then you work on the Savannah High, Highway stores. So that's how we kind of focus it. But everybody want me, like our Toyota store is right across street from Tech, Trident Tech. Toyota store, they do the best job. Our Toyota store does the best job in, in training youth apprentices. And they want all of them, just like I want all the youth apprentices to come through Trident Tech. But if you can't have it, you got to spread the love to everybody. Okay, great. So, um, uh, and you guys are new car dealers for the most part? Well, we sell, we new car dealers, but we sell new and used cars. New and used. Okay, so there's, there's, there's plenty of work to go around. Okay. Um, uh, so what recommendations would you have, whether it's the automotive industry or anybody on that supply chain or really just any employer, when you start out, what would you tell them to avoid uh, in the first year? And what would you tell them to focus on in the first year? It's probably totally different in restaurants and hospitals and in the, in the automobile business, because like I say, I focus on 12th graders ready to graduate because I know they're serious. And then mm -hmm. I still talk to all the parents, you know, because I got to, I'm, I'm selling everybody because this is a career. You know, if you be a technician, technicians stay with you forever. You know, we've got technicians that have been with Hendrix for 35, 36 years at one manufacturer. So I, I, I sell hard and say, this is a career. You know, you start off, this is what you got to do. You got to go to school. You got to work. While you're in school, you're making money. You're making good money where some of your friends are going to college and they ain't, they still living off mom and dad. You know, I have a lot, you know, we have 35 youth apprentices that we recruited. Um, we have nine youth apprentices that dropped out of the program. But we, out of the nine, we have five that stayed with the dealerships. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of them became ser service writers. I had one guy that's a service writer and he's our number one service writer in town. Mm -hmm. um, then the other... Other four guys are just lube and tech guys. You know, they just change oil, rotate tires. And that's mm -hmm. good because that's what we need. And then a couple, couple of people that we had to fire because they wasn't doing the right thing like any other employee. You know, yeah, just I was going to say that's probably like any other employee, <laughs> you know, and they say, you know, the danger is somebody says, oh, my apprentice, I had to fire an apprentice. I'm done with them. Well, you do that with your other employees too. Exactly. Right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, Don Smith with Kendrick Auto, thanks so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to move. I say the best till last, David Brown. Sorry uh, to make you wait, but I'm really interested to hear about uh, Keon Tech and a little bit about your apprenticeship programs. Tell me about your company, if you could. Well, thanks for uh, setting a high expectation. I hope I don't <laughs> let you down, Eric. Thanks for hosting this, too. This is a good discussion. So, um, so I'm with Keon North America. We're part of the Keon Group. Uh, which is a company that's headquartered in Germany, um, worldwide about 38,000 employees. Um, we're the second largest company in the world manufacturing um, material handling equipment. So you think forklifts, pallet jacks, reach trucks, is, and we also have a very large business in what we call supply chain solutions, which is automation sorting. So basically we do everything that could if you think about like an Amazon warehouse, which everybody's ordering from these days, we can supply all the hardware, software, and uh, equipment to make that building run. So that's what our company does. And in, in, in Somerville, which is a, a suburb of Charleston, is our North American headquarters. Um, we've got about 300 employees in North America right now, probably going to be 500 within the next year and a half to two years. And um, how did you get engaged uh, with apprenticeship? Did it? Uh, you know, well, yeah. you know, Eric, I've been in the company for five years um, and I came from another very large uh, German manufacturing company that had an adult apprenticeship program mm -hmm. or a regular sort of true apprenticeship program, not a youth apprenticeship program. Um, where we grew our own folks to become um, mechatronics technicians, um, mechanics, electricians, et cetera. So I was familiar with the concept mm -hmm. from that experience. And then, um, and, and also that company that I was previously with had a very tight relationship with Trident Tech. So shout out to Mitch and Rob Wiggins and those guys over there. Um, so when I came to Keon in 2016, um, I saw the opportunity not only to tap into the youth apprenticeship program from a um, labor supply standpoint, but just as much as a community outreach program. Um, so I view it as sort of, it's, it's two, two ways. Number one, it helps the company, but number two, it's, it's helping to support education in the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we started back in, um, I think late 17. So we've had about four years worth of experience. We've had some ups, some downs, um, but overall it's been a very good experience for us. Mm -hmm. And the, um, and uh, let's see here, Don, I know you have a meeting coming up. So when you do have to go, just sign off. Thank you very much for your time. So, um, so David, what, what are you focusing? How many do you take a year and what are you focusing them on? We usually take maybe two, Mm -hmm. a year. Um, we're not a huge company. So, um, and most of those folks work in our manufacturing processes. We do have one gentleman who I think was on the previous panel um, uh, who came in with a clear desire to go to four-year uh, ME type degree. So we got him on board and he has completed his apprenticeship and will begin um, finishing his last two years for a mechanical engineering degree at the Citadel here in South Carolina um, beginning next year. So he'll end up hopefully becoming one of our star mechanical engineers that supports our manufacturing uh, operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in manufacturing, any liability issues for you guys or do you just manage it away from hazardous work? We do a, well, first of all, you have to be 18 to operate a forklift. Mm -hmm. okay. We make forklifts, so that's kind of a dichotomy <laughs> for us. Um, so we also, like I think Don or someone else mentioned, we try to steer more towards the folks that are seniors or even postgrads, maybe just graduating from high school, so mm -hmm. they may already be 18. Um, but we appreciate Trident Tech providing the liability insurance for us. Mm -hmm. um, we have had one case of a youth apprentice that engaged in some, let's say, I guess you could call it horseplay, which mm -hmm. ended up costing him his job because mm -hmm. it was a, a safety incident. Mm -hmm. um, 
those things happen, you know, and it could be a great year old kid doing it, or it could be a 38 year old person doing it. That's right. 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 Really important lessons in the reality of the workplace, I might add, which is the other byproduct of apprenticeship, right? It's not just to figure out the skills in the occupation, but how to get to work on time, how to get along with people and how not to horseplay. Um, Absolutely. So do you have any trouble with your apprentices getting to the jobs or transportation issues? We got a lot of questions about that. Um, or do they make it okay? No, we always, uh, no, they all make it. Um, you know, obviously we have attendance standards that are in place. And, and one thing that Trident Tech does, which I would commend to other parts of the country, is they have, last year did not have, but in typical years, they have like a recruiting um, event on a weekend in February where there's like a, a, a job fair almost. So and the students attend with their parents. And at that point, they get to go around and see different companies and meet with reps from the companies. And we get to talk not just with the students, but with the parents to find out, you know, mm -hmm. is this student going to be able to make it? Are they reliable? Can they get, do they have transportation, et cetera? So um, to me, that's one of the greatest value adds that Trident uh, gives us here in Charleston. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, um, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute or two. I don't know. They're probably going to give me the hook. Yep. I got to wrap it up. Um, but real quick, um, if I could, uh, David, um, did you uh, have to sell it up the chain to your leadership or are you the leadership who had to sell it down the chain to the on-site supervisors, online supervisors? Uh, did not have to sell it whatsoever um, because the people that I partner with that are my peers had also worked in other companies that had engaged with apprenticeship. So, um, and, and our company has a lot of new leaders in it, a new meaning relatively short mm -hmm. in the company. So we all saw this as a great opportunity to try to mimic some things that we'd seen from our previous lives. So it was great. That is great. That is great. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of foreign companies, Switzerland, Germany, et cetera, who are familiar with apprenticeship. So it's not a big of a leap with those companies as well. I'm going to have to sign off, but Debbie, I got one quick question for you. Cause I think it's a good one. When you, um, uh, hold on, David, I, I'll get back. But Debbie, did you get, um, when you had to talk to an international cyber audience, were they saying youth apprenticeships? Are you nuts? Uh, did you get any of that or were they fairly well accepting of it? Surprisingly, they were very well accepting of it. Okay. Um, there was a lot of questions coming from um, other employers concerning that. And yeah, they were very receptive of it. That's great. That's great. So I guess security clearances will become a very important thing for their future and they better watch what they do so they don't blow their security clearance. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, David, I, you know, I just wanted to talk about, you know, the, you know, college, college, college is the call we all get. You gave a great example of a young man who came to the apprenticeship program, then went on to be a mechanical engineer is trying to become one. Do you feel that any of the students feel like they're less than college material or do they, do you think they're getting, they feel they're getting an advantage uh, uh, over college? Um, do they see it as a second rate program? Do you think, or they see it as a top rate program? No, absolutely. I don't think people see it. I think the people that are interested in working in a company like mine are realizing that, um, you know, you go to Trident Tech for free or nearly free, paid for, um, and then you finish your apprenticeship. And if you want to hang on, you can make a very, very nice income at a young age and have zero college debt. And I think that's a real calling card for folks these days. Uh, I would agree with that. And I'm going to get the hook. I probably should have hooked off about two minutes, two, three minutes ago, but uh, I, I want to thank you all for joining me. Um, uh, Debbie with cyber um, uh, Don with HMGI Charleston. Uh, who else? Everybody else. Don Smith with Hendrick, David Brown with Keon. I'm sure I forgot Rowana with HCA healthcare. Anyway, thank you all. You guys got an incredible employee employer culture down in the Charleston region. I know in a large measure, that's to the foundation that our friends at Trident has laid and some of the key partners they have, including employers. So I wanna thank you for your time. I do this nationally. And I have to tell you, I'm always so impressed with the folks in South Carolina and Charleston. 
with that, I'll sign off. Thank you. Sorry I ran over. And uh, let's continue on to the next session. Take care. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shelton Dahl. I'm a program associate with the PIA team at the Center on Education and Labor at New America. Um, many thanks to our amazing employer panelists for sharing their experiences and insights with us and to our moderator, Eric Selmsnow. Um, join us at 2.35 Eastern time for our next panel, Creating Seamless Credentials and Careers, Aligning K-12 through and Higher Education Systems Through Youth Apprenticeship, moderated by Mimi Lufkin from the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. I'm Mimi Lufkin, CEO America at the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and I have the great pleasure of getting to facilitate or moderate today's panel. Um, and I'm mostly interested in hearing from the panelists myself, so it's my intention here to get on to the, the Q&A part of this as quickly as possible. Um, but before we begin, what I'd like to do is to go ahead and have each of our panelists introduce themselves, if they would, where they are from, the role they play um, in the, um, the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program, and maybe they could tell us one thing in one sentence that you love the most about the youth apprenticeship work that you're doing. All right, so I'm going to start with Sonia. Why don't we start with you? Good afternoon. I'm Sonia Addison Stewart, and I'm the Career and Technical Education Director for Berkeley County School District. And I work with the apprenticeship program um, as far as encouraging students to participate and also, um, you know, creating a seamless pathway between our programs and opportunities that the students have in the youth apprenticeship program. Um, and you said one thing I love about the apprenticeship program? One thing I love about it is that, you know, I was on a panel earlier and I've seen the panels of um, the students that participate in the apprenticeship program. It's just the growth and development that I see in these students, um, how they have just grasped the skills that our employers are desperately saying um, that they need to see. And so to see these students actually practicing and practicing effective communication and understanding those work and life skills is gratifying to me. Thank you, Sonia. Mark, how about you? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Blacklock. I work for Dorchester School District 2. I'm the Career and Technology Coordinator. Um, and like Ms. Um, Stewart, I work with recruiting kids for um, the uh, Youth Apprenticeship Program. And I think the biggest thing for me is just the um, Quite honestly, the surprise that a lot of kids have of how great the program is, you know, even their parents and the opportunity they're provided. Um, and then as it transitions into the program, um, just all the different skill sets that they learn, soft skills, technical skills, um, and how prepared they are once they complete the program uh, for direct employment, um, along with all the, uh, you know, benefits of, you know, getting potentially some college paid for and some you know, work experience and different things. I, I think overall, it's just a great opportunity. And um, yeah, I, I just enjoy working with it and the students. Great, thanks, Mark. We'll jump to Robert next. Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Elliott, and I'm the Dean of Manufacturing and Maintenance at Trident Technical College. Um, within my division, uh, as far as apprenticeships are concerned, I have industrial mechanics, uh, air conditioning refrigeration, welding, automotive technology, and machine tool technology. So a good number of apprenticeships within my division. And uh, one, I would say one thing that I really enjoy about um, just being involved in this program is um, just providing that exposure and opportunity to students that wouldn't, un wouldn't uh, ordinarily have this opportunity. Um, a lot of students aren't four-year college bound, and to be able to give these students these skills to go into the workforce, I think it's a great, uh, it's an awesome program. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Let's jump to Richard. Good afternoon. I'm Rich Borden, Executive Director of CTE with Charleston County School District. Um, 
you know, they stole my thunder a little bit. I love all those things about the apprenticeship opportunities we give our kids and watching them succeed. I think my favorite part about apprenticeships is the recognition ceremony at the end of the year. When you see the students go up on the stage, their families are there, their business partners are there, Trident Technical College is there, and it really feels like um, like a family event and we're all part of the same team to see young adults succeed and whatever that looks like. Um, you know, many of these students go into the workforce, but many go to the two-year schools, technical schools, and, and, and some go to four-year schools as well. So there are multiple exit ramps on this highway. Um, but by far, I mean, that recognition award ceremony is, is fantastic. And that's my favorite thing about the apprenticeship program. Great, thanks, Richard. And Tricia. Yeah, hi, I'm Trish Wieg. I'm the Director of School Counseling at Cane Bay High School. Um, and so you guys took everything I was gonna say, but um, my favorite part truly is seeing the excitement on the kids' faces and the parents' faces, um, especially when they come in in the summer and they know they're now gonna be a youth apprentice and working on that schedule and, and just talking about you know their career goal and how it's gonna match and, and just seeing that piece of it. That's, that's probably the most exciting part. Great, thanks, Tricia. Mm -hmm. Well, what I love the best is the fact that that all of you um, talked about the fact that it's really about the transformation that happens for your students, and that's um, the focus of your efforts. And and I I know that today's presentation or the the panel title for today is creating seamless pathways to credentials and careers, aligning K twelve and higher education systems through youth apprenticeship. Um, so I have some questions I want to talk to you about um, a variety of groups of people who are impacted by this work and how, um, how you play a role in either a leadership role in that or a facilitator of those, of those relationships um, and the impact that that work has on your own institution um, and also, you know, whether it's students, parents, faculty, um, even systems within your institution. So I'm going to start, uh, Robert, with you first. Um, I like to think about the Youth Apprenticeship Program as though it's a three-legged stool and that there are, there are three partners in this work. Um, certainly the high school districts that you work with, um, Pride and Tech is, a very, is, is really you know, the center of that uh, three-legged stool and, of course, the employers that you're um, working with um, as well. Um, what I want to know is how do you balance and manage the relationships between your high school partners, your employer partners, and how has this work been a benefit to the college and what challenges has it brought? And how have you overcome those challenges? So that's about three or four questions um, all loaded in there, but I'm hoping that you can uh, think about that holistically and, uh, and approach this, um, the answers to some of those as we go along. Okay. Uh, well, first, I it begins with uh, effective communication. Um, what effect, effective co communication between the districts, the college, and the employers, you know, this program wouldn't be, it would not have been as, as a success as it is. Um, from, an, from an educator point of view, um, basically the two supporting offices that's, that, that basically uh, I report to, um, they assist us from the uh, school district side and then from the employer side. So we go, they're like the, the hub in the wheel for, for us. Um, any questions I may have or any communication from the industry um, comes through the office of school, uh, through the office of um, apprenticeships and business partnerships for industry. And then for the districts is for the school and community initiatives office. So as the educator side, you know, they communicate a lot with us about what the needs are as far as industry and as well as the districts. And that's, that's the balance, um, I think, that works um, between everyone, you know, that effective communication. And you said three-legged stool and um, uh, critical to success. Um, yeah, so what are some of the challenges that, that you've experienced and, and how, you know, how have you overcome those? Well, 
um, some of the challenges in the beginning was scheduling, um, trying to schedule the students' uh, high school schedules along with the college schedules. Um, but that has since been ironed out and, and, and pretty much flows very smoothly um, right now. Um, in the beginning, that's where it was. But other than that, there's really, it, it's not much of a challenge out there for any student um, looking to get into this program. And you spoke about uh, benefits. Um, I think the greatest benefit um, is that the college has the opportunity to work closer with the school districts and industry partners. All, all of us are working closely together to benefit these students, um, to impact our community. Um, I feel before the apprenticeship program, there was a little disconnect between, I think, the technical studies and some of the school districts. Um, the technical side, we already had a relationship with our industry partners, but didn't really have that strong partnership with the uh, schools, the school districts. And now that we started the apprenticeship, it's like we're, we're all basically communicating together, um, coming up with new initiatives, uh, new programs um, to get these students out there, um, getting them exposed to, to uh, different uh, career sets that, that are available to them. And you said overcome challenges. That was the last yep. one, I believe. Yep. Um, basically, I said it was, it was just um, scheduling. And I think we have that pretty much uh, down now. So now it's just the program just runs pretty much seamlessly and smoothly. That's great. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, Richard, I'm going to jump to you uh, next. I, I, want, I want to sort of play off of something that Robert mentioned, which was how um, the startup of this um, the youth apprenticeship work has impacted, it sounds like it's impacted college in terms of growing new programs and new initiatives and sort of the, the spin-offs that have occurred from that work. I'm curious how becoming a partner in, um, in the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program has impacted even systems in your um, district or program as well. And um, has the experience of doing this work caused you to look differently at the way you operate other CTE programs um, in the district? What, what's sort of been the spillover of the, this effort? Well, it has significantly impacted the systems. Um, I think regionally and, and specifically also in Charleston County School District as well. Um, as you can imagine, the youth apprenticeship model or that program is you can say the pinnacle of what work-based learning experiences can be. Um, you know, if you look at the continuum of, of career awareness, when the kids start in elementary school, uh, maybe they have guest speakers or a job shadowing event, uh, maybe some career fairs, even elementary into middle school, summer career camps is, uh, is popular, where kids get from career awareness to exploration. And then finally in high school, we look at career preparation. They're taking CTE classes. There are some clinical experiences, internships, whether they're during the school or summer, or of course, uh, apprenticeships like the youth apprenticeship model that we have. Um, it really gave us a, a mindset as to, we're gonna begin this whole process with the end in mind. So if we wanted a, a student to participate in a youth apprenticeship, what does that look like as the child articulates from kindergarten all the way through high school and even articulate to um, technical school as well? Um, and to do that, we had to provide access and opportunity. And I'll go back to that um, as many times as I can. And I know Robert talked a little bit about that, is do all the students have access to these high impact career clusters across all of the, uh, you know, not just manufacturing, um, but health science and STEM, uh, you know, and, and transportation and logistics. And there's many more, um, you know, but it starts with can kids access those opportunities and do they have that opportunity to take that coursework and to participate? So it really had us rethink or just actually look in the mirror and say, what are we doing and how can we do it differently and more effectively? Then when we noticed that we can do it better, then we, put, we implemented a whole bunch of um, changes in the district um, that I believe are better for, you know, for the betterment of students, for their families and for the community, um, like our career centers. Um, like uh, CTE completer programs. 
certification programs that align with those apprenticeships. So it really changed a lot about what career readiness, college readiness, or like I just like to say, future readiness looks like for all of our students. Because um, all of our students have a future, whether they go college or career, uh, you know, they're all going to get to that point of, I got to get a job, I have to um, earn a living, you know, so how do we get that to that point and whatever that looks like. So that really helped us change not just these high impact clusters, but all of our career clusters uh, throughout Charleston County School District. Sounds like it's um, been more than just a spillover. It sounds like it's really shifted and changed the way that you're looking at career and technical education and the and career development. For you to be talking about work with you know kindergarten K through 20, um, it, you know that's that's a different mindset about how these kinds of programs can have that impact. Um, I'm going to jump next to Sonia and ask Sonia. Um, how have these programs impacted your, your students? Um, what are the benefits that students um, experience and, and how also have, have those benefits affected their families? Have you seen things like improved academic performance, persistence, graduation, transition to post-secondary education, employment, wage earnings, Anything on that spectrum? How you know we talked? We've talked a little bit about the partnership impact. We've talked about how this work has impacted systems. In your perspective, Sonia, how how is this work impacting your your students? I think the youth apprenticeship program is impacting our students because, as Rich said, it's giving them access to opportunities um, that are in high demand. Many times, students may have an interest in, you know, just don't have the, the knowledge or the way to get there. But giving them information about a youth apprenticeship program where they could start in high school, where they still have a strong support system there to help guide them through that, would help lead them to that particular um, lifelong goal that they may have. I think for our students that participate in the apprenticeship program, definitely a seamless transition. They have so much support within the youth apprenticeship program. Um, everyone that works in that program really supports students. And, and that is key for students um, to continue on. And the students that typically don't have access to certain programs um, or may not participate in certain programs is because they don't have that support. And I think in the youth apprenticeship program, they do have that. So they've gained that, they've gained access to careers. And we also find out that the skills, again, I spoke about this earlier, the skills that the students develop that are youth apprenticeship, that are youth apprentices are phenomenal. You know, when you hear them speak, when you hear them speak about their growth in regards to like managing their time, these are skills some adults don't really have um, at this particular time. You know, learning how to communicate, working with um, others as a team. Those are skills that are so very much needed in our students today. And the youth apprenticeship program definitely helps um, our students to develop those skills. So I think and all of these things lead to lifelong success to the, in their future goals. So it really helps to build the foundation um, for our students to help propel them to where they need to be. I think I want to become a youth apprentice. Sounds like sounds like a great thing for anybody. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to Mark. You know, we looked at this from a systemic perspective, and now um, Sonia's comments about student impact. Um, Mark, can you tell me a little bit about how um, being involved in the youth apprenticeship work has impacted your relationships with employers and how have employers affected the quality of your CTE programs? Do they have a, you know, the back and forth about the input in relationship to improving um, CTE programs um, at your district? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, at, have employers been involved at all in um, developing educator skills, um, learning more about the industry, any kind of professional development opportunities? And of course, how do employers engage with students and support students to ensure their success? So if you think about this in terms of, of the employers you engage with, what do you think happened or how has this impacted them? Sure. Um, I think 
you know, from the onset, it strengthened our, our partnerships with our local businesses and industries, um, no doubt. Uh, you, you have these partnerships that you've already developed um, district-wide, school-wide, you know, throughout the region. And, you know, when those folks are able to come in, albeit not so much recently due to, you know, our, our, our pandemic situation, but even through a virtual platform and stuff and really start engaging our students early on. Mr. Gordon hit on it perfectly when he mentioned, you know, the K through 12 kind of initiative that we have. Um, you know, you have your, your elementary your students really just becoming aware, your middle school students um, really trying to explore. And then at the high school level, when, when we implement these, um, these different programs to work-based learning, especially the youth apprenticeship program, that's, you know, you, you're hoping that you've got a, a, a student that's been exposed and, and been interested in a particular pathway for their entire educational career. And if you've got these business partners that's been around and they've had students that have come through the program, they've learned just as much as we have as far as, you know, how to tweak certain things and, you know, how to develop, uh, the, the, you know, the way that they interact with the students. But, um, you know, it's just really exciting to see that kind of grow. And, you know, you mentioned as far as, you know, professional development, not necessarily on a technical kind of official global effort, but you do see teachers and programs reaching out to those partners, that, especially ones that are new, that have come in and, and maybe weren't, you know, a, a business partner that we had, um, you know, for a longstanding relationship, but a new partner that joined um, because they had, you know, they were interested in becoming a um, uh, part of the part of the apprenticeship program and working with our teachers to, to help kind of um, cultivate and, and fine tune some of the, the skill sets that we teach in our in our courses. Of course, we have our state standards that we're going to hit and that we're going to you know model our cor course after. But especially when you talk about regional needs and and things that employers are looking for in our region, that's potentially different all across the country. And so when they can come into our classrooms and, and really um, have a good dialogue and communicate with our teachers about what they're looking for when the students get to, um, you know, graduate or, or get involved in, in the youth apprenticeship program or any type of work-based learning, um, that's really powerful because now we're, we've really tapped into what industry needs and we're trying our, our best to be able to implement that in our classroom. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the, the employers kind of reinforcing student success, I think, um, you know, like Mr. Elliott said at the beginning, that, that communication is key from the beginning. If we can have clear communication and expectations um, all the way through the program, now we've, we've at least created that dialogue that if, if a student does start to struggle or has challenges, you know, we have a comfortable dialogue with, with our partner to be able to discuss that um, and vice versa. And, you know, you have great mentorships that kind of come out of this too. If a student isn't necessarily involved in an apprenticeship, you know, you can have these business partners become mentors for other students in our buildings. You know, it just, it opens up really, again, going back to what Mr. Gordon said, just that plethora of work-based learning that we always try to provide all students, no matter what their circumstance, no matter what the, um, uh, career pathway is, there's something out there for every student at, quite honestly, at every grade level. And, you know, when, when you just have that open line of communication and you're building those relationships, you're supporting your students, you know, the great things can happen out of that. And we've just been very grateful and, and I guess to some degree, very lucky and, and, you know, that we've got such great partners and, and great students in the program. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a give and take, but you know, in the end, we just want our students to have the best opportunity possible, and uh, we've just been, we, I feel like we've been very successful with that. That's great. I'm sure there's, um, it, you know, the the benefits of this work is probably as much for um, you all and your students, and the employers benefit from it as well. I I would imagine. And Mark, you can tell me if I'm accurate about this, but that um, having uh, youth apprentices in some of these companies and, and businesses has changed the workplace, has changed the, um, the relationships that employers are having with pe young people. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, as a quick follow-up, was there ever any pushback from the beginning when the program first started um, 
from employers about, I don't want these people in my, you know, just sort of, eh. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, there's, again, setting aside the, the whole pandemic and the, and the, you know, yeah. the obvious concern there, I think a lot of it had to do with, um, you know, when you, when students are going through the process and getting interviewed by our counselors and starting the whole process, soft skills has always come up in every conversation we've ever had with, with industry and business partners. You know, are you guys teaching soft skills? Do you have a curriculum for that? And yes, we do. In Dorchester County, we use a, um, an online platform, Microburst, to, uh, to help uh, with some of our soft skills training. Um, and that's been very effective. But again, it's one of those things where you really need to be able to put it into action. And so when you get on the job and when you're in these programs, that the, the technical skills they're going to teach our, our students and some our students know a lot of the technical skills, but they're going to be able to hone those skills on the job. It's those soft skills that we are constantly trying to, to push, trying to emphasize. Um, and so I think that's the, the piece that was, that was always, you know, across all pathways and clusters and, and industries, you know, everybody wanted to, um, in, you know, get the, the, uh, the assurance that we were going through that with our students before they were going out there. And, and yes, I mean, we have that in place. Again, we, we've had great students that have participated in the program. And I think they've really shown that, you know, what we're doing um, on our side at our level is, is everything we can to help prepare them to be successful when they get on the job. And, and I know that our, our business partners really appreciate that. You know, like Ms. Uh, Stewart said, hey, showing up to work on time, that's a skill set. And being able to manage your time that, you know, as adults, we haven't quite mastered. So to have a student who's at least aware of that and, and can really put in those, um, you know, those positive habits and those good habits that, you know, that, that, that's the first step. Once we can get, you know, to work on time and, and we're, we're, we're behaving on the job the way we should, you know, that's when the learning and the experience can really, can really start and kind of, kind of blossom. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That's thanks for that, Mark. Um, Tricia, I I want to have you tell us a little bit about um, how being involved in the youth apprenticeship work has changed the way you market and recruit students into this program. Um, as a as a counselor and a person who works with counselors across the region, um, I'm wondering whether or not the strategies you've employed to engage students in this work. Um, have changed over time or that you're learning new ways to do things. Um, you have some advice for those who are listening today about how, how to do this. And I'm also curious about um, the issue of parent, parent and student bias about what it means to be in an apprenticeship. And um, frequently many of these manufacturing programs, you know, many of the trade programs have um, you know, an image of that needs to be uh, addressed so that people understand how high tech these fields really are now. And they're not, they're not your grandfather's shop program, right? right. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll start, I was gonna say, I'll start with that last one first. Um, yeah, it is, it's, it was, I should say was in the beginning, a, a very hard sell to some parents. Um, because they do see it as back in the, you know, in the day when grandpa worked at a factory or, and so they, they had that picture of what a youth apprentice was. Um, but I think we're fortunate in that we do individual graduation plans and like all the districts have been talking about this seamless transition from elementary, middle to high, um, working with our kids, helping them identify, you know, what they're what their skill sets are and helping them identify potential careers. And then when they hit the high schools and, and are here with us as counselors, um, we get that individual time with them to be able to talk about their, you know, what their career goals are, have their parents in, um, discuss the youth apprentice programs. And so they, those came about at a perfect time as we were kind of revamping and going back into those, you know, looking at those trades. Um, so it's easy to me as a counselor 
to work that into our conversations. And as long as we can show the parent the connection between what their child wants to do and you know happiness in the future and their career goals and how it's right down the street and they're going to have you know a, a job with an employer in the local community. They're going to get some of those skills that they need um, even before leaving high school. Um, in the beginning, it was a hard sell, but now we have parents that just come in and that's all they want to talk about. They want to see how the youth apprentice program can be connected to their child's goal. Um, so, you know, I think, um, and Sonia was in the beginnings of this when we first started them in Berkeley County. Um, and so we really focused hard on training all the school counselors, not just high school. We reached down to middle schools, making sure they understood what they are. Um, so we can take our personal biases out of it. You know, we can take our personal opinion out of it and actually speak about youth apprentice programs um, from the benefits of the student. Um, and so the counselors all receive training every year. Um, we make sure that's part of our, our IGP process. Um, and what we talk about. And then we, you know, Trident Tech does a great job educating our parents. Um, they do yearly meetings with our parents. We push that information out. We have parents calling in August to know when is, you know, when is the youth apprentice meeting? Um, so we can go down to Trident and, and visit with the employers and hear more about the programs directly from Trident. So do you, would you say that over time, the strategies that you've used to do outreach to youth, youth in, in this program, have, have you used some sort of non-traditional um, resources to get to, to students in, who are in communities that, um, that may not necessarily have access to this, this effort or may not be as well informed? Do you find that a challenge? Um, yeah, and well, I, yeah, I, I kind of open that to everybody. If anybody else, yeah. Patricia can address this first, but maybe everyone else can think about this a little bit. Yeah, I, we find it a challenge. I know in Berkeley County, we're such a large county and some of our high schools are so far from Trident Tech and transportation's an issue. But, you know, we've been working through all of those issues and all those concerns to try to help, you know, get those students there. Um, so I think just, you know, I think we've done, we, we've just, honed in on the conversations with our parents um, and actually making our IGP meetings purposeful, um, more so, and those are our individual graduation plan meetings than just checking a box with a parent. Um, so we make sure we have enough time, especially with 10th graders, um, because that's the year we're really talking about them, really recruiting and trying to get them in AccuPlacer and all the testing that required, you know, that's required for it and laying out their coursework. Um, so if, if, you know, the biggest challenge I know in Berkeley County we've had is the transportation issue. Um, if we can jump that hurdle, then, then, you know, we do so much better with some of those kids. So can anyone in the group um, give some examples of ways in which you have jumped that hurdle? Are there some um, avenues that you've used to try to provide, whether it's transportation or other barriers that students might face to accessing the program, how you um, address those? I, I would say in regards to, to transportation, I think um, when the apprenticeship allowed students that um, were graduating to participate, opened up doors for more students that live out in the rural areas to participate. Um, my son is a youth apprentice. We live you know, in a rural area, St. Stephen, which is, is a good little ways away and understanding that he would need to do high school and travel to Trident even though he had transportation, it would have been a bit of a challenge. So we knew that if he had this opportunity, you know, when he graduated, it probably would be a little bit easier um, for him. Also with the program and them reaching out to find employers even closer to some of our areas has been very beneficial. Um, so students may not have to travel as far to work if they live out in a rural area. So that has been really beneficial, trying to hone in on some additional employers that are closer to where those students live who are out in the rural areas. Anyone think, want to add to that, Richard? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think number one, the messaging and getting the word out is still our number one obstacle. We have hundreds of school counselors 
throughout Charleston County School District. And one of the panelists just mentioned about the IGP process. All IGPs are not created equal. Some counselors are very CTE forward. Here are CTE courses, career readiness, internship, apprenticeship. They roll with it. They drink the Kool-Aid. And what we need to do is to take that and bottle that and mimic that so that all six, well, about tens of thousands of CCSD students get a similar experience, similar messaging. I understand that it's not the only thing that has to be put out during an IGP conference. I understand that. I've been in them as a parent and also as an educator at the school level. But like I said previously or earlier in this panel, every child has a future and a career, we hope. Unless, of course, they're independently wealthy and maybe they don't have to work. Um, but for most of us, we have a career, whatever that means. And, and it's hard to argue against an apprenticeship. It really gives the, the kid a competitive advantage. Can you imagine on your resume, uh, you know, a, a two-year apprenticeship with Boeing or Bosch or NYWIC, Mercedes-Benz? I mean, and a recommendation from one of the supervisors at the, at the uh, corporation. I mean, these, I mean that, that is worldwide. And, and it just opens up so many doors and puts them at an advantage compared to others. Um, and so, again, it's that perception and getting that messaging out continues to be our two biggest obstacles in Charleston County. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we talk about access, you mentioned this earlier, Richard, this notion of, um, you know, making sure that all students have access to programs. And it's, it's more than it's more than anyone can enroll or you know, you open the doors and say, y'all come, right? A lot of people can't even get to the threshold. And so part of your, part of the responsibility here in, in terms of really looking at equity in these programs is how is it that I reach into my community in order to be able to bring students, you know, into this in whatever way it might be, whether it's addressing this from a cultural perspective, an image perspective, um, you know, a financial perspective, um, you know, trying to break down all those barriers so that that students um, can have access. Mark, you un you unmuted. You wanted to to add in, jump in here, please do. Well, yeah, I, our big initiative this year, and I'm, you know, our our district is is smaller uh, than Charleston in, in Berkeley County, um, and but it doesn't mean that we offer anything less. So you know, we we don't have quite the student enrollment, but we still have and are proud of all of our programs. And, and, you know, we'd like to think that, you know, no matter where a student is in the, in the region, they're gonna get the same opportunities. That being said, um, yeah, I was gonna say the same thing as Mr. Gordon, you know, getting the word out. Um, our, our initiative this year has been to really have CTE and our counseling department communicate more than they've ever had before. Um, we, we've had some transition in our district and so, we, we felt like this was a great time to kind of, you know, invigorate and reinforce that relationship between CTE and our counseling department. And so we've made, you know, uh, we've got several meetings on the books to be able to go out and meet with counselors at our middle school and high school levels, um, especially to really try to get our counselors excited, but really just get them as much information as possible, because that is a extremely difficult job to have, I guess, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of an IGP meeting, and you're trying to not only get a student to graduate and take care of all the requirements they need, you know, just to be successful in the school, but also try to plan out, you know, the potentially the next 40 years of their life through a career, 40, 50 years. And so, you know, I, my appreciation for the counselors is, is extremely high. And I just, I felt like it was really a good opportunity for us while we look at all these opportunities, especially one like the youth apprenticeships that's so involved and requires, you know, a, a real commitment from the family to be able to explain that as best we could in that IGP. Because while I would love to be in all of them to push CTE, that's not possible. And especially for our neighboring counties with all the students they have, you know, we, we all face that same challenge. But I think that's important to really, um, you know, take care of it on our side as far as getting information to our folks, including our, our teachers, I mean, counselors, but our teachers as well, you know, they need to be as informed as they can, especially in their particular area, 
uh, and pathway um, and have conversations with their um, business partners in their pathway. You know, reach out, talk, talk to them. If, if, if you don't have a, a, a business partner that, you know, is as engaged as you feel, you know, as a teacher, go out there and, and start those, those conversations. And that's what we're here for is to really help with those and, and to be able to, um, you know, answer any questions that they may have from that side as well. Robert, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, and, and maybe your, you know, all your secondary partners here can address this um, as well, is the challenges around articulation um, across systems. Um, you know, I have to, I'm, I'm looking back again at the title of today's panel, and I want to make sure that we at least address this question um, somewhere in this conversation which I think we are in many ways, but this notion of alignment between all of the systems in order to, um, one, make sure that students have a seamless path through the program to employment. And you all have done some, what I consider to be some pretty amazing and creative things in order to make that happen. Um, Robert, you know, maybe you can talk a bit about from the, from the college's perspective, what's that, what, what does that look like? How, how has that been for you? And, and, maybe some advice to folks about how to make that happen. Well, um, in partnership with the three uh, school districts, local school districts, um, we developed a uh, workforce pathway from basically the high schools to the technical college. Um, we came up with um, uh, a advanced placement agreement. So students who took welding or machine tool um, at the high school will receive advanced placement into our programs at, at Trident Technical College. Even if they're not, you know, they don't have to be in the apprenticeship, just taking, completing the welding and the machine tool uh, programs at the high school level, they transition right into the college and an advanced placement. And basically they'll, they, they can knock off almost maybe a semester worth of, uh, of coursework. What we did is we aligned, we got with the instructors at the local school districts and uh, exam, both of us compared our course level outcomes and the competencies needed for those students and aligned basically our curriculum to, to meet those competencies. And once we did that, um, we figured out, okay, well, we can award credit for these particular classes once they take and complete their program. And I assume, and you all can validate this, that, that that is a great incentive for students to participate in this, in the apprenticeship program. Um, do they see it that way? Anybody want to jump have on to, that one? You have to, Richard? sometimes you have to jump up and down and do tricks to show them that, that you can get high school credit, you can get college credit, you can get paid in certain situations. Um, right. You know, so there are those extrinsic motivational factors that um, that, that that hook some of them. Um, for us, most of the um, the interest comes from they self-identify with a career cluster. Um, you know, when I, I always wanted to be an engineer, I always wanted to work in the culinary field. Um, you know, I always wanted to be a nurse. Uh, you know, and and. And like we talked about starting at an early age, you know, when they first learn about occupations, maybe they thought their teacher was the only job that there was on planet earth because that's who they saw every day. Or, you know, yes. maybe what their mom or dad did, or perhaps they know fireman and policeman, you know, because of the uniforms. So at early ages, they're learning those, those, um, the, the career awareness. That's what we call that. Um, but for us, it's mostly, yes, they, that is a hook, but they, they have to kind of, it's in the heart that really gets them to, and their parents too. It's, it has, their parents have to believe it. Uh, you have to hit their heart before you can hit their mind. So if you can convince the parents and the kids, um, it goes from there. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I was gonna follow up with you. Um, it's selling it to the parents. I, I know we as counselors, that's been, um, that's been the, probably one of the bigger hurdles was just helping those parents understand that um, because your child's choosing to go through a youth apprentice doesn't mean that later on in life they may not change path and go somewhere else. But getting the parents, um, if we can get the parents to believe in it, then, um, you know, it's, it's an easy sell to me, or at least in this school, to our kids. 
Um, it's usually the parent that gets the, you know, that has more questions and a little hesitant and, well, they were going to go to Clemson or they were going to go to, you know, and so it's that cell, it's that cell to the parents. That's the hardest. Yeah. And you can still go to Clemson or USC or, Virginia right. Tech or Georgia Tech, even with an apprenticeship. In fact, right. I would argue right. it makes your application a stronger application when you have those experiences. I agree. So are any of you doing anything in particular to encourage um, non-traditional students to access the youth apprenticeship programs? Like for example, um, young men in your healthcare programs or women in your advanced tech tech programs or the manufacturing areas? I mean, I've visited churches. Um, I go to career day uh, events before prior to COVID, <laughs> but um, just trying to get the word out, you know, um, and believe it or not, some parents and kids still aren't aware of it, um, but just trying to get that word out. Like say, I say, I, I, I sing the praises all the time of the program. Yeah. Do any of you use, and maybe that's not the right term I should use, um, have your students um, represent the program in, you know, whether it's your high school students go down in the elementary school and, and visit with, with other kids and talk about what they're doing or show them what they're doing? Do you do you use the students who are in the program to represent and, and promote the programs as well? We, we typically have students that will serve on panels or do different activities. Mm -hmm. We'll bring in students that are going straight through the CTE programs. We'll bring in students that are doing apprenticeship programs. And to really to speak to younger students, they participate in career fairs or career days at the middle school because we found that you know, the younger students really look up to the students that are in high school um, and listen to what they're saying. So we have used students yeah. in those capacities. Yeah, you know, student voice is an incredibly powerful thing. Um, you know, peer to peer um, guidance counseling almost uh, can have big effects. Well, we're, we're getting close to the end here. And so what I'd like to do, we have about three minutes left, is for each of you to um, like we did at the start, I asked you to tell me one thing you loved about the youth apprenticeship work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, if you would, to share one thing, one, one piece of advice out there to, to the folks who are joining us today or who may watch this um, recording in the future about things to keep in mind um, if they're going to launch a youth apprenticeship program in their community or to join yours in, the, in your region. So I'll start with Robert. We'll start with you. Um, if, if different regions wants to, you know, if they're going to start a youth apprenticeship program, I would say uh, go to your industry, lean on your industry, uh, find those skill, skills gaps that are there, um, tailor it around your industry, and let that be the focus. Um, it has to be industry led um, because at the end of the day, those students have to go into that workforce. So find what's needed in the community. Thanks, Robert. So Mark, how about you? And we have a little longer than I said, I apologize. I was jumping the gun a little bit. So um, Mark, go ahead. Um, I, of course, I agree with Mr. Elliott. You know, you want to start with your, your industry partners, but I, I want to go back to just Keep working on getting the word out and the education of our of, of the program to our parents. Again, I think the quickest way is through an IGP, um, uh, but you're only hitting one family at a time. Uh, so, you know, be creative in how you promote it. Um, again, we start as, as, as early as middle school talking about, you know, really our, our work-based learning experiences that are, that are very exploratory, and this falls right in line. I mean, Trident Tech last summer had a great opportunity for a pre-apprenticeship program through culinary. And I think that was a fantastic opportunity because now you're, you're hitting students in the eighth, ninth grade and they're seeing, you know, some of the advantages of that and really just getting hands on, um, you know, being a part of it, you can see it and then you can, you know, you can see yourself there. So just be creative on how you get the word out. Um, but yes, I, I agree with everybody, you know, the, the selling of the program 
um, to parents and to students and getting that family buy-in. And then now the students have that support, not only you know, the drive, but they have that support from their family uh, is huge. Sonia? I think our um, regional youth apprenticeship program is very successful from its inception. It has been successful since the inception because all the parties work together to make it happen. You had the employers, you had the K-12 partners and the post-secondary partners. And we all work together from the beginning to develop and to devise this program. So we were all at the, at the table. It would have been different if it was developed by an outside source and the information was just given to K-12 for us to promote. We wouldn't have the buy-in, we wouldn't have the insight or the knowledge behind it. So I think that has been key to the success of the program that um, we have here. So that's the one piece of advice that I would give out to people who are interested in launching a program um, is to do that. And just as you know, Mark and Robert has said, also you know, think about how you're going to create your brand and how you're going to promote it. Because again, that has been really successful for us as well. Thanks, Sonia. Richard, your, your words of advice. I would say find a champion of work-based learning in your school district. Maybe it's a principal, could be an associate superintendent or a director of instructional programs. Someone who believes in it and who can practice it at, what, at their level. So if it's a principal maybe in their school and they start small with a small cohort, what happens is it breeds success. When it, when, when it works, everybody else wants to find out about it. Everybody else is hearing about it and then you have to celebrate it. So you, and that's a good way to get the word out. And that, so then this year you have 13 and next year you have 26 and then 52 and 104. And well, that's pretty much our region and how that happens. And, and it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's a recruiting and a retention mindset. I tell people the best CTE teachers are ones that have a head coach mentality. They're good at finding kids, recruiting them, and they're good at retaining kids. And it starts at elementary, middle school. We talked about how to um, get them more involved. Um, it's bringing them to your career centers, to your CTE programs, and then, and then you know, just putting out little seed. And then once we can get them in our career centers, once kids and parents see what CTE is in the classroom, I think that's where it makes a significant impact. But it starts with finding a champion and someone that really wants um, that really knows the power of apprenticeship and then practices it and actually executes it. And then that's a great way to launch off of the platform. Thanks, Richard. And Tricia, how about your words of advice? So you know what mine are gonna be. Train your school counselors, um, have them as a part of this from the beginning, do really um, specific purposeful training with them. Um, so that they're comfortable talking about Youth Apprentice, they can be the champions you're looking for for those programs. If they believe in it, they're going to sell it. They're going to sell it to the students, and they're going to be able to sell it to the parents. Um, you know, give them tours of the programs. You know, go visit the manufacturers, go visit the employers. Um, but we are, you know, we always say this: we're the boots on the ground, so we're the ones selling the programs specifically to the kids. Um, so if you can get your school counselors involved, um, I would do it from day one. And I think that's the success of this region is because we were involved from day one. We made it a point to be involved from day one. Great. Well, I want to thank all the panelists for your um, exceptional engagement here today. Um, Clearly, you all have a tremendous passion for this work, and, and, it, and it's about the students. You know, every time you all talked about something, it always landed in the end of the end of the statement about making this um, work for students, making sure they have access to these programs, um, eliminating barriers to get them there, and helping them be successful all the way through um, to their placement and employment. Um, I can't thank you enough. I, um, I, I want to encourage everyone to um, consider youth apprenticeship as a significant um, investment in uh, the, your youth 
and that uh, the, the opportunities that I've seen in these programs um, are amazing. I was lucky enough to be able to come and visit Trident Tech when the Pathways to uh, Youth Apprenticeship Programs um, activity started with New America, and I was amazingly impressed. Um, I would also, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to go check out our website at napequity.org. We have a great initiative we're doing around women in manufacturing. Lots of good resources for educators, uh, recruitment videos and posters and all kinds of strategy documents. Um, check it out and, um, and go for it. I think, uh, you know, my stamp of approval, Youth Apprenticeship Rocks. Thanks, everyone. I want to thank the representatives from Trident Technical College and the Parker School Districts for participating in this panel and to our moderator, Mimi Lufkin, for that insightful discussion. Um, join us at 3.40 Eastern time for our final panel of the day, um, the future of youth apprenticeship policy systems and sustainability. sustainability. It'll be moderated by Kaya National Director, Taylor White, and we'll get a deeper dive into how we can continue this work after this event. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our final panel of the day. Once again, I'm Taylor White, the National Director of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. Uh, thank you for joining us for this final panel, The Future of Youth Apprenticeship, Policy, Systems, and Sustainability. Over the course of the day today, we've had an opportunity to do a deep dive into the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships a regional program that's experienced significant growth since its launch in 2014 and continues to serve as a resource and mentor to countless other partnerships looking to learn from their approach. But um, while there's been a lot of interest in youth apprenticeships from communities across the U.S., many of which are on the line with us now, uh, youth apprenticeship remains an underutilized strategy in the United States, as you've heard a few times today from multiple different speakers. This afternoon on this final panel of the day, we're gonna to talk to three leaders to understand what it's gonna to take to, to make models like the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships more mainstream and how each of their organizations uh, is playing a role in making that happen. So on the panel with me this afternoon, I am very excited to introduce John Ladd, who's the administrator of the Office of Apprenticeship within the Employment Training Administration at the US Department of Labor. John, thanks for being here today. I'm also happy to welcome Amy Firestone to the panel. Amy is the Vice President of Apprenticeship Carolina, which you've heard referenced by many folks on the call today. So she'll have an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about what Apprenticeship Carolina does um, and how they are supporting uh, the growth and sustainability of youth apprenticeship across the state. And last, but by no means least, we have Melissa Stowasser, Assistant Vice President of Community Partnerships at Trident Tech. You've heard already from Melissa today, uh, but we'll be asking her to put a slightly different hat on during this panel to think a little bit about what it's taken over the last several years, not only to grow her, the uh, Trident's the program that Trident leads, uh, but also to help other communities around the country learn from um, and replicate elements of their success. So uh, without further ado, Melissa, I'm going to kick our first question over to you. Help us understand a little bit about how the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship, Apprenticeships rather, um, has grown since it launched in 2014. What steps specifically have you taken to grow the program locally? Um, what's been critical to your growth and what have been some of the barriers that the program has experienced uh, from in either practice or policy that makes it difficult for you to expand even further? Okay, well, that's a simple question, question to start. <laughs> Absolutely, easy one. Um, as we discussed earlier today, you know, we were fortunate to be approached by a company who wanted to start this and were able to start a sector partnership to make it sustainable over time. And I think that that was a really critical decision early on. Another critical decision early on that enabled us to grow this was to get all of the partners and players at the table to create it together from the very beginning so that everyone was engaged in what this could look like and they were buying into it because they were a part of the inception of it rather than having something thrust upon them that someone else created and then being told you need to manage this aspect of it. So I think those are two really critical pieces that enabled us to grow. Another thing that enabled us to grow was that we, when we started having conversations with our industry leaders, because of course they were leading this charge, this is their program and we wanted to keep it that way. 
um, they got excited when we got to the table and they immediately started saying, oh, and we need this and we need this and we need this. And we were able to say, whoo, let's slow down and let's do one and let's really work to craft one very well. Don't overdo when you start out. And I think that was critical too. So we started with one pathway and we had six companies that hired 13 students. And from that, it's just grown exponentially. Um, and I think it was partly in, due to those pieces where we really collaborated together from the very get-go to do something well with a small start and then scale it from there. And I think that's um, something that folks should take into mind. I know that when you start creating similar programs or um, a little different programs within your region as youth apprenticeships, they're going to look different from ours. Your partners will look different. Your regions are different. We find that across our state. Amy will talk about that, I'm sure, a little bit in the future. But um, just because your region is different from ours and just because your partners are different from ours and just because the group that you may stand up as your intermediary looks different from ours doesn't mean you can't do apprenticeship. It just means it'll look different from ours, but can be equally successful. And so I wanna say that as well. So that was the mindset we went into this uh, with. We also went into, the mind with, into this with the mindset that it was a collaborative regional program, not our program or your program. It was collectively our program. And I think that that's a critical component to helping it grow as well. So beyond that, we began to reach out to more employers. We get the more employers you get on board, the more sectors who want to do this work, the better off you're going to be. So after the first year, we strategically started at reaching out to other sector groups. After that, it starts growing itself. Sector groups start coming to you and saying, can you do that for us? And I think that's a critical piece in the growth of it as well. Um, finding funds. You know, one of the barriers we had was that in the state of South Carolina, dual enrollment was not covered by the state. And so it was up to the individual family to pay the cost of the educational expense. We wanted to level the playing field. So it was really critical for us to decide up front that we were going to raise the revenues to cover those expenses. In our region, we didn't want to put that cost on the employer. And one of the reasons we didn't want to put that cost on the employer was because we were approached by small companies and we were asking them to pay the wage of the student who's not yet skilled. We were asking them to provide a mentor to train them on the job. And so we felt like they had an investment. The community also needed to invest. And so we did not put that um, educational expense on them. So over the years, we've really been lobbying for system change and we've gotten more assets coming from the state to help with the, um, the educational component, the funding of that piece. Uh, Dr. Firestone and her team worked tirelessly to pull down federal dollars to assist us in, in making that slate clean so that all students can participate and it's equitable. I think you also ask about um, barriers that we've had. COVID was a barrier, surprise, right? Um, COVID sneaked in and kind of ca caught us by surprise just as we were really accelerating and so it slowed down the growth of our program but didn't stop it because we had all of the pieces in place to continue the work even through the worst of the pandemic. Another thing that has been a barrier for us is that we have a real mismatch. Um, we find we have, for example, a tremendous number of students who want to apply for IT programs. And yet we've not been able to get many employers to offer IT positions. So we've got to really work to, to make that so that there's a match between the number of students who want to apply for the programs and the jobs that are available. And I know, again, Apprenticeship Carolina has been really helpful in trying to lead that more as a state initiative to get more employers from certain sectors on board and engaged. So that's a problem and a barrier for us. Um, transportation creates a barrier for some students, and it's one we're still trying to solve. We do have philanthropic organizations who provided us dollars, but now we've got to figure out how do those dollars that we have um, convey to the student in a way that helps them solve that, and only to those students who really need that for the equity piece. Um, and, I, and staffing, you know, you're going to find that staffing is sometimes an issue. 
we started small with basically two people running the show. We've grown over time. We have more people participating. We've also gotten philanthropic organizations to fund staffing. So we have um, a group that is actually funding a youth friendship specialist to work along with our coordinator to really oversee the support systems that are available for you. So more great. than you know. No, that was really helpful. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I hear, I hear a whole bunch of um, uh, actionable lessons for folks. I think a couple of really interesting things that you said. One was start small to go big. Sometimes there's a, a tendency to say, let's meet everybody's needs all at once as quickly as we can, get this thing moving. And, and you all have taken a much more deliberate approach to start small, do it right, and expand over time. Um, I also appreciate your pulling in ref the, the kind of balance of philanthropic funds with the state investment. And I think that's one of the things that we see is really important to scale is finding ways that we can create um, funding models for these programs that leverage both existing um, funding within existing systems uh, and where that funding you know, can't cover things like, for example, additional flexible funding for staffing um, or sometimes these, these really sticky transportation issues. Um, we know that other sources of funds can be really, really helpful and important for continuing and maintaining the momentum of, of program growth. So um, thank you for touching on all sorts of things. One of the many things that you referenced um, that's been, I know, very important to, to your work and has also allowed you to play a role in supporting the expansion um, of youth apprenticeship in South Carolina is the important role that the folks at Apprenticeship Carolina play. So I'd love to ask um, Dr. Firestone, Amy, a quick question for your part. Um, could you tell us a little bit, um, for folks who are unfamiliar with your work and your organization, what Apprenticeship Carolina does across the state as a statewide intermediary, and specifically also, um, when and why uh, you all have decided that youth apprenticeship is a priority for the state. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you so much for the um, invitation to be part of this important panel. So Apprenticeship Carolina is part of the South Carolina Technical College System. So Triton Tech is one of the 16 technical colleges that's part of our system. So um, Apprenticeship Carolina is actually a state agency. So we are state government but we support the 16 colleges with apprenticeships. And that looks very different depending on the college. There's 16 colleges, I like to say 16 languages in 16 different countries because they all operate very differently in terms of apprenticeships, but a lot of other things as well. So just to tell you a little bit more about us, we've been in existence since 2007, and we are the main intermediary for the state with helping employers develop registered apprenticeships. And so our team helps develop all of the apprenticeship standards and we work collaboratively with the companies and with the technical colleges or other providers, whether they're K-12 or other um, vendors that the um, companies may wish to use. We help them put it all together, ship it off to our South Carolina DOL director so that they get registered. So the process is, is very seamless and that really been our bread and butter since 2007. However, in the past few years, we really expanded beyond just helping work with the colleges and employers on that process to helping work with companies with implementation of their program after it had been registered, helping train them with RAPIDS 2.0, which is the database may, many of you may be familiar with, and also helping work with potential apprentices and current apprentices. And that's a really new terrain for us. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover there, but we work collaboratively with Trident Tech, similar to all the other colleges. So when there's a company that is um, looking at apprenticeships as, as a potential model, we will meet with them with Trident Tech and then whatever other college it might be, help them design the standards. And then um, Demetrius Smith on our team, he's the apprenticeship consultant working with Trident Tech, make sure all the programs are set up and get them shipped off to DOL. So um, the process has been in place you know, for many years and it's quite successful because companies don't have to worry about the paperwork. We take care of all of that for them. And we have many different models and samples we work from. So we really have a good system in place for getting uh, registered apprenticeships um, established. And I wanted to mention that in South Carolina, all of our youth apprenticeships are registered with DOL. Um, so that is something that we have worked really hard with employers, whether it's in the Charleston area or other areas of the state on, on developing. And we see you know more companies kind of looking at um, registered apprenticeship for youth as, as a model, um, but usually they'll start with an adult apprenticeship program, kind of get their feet wet, wet with an adult program and start, like Melissa said, very, very small. So that's a little bit about our role. Um, we, we are statewide, so I think you can go any corner in South Carolina and find an apprenticeship Carolina 
um, staff member. We really spread ourselves out throughout the state with the different roles we have. Um, thanks to funding from the U.S. Department of Labor, we have actually doubled in size in our team. We have more apprenticeship consultants supporting rural areas. We have um, registered program specialists, and I'm excited to announce that we'll have a bilingual registered program specialist working with Hispanic-owned businesses. Um, and then finally, we have youth apprenticeship coordinators. I know that's a mouthful, but um, whereas at Trident Tech, they have some internal staff at the college, um, most of the other colleges don't really have enough staff to support um, all of the functions for youth apprenticeship. So Apprenticeship Carolina handles really all of that process. So we are um, expanding and have a lot of great opportunities, but Taylor, was there anything else that could help answer? No, I think you covered a lot. I mean, I guess one, if, if maybe one quick follow-up question, um, given that we're focusing on, um, I guess, policy and scale in the session, if you had to name what you think Apprenticeship Carolina's uh, most important kind of function for promoting scale or sustainability of youth apprenticeships in the state has been to date. What do you think it is? What, what's that sort of uh, secret sauce that you all have or, or, or the, the kind of magic piece that you have that, that you think is important for supporting the growth and scale? Yeah, I think it's the one consistent approach and message for the whole state. So no matter if you are um, you know, let's just say a automotive supplier located in one part of the state, or you are the parent company in another part of the state, and you want to do a youth apprenticeship or an adult apprenticeship, you get the same approach from Apprenticeship Carolina, which is somebody from the team will sit down with you, bring in the technical college and other partners, develop the process and get it squared away very quickly. So that's one message, one approach. Um, we take away all the burden um, and we have funding to back it up. So no one's really having to pay out of pocket. That's great. That's really helpful. Um, I couldn't agree more that that consistent approach is important. We've had panels all day today where folks have mentioned some of um, one piece that's important for promoting growth of youth apprenticeship is sort of helping folks understand what it is and, and not just sort of assuming that people see its value on its face in the way that many of us who have worked in the space for a long time do. And that goes for educators, that goes for employers, that goes for youth, parents, et cetera. Um, and having that consistent approach and that consistent message can be really helpful in, in sort of um, uh, helping to raise awareness uh, of what apprenticeship can be and can do for our communities. Um, so that's really helpful. Thank you. I am sure we'll come back uh, and, and pick up on lots of things that you mentioned. But before we do that, um, I want to uh, pose a question to John, who is on the line with us. Um, like Apprenticeship Carolina, the U.S. Department of Labor has shown an increasing interest in supporting youth apprenticeship over the past several years. We heard this morning um, from your from your colleague, um, Acting Deputy Secretary Hanks, who talked a little bit about uh, recent investments from the U.S. Department of Labor, for example, in youth apprenticeship. Amy has referenced one that um, South Carolina team received the Youth Apprenticeship Readiness Grants. Um, so we've been very excited to see that and promote that across our networks. Um, but I'd love to hear from you, John, as, as you play such a significant role in the federal government's um, act activity to modernize the apprenticeship system. What does it mean um, for the Department of Labor to be interested in modernizing the system and, and how do youth fit into it? Oh, sure. Um, thanks, Taylor, and thanks so much. Um, really want to um, extend my thanks to Trident Technical College in New America for hosting this important event today, and really excited to be on this panel with Amy and Melissa, um, who are doing such great work. Um, you know, that's a great question, um, and, you know, it's an important question for the system moving forward. Uh, there has been such an evolution in apprenticeship, really, and um, one of our former colleagues referred to it as the apprenticeship renaissance that's been happening here, um, you know, close to 10 years, but really took up steam in about 2015, 2016, when the federal government started making investments in apprenticeship uh, for the first time. Uh, the Department of Labor made an, made an investment in the American Apprenticeship Initiative, which was soon followed by congressional investments in apprenticeship. So it's been an exciting time for, for apprenticeship. And, um, with that increased funding has generally called for goals to expand the program and grow the program. And to do that, um, we really do also have to uh, modernize certain elements of the program. Um, but as we'll, I'm sure gonna talk a little bit later, we wanna make sure that as we modernize uh, the system, um, that that doesn't mean any loss of quality or rigor, that we really wanna hold true um, to the core elements of apprenticeship. So, um, you know, there's a couple things we could probably touch on here, um, but this is one of those important questions that we've actually uh, asked our advisory committee on apprenticeship to also help think us think through this uh, issue with us. 
Um, but there's two really kind of big elements that, that I certainly think of. Um, one is around flexibility, right? We wanna make sure that our policies and regulations allow for different models and, and approaches, um, but we wanna to hold to those core elements of what it means to be a registered apprenticeship program, you know, which is employment, OJT, classroom instruction, progressive wages, credentials, strong labor standards, including uh, EEO. So, you know, we really want to balance that that rigor um, and that consistency of what apprenticeship means, um, but recognizing that it, that a, apprenticeship can look different in the construction industry versus IT, uh, that youth apprenticeship might look a little bit different than an apprenticeship that's primarily serving adults. So, um, you know, that was one of the things we really focused early on was kind of opening up the model to different approaches and, and different models, different partnership structures. Um, there's many different models. Um, you know, Amy talked ab about the particular model in South Carolina. There are a whole range of models and we really wanna uh, support and encourage those, those different uh, approaches while holding, holding true to those core elements. I think another area, and um, you know, Amy talked about this as well is, you know, how do we leverage technology, streamline processes, provide um, the right kinds of financial supports to really make it easier for industry to start an apprenticeship program? It, it shouldn't take uh, months and months to stand up an apprenticeship program. It should be easy. Uh, it, should, it should be an easy to understand process of how you get started with support available. Um, you know, it should be driven by, by the industry for their particular needs. Um, and we really want to make sure that, again, you know, we want that consistency, we want that rigor, um, but we don't want it to feel like it's this overwhelming burden for, for an employer or an industry group to stand up an apprenticeship program. So this is an area that we've made a lot of investments uh, to support, whether it's at the state level um, with the work that South, like the work that South Carolina is doing, but also industry inter intermediaries that could be that go-between uh, playing that role that um, the, the technical college system plays uh, in South Carolina. Uh, we set up TA centers uh, this, uh, this summer in four critical areas to help on really some pain points in the system, whether it's around data and information sharing, whether it's around um, building equitable programs, whether it's about um, uh, other critical areas of, of the system. Uh, we've we've um, invested in building competency-based frameworks. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we don't have to wait until someone develops uh, a program. We've got uh, curriculum and designs uh, ready to go off the shelf that, that people can use. So that's, those are some of the things we, we think about when we talk about modernization. Well, it's an awful lot of things. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on something that you uh, referenced kind of at the top of your comments, John, because I, I think it's related to a question we get all the time. And, and the uh, work in South Carolina is uh, has committed itself to registering youth apprenticeships. We don't see that everywhere. So you said very early on in your comments um, that you the U.S. Department of Labor is trying to think about how to offer flexibility while holding to core elements. This is a question first for you, but I'm, I'm sort of curious to um, hear also from Amy and Melissa, and apologies because I didn't prep you exactly for this question, um, but what do you say to folks when they say you can't register a youth apprenticeship, or how on earth am I going to take this adult apprenticeship that has you know 2,000 hours of on-the-job learning, uh, sorry, OJT, and um, hundreds of hours of related instruction requirements. How on earth do we adapt that for you? That does not be done. What is the answer to that question that that you give, John? First, but I'm also curious, Amy and Melissa, how you've tackled that question. Sure, that's uh, a great question, and I think there's some um, you know good policy discussion that needs to happen in, in that space. Um, you know, as as Congress is debating reauthorizing the National Apprenticeship Act, I think that that is an area that um, folks are looking at. But but I would say that. Um, you know, we see tremendous demand for youth apprenticeship and tremendous growth in youth apprenticeship and, and register. And when we say that, we mean registered apprenticeship. Um, that's what we um, support. That's what we um, provide funding to support. Um, but uh, the number of um, youth participating in registered apprenticeships has doubled over the past 10 years. Uh, now uh, over 68,000 
uh, youth age 16 to 24 are in apprenticeship programs and represent 25% of all apprentices. Uh, that is uh, some tremendous growth that's just happened here in, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, when we put out, uh, the, the, as you mentioned, the, um, uh, the Youth Apprenticeship Readiness Grants, uh, we saw tremendous demand for for the, for that funding opportunity, um, and you know this is clearly another area that we're going to look to invest more in in the future. Um, but we know there is just tremendous, you know, huge demand for uh, registered apprenticeship programs serving youth, either high school or out of school youth as well. All right, folks, you hear you heard it here in no uncertain terms. You can indeed register youth programs. <laughs> um, Melissa or Amy, are there uh, and isn't there anything you'd like to add for that from your regional or state perspective when you get that question? No, we can't. We, there's no way we can do this. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to respond to that. You know, when we sat down with our employers and they wanted to register a youth program, we really let them lead the conversation with that and what that could look like. We had some employers who were in that initial group who had adult apprenticeship programs, which were much more extensive and took them much further. But they saw value in starting a youth program that would take them to a point where they had skills enough to be employed, but maybe not as far as the adult program would take them. So when we designed the apprenticeship programs, we designed them around those certificate programs that we offered at the college in the career specific areas that did make them employable. So the students go through their certificate, but they're not going all the way through an associate degree. And so they're finished and they are employable at that point. But again, we're building them with a ladder of progression. So the particular company I was mentioning then ended up hiring students out of that program into the adult program, half, and they were halfway through already. So students that they really liked from that particular program that they wanted to see progress were able to move on through the adult program. Since then, we've had companies like McLeod. You saw Debbie McLeod earlier if you were with us for the employer panel. And they have a really interesting structure because they're bringing in students as interns from their high school in the summer and giving them exposure. And if the student and the company feel that this is a good match, then they're putting them into a youth program that takes them through the certificate program. They're registered, they're employable at that point. If they're doing extremely well, they go on into their adult apprenticeship program and they move on through an associate degree and they're looking to go on even to baccalaureate degrees in cybersecurity. So you can register youth programs and you can build them as a ladder of progression in conjunction with adult programs that exist. Amy, would you like to add more to that? Sure, and I'll say as we're in like a full expansion mode for youth apprenticeship in the state, um, COVID is extremely challenging right now to get new companies on board for apprenticeships in general, but specifically youth apprenticeship and just a lot more concerns about liability. But what I did want to say was looking at each individual area that you're in, see which companies, this is what we're doing, are willing to hire 16, 17, 18 year olds in general. And I'll say that right now, a lot of manufacturing companies are kind of skittish about hiring people under 18 just because of the challenges that they face in general. But looking at some of the auto industry, a lot of dealerships are looking at youth apprenticeship. Um, hospitality and tourism here, that's where we've had a lot of new youth apprenticeships start in the past few months because of the gaps that this industry is facing. They really need to get creative and look at ways to grow from, um, you know, grow their own talent. So I would say look at the industries right now because years ago it was a little bit different, but now there are fewer companies that are ready to dive into youth apprenticeship, youth registered apprenticeship who don't already have an adult apprenticeship program, but consider those industries that are really hurting for employees and are looking at creative ways to build their own. So like I said, we've had luck with hospitality and tourism recently because they have such tremendous gaps in employment. So youth apprenticeship, I had one company last week in the upstate area said, sign me up for five occupations for youth apprenticeship, I'm ready. Our hotel needs to bring in new talent. Um, but other you know, manufacturing companies, they're just not quite ready because they're trying to deal with their own workforce right now and the COVID challenges that it brought on. So I said, I would highly suggest for registered apprenticeship, look at those industries that are really facing the most immense challenges. And they may not be the ones that 
you know, a couple of years ago, you would have been looking at. Um, also the public sector, we, we look at the public sector as well as a great place to engage um, new organizations for youth apprenticeship. So thinking kind of outside the box by looking at what companies are even willing to hire youth in general is the best starting place that we, we've seen. So I want to play devil's advocate for a second and as we move to our next question on this last point. Um, I think that there's a lot of wisdom in going to where there's demand from employers. I also think um, that there can be a risk at times in growing too and growing so quickly that you lose sight of quality. And you know, at PIA, we believe firmly that apprenticeship can be an engine for expanding economic opportunity and creating pathways to good careers for youth furthest from opportunity. But programs have to be designed really intentionally and occupations have to be selected to be sure that that the, the, the wages that young people are earning, the sort of long-term career opportunities that they can um, have following an apprenticeship are there for them. And sometimes when employers say, we need this talent now, those jobs that they're trying to fill in the short term are not necessarily the sort of long-term uh, 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 jumping off points for careers that we might like to see for young people. Not, Amy, I'm not saying that that's what's happening in South Carolina. I'm just naming it as a risk for really rapid growth in any sort of system. Um, John alluded to this, I think, in his, in his first um, few sentences, but I'm curious for you all what you see as some of the greatest risks in expanding youth apprenticeship really quickly. We, we want to see it grow. We want to see it become a more mainstream opportunity, but of course, growth for growth's sake sometimes has its limits. Um, so what do you see as some of the, the risks in expanding youth apprenticeship uh, really quickly, and what step, steps have each of your organizations taken to ensure you're supporting growth um, in high quality, equitable apprenticeships rather than just growing for the sake of growing? And anyone can dive into that easy question first. Start off, Taylor, if you'd like, just to piggyback. Um, sure. I think that with our model, I just wanted to mention that by doing registered apprenticeship, we, we don't really run that risk because no matter if it is the hotel associate registered apprenticeship for 16 year olds or the uh, maintenance mechanic, they're all following the DOL standards of an approved occupation. So they all have those high quality elements of the you know, starting wage, the wage increase, um, and really the whole process is the same for adults. So I don't think if you follow the registered apprenticeship model, you still have that standard quality, no matter if it's um, youth or adults. So I wanted to mention that just to help the audience understand that they're not gonna be you know, uh, dipping into low quality if they, if they do go rapidly. And I would also say that um, the one thing is the mentorship. We were just in on Friday with the Embassy of Switzerland. We visited Swiss Chrono, which is a manufacturing company in a small rural area in South Carolina, a very impoverished area. They started out with two registered youth apprentices. Um, I think this was last year and they had tremendous success. And they said, you know what? We're gonna have nine. We're gonna aim for nine. We're gonna look at different um, high schools that we normally don't engage with. And they said, you know, I don't think we can get a lot bigger because of the mentorship. And I think that's the risk is that um, with youth apprentices, they need to ensure that there's a really great mentor available um, to coach these students. The mentor we met with at Swiss Chrono, he mentioned that he even helps them learn life skills. I mean, they're in a small rural area. He helps kind of be that great community figure for them. So I think that's the biggest risk is making sure if it's a registered apprenticeship, you need a mentor, making sure that that um, mentor is, is available to handle the volume of multiple you know, individuals who are, who are under 18. Sure. Yeah, that's an important an important part, point and not one that I think folks think about when they just think of creating more opportunities. John, I saw you unmute. Do you want to get in uh, with an answer there? Yeah, I was going to say, um, Amy stole my thunder there a little bit. And the check's in the mail, Amy. Um, <laughs> appreciate the, the support there. But yeah, exactly. I think by focusing on, on registering these programs, you have a lot of protections in place. Um, I, I would add, though, that I think we continue to emphasize and we're going to continue to emphasize probably even more strongly moving forward um, through our funding opportunities that, you know, there's really a strong emphasis on equity and quality and, and labor standards in uh, the kinds of uh, programs that we want to invest in moving forward. So I think that's another place where there's some additional protections to make sure that folks are thinking through the kind of, kind of questions that you're raising here. And Taylor, I would say that, um, you know, for us, we're really, really fortunate in our region to have a chamber who's heavily engaged in talent development space. And one of the things that they do is a talent demand study. 
And so the talent demand study really looks at where are the jobs and where are the jobs projected to be in each of the industry sectors. And then it also looks at where are we producing graduates from K-12, from any level of post-secondary to fill those jobs and where is the gap? And so we're strategically looking at those um, programs that would be those that would lead students to family sustaining wages that fall within the need for our region and where that gap exists, where we know there are going to be high quality jobs available. So we use that as a guide. And I think any kind of resource like that that you can draw from in your region to figure that out really will help you guide and, and sort of alleviate that risk. And then, of course, we work with Amy and her team very, very closely to make sure they are registered to USDOL standards so that they're getting that high quality. The other thing that we've done is as we sit down with our um, industry leaders and we talk about what, are, what do you need them to achieve, we map out high school courses and college courses that help them achieve what they need academically, but also lead to a ladder of progression for the student so that they are engaging in some sort of post-secondary credit work as a part of that apprenticeship that can lead them on an upward trajectory should they choose to embrace it. And so I think all of those things together really help to alleviate those risks. That is a perfect example. I said in my opening remarks of how sometimes it's hard to see the PIA principles in action if you just read them, but there is a perfect exemplar uh, for folks on the line of the importance of portability, this idea that students are earning credits that they can use after their apprenticeship um, concludes to earn additional credentials, additional degrees, and move upwards and onwards um, in their careers over time, whether that's right away or 10 years later, they have that um, sort of currency in the education marketplace that can be really important. Um, <clears throat> we are um, nearing the point on this panel where we uh, we'll move to audience questions, but before we hand it over um, to them, I have a couple more things I'd love for this group to, to talk about. Um, one of the things that's been uh, really interesting in hearing you all talk is how often, um, and you have unwittingly or not, uh, helped prove my point that I wanted to make in this panel a little bit about the importance of connecting systems. And so Melissa has referenced at times how this, the State Intermediary Apprenticeship Carolina has been very supportive to their work locally. Amy has shared um, the work that Apprenticeship Carolina does uh, around the state to build and support other partnerships uh, that are trying to uh, launch and run and grow youth apprenticeship programming. Um, and John has made reference to a number of ways that the U.S. Department of Labor has supported the growth of youth apprenticeship and will moving forward. Um, and so I think folks can see that there are ways uh, sort of different levels if we think about these folks and their organizations aligned vertically across the uh, apprenticeship system that these different actors are working together to sort of reinforce one another's um, progress and opportunities. Um, so it's really exciting to see here. I would love to hear from you all though. That's, I made that sound like it's really easy and it all works very smoothly. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm curious if we could do one sort of lightning round for all of the panelists. If you had a magic wand uh, that you could wave and make some sort of change, whether it's in policy or practice or in mindsets around the country, what is one change that you would love to see that you think would be important for promoting the continued expansion of high quality youth apprenticeship opportunities in this country? And anyone can get in here. No one seems to be chomping at the... Who wants to take that first? You limit us to one change, and that just makes it so difficult to come up with one. I see everybody. Melissa, if you talk on. fast, you can get more in. <laughs> Taking note from Taylor. <laughs> I would say it's really, really critical to do relationship building. I think that we need a structure that really enables us to embrace partnerships across the different levels, as you've discussed, you know, the local level to the state level to the federal level, but also within our regions and that supports the work of partnership development and intermediary, um, intermediary action that enables these to take place. We need to be funding and standing up really strong intermediaries at the local level, at the state level, because they both are critical in making this work become a statewide system and at the federal level to ensure that all states are working together in a collaborative way to ensure a national level of high quality apprenticeship program. I, I guess great. I would- John, go for it. 
Yeah, I, I would build on that. I mean, I mean, I think this is such an important question um, around kind of the evolution of the national apprenticeship system, right? It, we, apprenticeship is different than WIOA. It's different than, um, than secondary and post-secondary education. Um, it has a different structure, a different approach. Um, it, it really requires that employer engagement and industry engagement to, to thrive. Um, there's really, you could have an apprenticeship program with a single employer and that can work, right? The employer could provide everything. The employer could provide the classroom instruction, the mentorship, but that's really hard, right? That's really challenging for uh, any single employer or any industry group to be able to do that. So, so to Melissa's point, you know, we, we really are starting to move from the idea of the system being pretty much just the federal government, state government, and industry groups, right, that, that, that sponsor these apprenticeship programs. And we now have this much more rich, complex ecosystem of partners, stakeholders, and players that, ha that really, you know, previously hadn't existed. But how do they all come together and form a coherent system? How do we, how do we clarify what roles each uh, entity is playing, what roles they can play, allow for local and statewide um, you know, flexibility and customization to, to leverage the players that make the most sense, but, but, re but really articulating this, this new uh, vision of what the national apprenticeship system looks like and who's part of it, right? And, and making that as inclusive as possible, uh, including um, e equity groups and CBOs that can, that can provide a pipeline of talent into these programs. Um, but I think that's some of the really exciting work uh, that kind of lays ahead here of trying to better define uh, what the national apprenticeship system can look like moving forward. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. I think that's that's something that we've really enjoyed seeing and learning about through our work in PIA. It's just the number of different organizations that make up these partnerships and the different roles and responsibilities they take on. Um, it's been a huge area of learning for us, and, and we're excited to be able to share some of that with the field to encourage new and different actors to take on new and different roles, because they think you're right to really reach many of the industries and communities that um, really haven't um, been able to take advantage of, the, of, of apprenticeship in the past. Um, it will take uh, some creativity and some different um, names and faces in the crowd, but exciting to hear your change ideas. Amy, last but not least. I might sneak in a couple too, Taylor. Um, I would say the most critical part are the businesses. Um, we have a lot of resources in South Carolina for funding right now for the apprenticeships. We have a lot of staff, but it's really the businesses and any incentives that the businesses can receive to help train their trainers. I think with businesses being short staffed, especially looking at youth apprenticeship, that mentor piece, I think any incentives for businesses. And then also we haven't really talked about pre-apprenticeships and kind of the power that they can play in help increase equity and diversity in apprenticeships by there being you know, more funding and more support for pre-apprenticeships and having those count as kind of part of the overall system. I think those would be critical elements. Okay, well, Amy, you didn't mean to, but you walked right into our first audience question. <laughs> so I'm gonna take, take your final comment as a segue. What is, as you see it, the definition or the difference rather between a pre-apprenticeship and a youth apprenticeship? I know this varies uh, in some places, but in, from the South Carolina perspective, please give us yours. Um, I get, I should get a, like $100 every day I answer this question because I get it every <laughs> day from somebody um, either in the state or outside the state. But in South Carolina, as I mentioned, all of the youth apprenticeships are registered with DOL. So that's anyone 16 and up. And technically it's really for high school students, but now we're working with um, a little bit older youth as well. Pre-apprenticeships can be for anybody. And this is where the technicality comes in. Um, if they are working in a pre-apprenticeship, getting paid for work, they have to be 16 and up. But if they're just doing the um, classroom hands-on, they can be 14 and up. And so we've done a lot of work to develop a pre-apprenticeship standards process. So Trident Tech was actually one of the first colleges in the state that went through our pre-apprenticeship standards um, certification process. And so any entity in South Carolina can actually do that. And we had the Urban League of Columbia um, develop their own pre-apprenticeship and submit it to us. We have companies that do that, technical colleges, 
So the pre-apprenticeship is really the preparation for the registered apprenticeship. And we actually require that any pre-apprenticeship regist registered, we call them certified, with Apprenticeship Carolina has letters of support from companies that have a registered apprenticeship. So China Tech had done that this past summer with their culinary arts program for um, high school students. And um, it is quite different because a few of those students, and Melissa can tell you more, were successful in entering a registered youth apprenticeship, the ones who did their pre-apprenticeship. So those are the technicalities and glad to share kind of how we um, came up with that process with anybody. It was a very long process, but it, it has proven to be very impactful. That's great. And I think it can be important um, hearing about the certification process. I know it can be important for quality. I will underscore there a piece of your answer, Amy, which is just that in, in part of your model is requiring that pre-apprenticeships be connected to a registered apprenticeship program. They are, they are preparation for a registered program, not separate from. Um, and I know, I, I don't know if, um, uh, John, you have any comments on that just from the DOL's perspective on the model, but I know that that's a, that's a key piece that we um, often have to remind folks of. It's not a replacement for yeah, yeah. another type of program. No, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's the critical component that, that ultimately there's some kind of articulation agree or agreements between that uh, pre-apprenticeship program and the registered apprenticeship program. I mean, obviously the idea would be you want the exit requirements for our pre-apprenticeship to match up with the entry requirements for a registered apprenticeship um, and, and that there is that clear articulation. I mean, there's lots of forms of work-based learning. There's lots of forms of um, experiential learning, but I think you know, for folks who want to use that term, you know, I, I think it does convey a lot of expectations on the on on the part of the participants. And I think we want to be really clear with people that pre apprenticeship really does lead and um, has opportunities to, to enter directly into a registered apprenticeship. Yeah, that's helpful. And Amy, if I just a quick word. If I can just piggyback on that, you know, sure. Yeah. We were asked about doing pre apprenticeship when we started doing apprenticeship. And my response to them was, you can't have a pre anything until you have the anything. And so we really had to build a youth apprenticeship program and then back up from that. And so we built the pre apprenticeship in culinary, as Amy mentioned, this summer and got it certified through Apprenticeship Carolina. And it's for 14 and 15 year olds to give them exposure in the culinary industry. So they did three week intensive classroom experiences in the Culinary Institute um, to determine whether or not they wanted to apply then for a registered apprenticeship at the age of 16. And so um, we've had a few apply and we're hoping for more next year from that group. That's great. And I love that. I'm definitely going to steal that. Uh, you can't have a pre-anything pre if you don't have an anything. So, so good for you. I like that one. Um, so we have a couple other questions here from the audience I'd love to throw your way. One is a, a real easy one, and Amy, I'll direct this one at you. Uh, how many staff does Apprenticeship Carolina have? Uh, I think we are 21 and growing. So okay. we still have close to 30 when we finish hiring folks. Okay, so so not a small operation. And it's getting bigger by the day. <laughs> <laughs> so statewide intermediary, soon to be about 30. Um, Melissa, as a as a regional slash local intermediary, how many staff do you all have working on the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships? We have ten. To, well, if you count me, eleven. But we, we also have you. many, many, many other roles within the college. You know, running three thousand dollars, three thousand students sure. enrollment programs and other employer engagement. But um, eleven people who will expend their energies in that space as needed. Okay, very helpful. Thank you both. Um, so uh, we're, the registration um, issue seems to be of great interest to our audience. So I have one more, um, and then, then I'm gonna try to squeeze one last question in after this, we'll see how I do. Um, but from an anonymous audience member, is there value in registering apprenticeships at both my state department of apprenticeship standards and the US Department of Labor? And what would the value of registering with both be? And John, you unmuted first, I'm gonna let you take that one. Sure. Um, I mean, generally, it wouldn't be necessary uh, once you're registered um, at the state level or with USDOL. Um, there is reciprocity with the rest of the country and other states. Um, I mean, we do see um, er areas where national employers want to register nationally with USDOL. Um, and, and so that but we also then th there can be times when those programs should also register at the state level if they want to access statewide benefits uh, that might be available. But 
Um, generally, kind of if, if you're just operating in one state, there really shouldn't be any particular benefit to registering both uh, at the state level and nationally. Both are portable. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question here, uh, this, is, this is less to do with registration, um, but I believe uh, really any of you could, this could be relevant, but how do you make the case um, and explain the importance of that sort of small and intentional growth to stakeholders in political offices who are pressuring for larger and larger cohorts? So I suspect this is someone who's dealing with uh, grant funding or uh, political support, but how do you make that case for small and intentional growth? John, I mean, first yeah, I mean, we see it. I mean, it, it's true at the national level too, right? I mean, you know, there's going to be significant expectations with uh, potentially large national investments um, that could be coming down the pike. Um, you know, I think South Carolina is just a great model of um, of how it can work. Um, South Carolina didn't grow overnight. It's been steady incremental progress since uh, the early days of this initiative. Um, and they've been able to sustain it and grow grow every year. So um, I, I, think, I think that's just a really good example of how you can do it. Um, I think you have to be in this for the long-term. Um, apprenticeship programs take a while, not only to stand up, but to have a cycle of apprentices that go through to start to see the impact, to see the results. We need employers to be thinking long-term. Uh, apprenticeship isn't, you know, a short-term fix to, you know, the current supply chain, you know, crisis or some other immediate need where you're trying to plug in um, skilled labor really quickly. It, it's something where everyone's got to have kind of a longer-term view um, of it. Um, but with that being said, I think there's still lots that we can do, again, so that the process of establishing a program should not take months or years, that that should be simple, that should be easy. That's something that with the support of, of organizations and intermediaries like Apprenticeship Carolina, that, you know, we can get you into an apprenticeship program, you know, today or, you know, this week, it, it really shouldn't be uh, a big lift. There should be plug and play options for for folks. Um, there should be large scale programs, consortia programs that employers can join. So you're not establishing a new program, you're joining an existing program. There should be many, many options uh, that make it kind of easier for, for people to get involved. And I think when you bring systems together, you know, I think the other success from South Carolina is you're leveraging an existing system and you're leveraging all of that capability and capacity. Um, I mean, think if we had every workforce board sponsor one apprenticeship program, if we had every high school district sponsor an apprenticeship program, right? You could grow fairly quickly, but, but again, all the structure and infrastructure has to be in place and all those protections to make sure that we're growing good programs as well. And I would just say, if you start too large, you're going to um, deplete your resources too quickly and it's not going to go well. And if it doesn't go well, then it doesn't grow. One of our greatest um, accomplishments was starting with 13 students, one of whom got a job right out of high school and bought a house at 19 and others who were equally successful and it was their going back into their schools and back into their communities and telling their stories that caught fire for other students and parents. You have to give it time to catch, catch fire. You have to give it time to market itself. If you um, start with a vision, you have to start out huge. You're very, very likely not to get there. Yeah, and we hear sometimes too from employers or, or from partnerships around the country that um, because it's such a big ask of employers to take a, take a chance on young adults, that doing it really well and making a, a good impression the first time is the way to keep them coming back. And that sometimes if that first experience with a, a youth program doesn't pan out, um, employers are more hesitant to, to come back to the table um, once those kinks are, are, are fixed or addressed, um, just because it's a, it seems like a bigger ask uh, for them. And, and I can understand that perspective. Two. Um, so we have just um, two minutes left here, and I'm going to ask uh, one final question from the audience here. I'm going to add to it a little bit. 
uh, any one of you can feel free to claim this one. But uh, can a program sponsor simply amend their standards to change the age requirements to accept youth into existing apprenticeship programs? And to that, I will add, even regardless of what your answer is, what do you think the biggest change uh, adult serving programs need to make when they begin accepting youth or they adapt their model to work for youth? John, I take, Yeah, I can take the first one and maybe Amy and Merlis would take the second part. Um, yeah, that, that's a pretty simple process to, to amend, amend your standards. Um, you know, you may want to think about your selection procedures in terms of um, whether there's an impact there um, and how you're drawing students into the program. If they're, if they're being referred from high schools and other sources, that's a different selection procedure than you might use for adults, but it generally should not be a complicated amendment to, to an existing set of standards. And I'll take the second okay, let's part. Go for it. Yeah. I'll take the second part of that and say, if you do that and you start engaging younger students, you need to put in more supports for those younger students. Um, you heard earlier today, if you were with us, students keep talking about Ellen Kaufman, Miss Kaufman, Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. She's the youth apprenticeship coordinator here, and now we have a specialist who helps her because she engages with the students and parents. Um, she is the hub for them, the support system who ensures that all of their emotional and mental needs are met. She interfaces back and forth with the K-12 system to get the supports from their school counselors, to alert our folks that employers need to know that something's going on or to find out from employers when things are going on. So the kind of support you give those students is different um, to get them launched. Yep, I would just concur with both John and Melissa, um, and then also kind of go back to that mentor piece. Um, having a really strong mentor, not just somebody on paper, is really important for working with youth apprentices at the company, because that's where kind of the, the biggest challenges will be with learning new equipment, kind of managing that on the job expectations. Um, strong mentor is really, really important there. And as John said, updating the programs is really, really simple. We do that every day for companies. Okay, well, believe it or not, we've already expended an hour of time together. Um, so I know that this is a little bit of an awkward thing on virtual panels. Our audience can't thank you and clap, but know that I'm doing it here for you um, alone in this room. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to Melissa, Amy, and John for sharing your perspectives and insights with us during this panel. Um, folks who are on the line, you've heard about supports and policies that can support local program growth and success. You've heard about state resources and strategies to promote growth across regions and states, um, working with different types of employers, different types of institutions serving in that intermediary capacity, um, and different ways that uh, the state entity can deploy itself in support of this work. And finally, from John, we've heard about um, strong federal standards uh, and, and policies, both current and potentially future from the federal government uh, as part of its work to modernize apprenticeship and find ways to make this work more efficient and more flexible so that it can continue to grow and reach new corners of our country. Thank you very much for joining us today and sharing your perspectives. Uh, careful what you wish for. We'll probably have you back again someday. Uh, but thanks very much for your time and for being with us this afternoon. And of course, for all the work that you do to expand high quality and equitable apprenticeship opportunities for young people. Thanks so much. I'm charged now with giving our official end of summit thank you uh, to lots of folks. Um, so first, I'm just going to uh, give a big thank you to all of the panelists who have joined us today to help us understand the many, many, many things that go into making the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships an innovative and effective regional partnership that delivers re results not only for its employer partners, but for the young people and education partners uh, that make it tick. Uh, I'd like to thank the PIA National Partners and Funders who support our work to make events like this possible, and also to thank everyone who is on the line with us today. Um, I would love if the folks who are behind the scenes could bring up our very last slide for the day so that I can share with the folks who have stayed with us to this point in the afternoon, um, a couple of ways that you can remain connected to PIA and the PIA network over the months ahead. Um, first, uh, I would like to let folks know that National Apprenticeship Week, um, hosted and organized by the U.S. Department of Labor, is coming up in just a few weeks. Um, PIA will be, PIA and PIA partners will be hosting a number of events for National Apprenticeship Week, 
I've included just a couple of them up here on the slide. On November 16th, our partner JFF will be hosting um, an event called A Vision for the Future, A Plan for Today. Information about that event is available on their website in soon hours as well. On November 17th, uh, New America will be hosting an apprenticeship Twitter chat. Uh, so we can uh, share some information about that, and you'll see some of that on Twitter in the weeks ahead, too. Um, and on November 18th, uh, the PIA will be hosting the PIA Equity Solutions Lab workshop hosted by New America. There is information about that event available on our website now. Um, if you enjoyed learning about the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships today, we encourage you to consider joining the team uh, on April 4th and 5th. Uh, for the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program Development Workshops and Conference, that will be an opportunity to do an even deeper dive into the work that Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships leads. Um, and we look forward to planning and hosting and sharing more information with you about that event in the months ahead. But please do keep those months, uh, sorry, dates in mind. I think the slide here says second through fourth. It should say fourth through fifth. So apologies for that. Um, and last but not least, I want to let folks on the line know that um, on a monthly basis, we host through PIA a network learning series. They are typically webinars or office hours that feature national experts or practitioner experts from around the country. You can subscribe to the PIA's monthly newsletter using that link on the screen, um, uh, or the, sorry, the URL that's on the screen there, um, which I believe has been shared with you via the resources button on your screen. Um, please do subscribe to that. We, we advertise those events there, and we also share resources and tools and updates from across the field via that newsletter, um, and anyone is uh, welcome to subscribe. And uh, my very last offer uh, of ways to stay engaged is on our next slide, so if we could move to that, I'd like to invite you and your partners to join us in a virtual networking event that we're going to host over the next 30 minutes uh, here. You'll have a chance to meet in small groups with other folks who are interested in youth apprenticeship to share ideas, resources, contact information so that we can continue this conversation and continue our um, collaborative and collective learning about how this field is going to grow and continue promoting quality and equity in everything that we do. Um, so please join us. There's a URL on the screen. I believe it is also shared with you via that resource button that you can see. And last but by no means least, we'd love for to get your um, perspectives and feedback on the day via our post-conference survey, which is also um, here on the screen. We are going to leave this uh, slide up so that if you would like to go to either of these um, links the event or the survey you have a few minutes to to jot down those urls um, but otherwise we'll hope to see many of you in just four short minutes on our networking event and please know you can join that and drop in and drop out as is convenient for you we know on the east coast it's nearing the end of the day um, so we look forward to seeing many of you there and once again thank you to everyone who made today possible most especially the new america events team who uh, don't get praise on these calls very often um, but Angela, Narmada, Jason, Shannon, uh, and everyone who's on the line, thank you so much for helping us get through this day and making it all possible. We appreciate you. Thanks so much.